is touching the truth. Marvel Cinematic Universe, Non-Sacred Timeline, Seven Continental Hotel, Penthouse, Boss, There's a New Assassination Mission, Two Million Dollars. Are you considering it? A stunning blonde woman in a professional dress, resembling a secretary, stood in front of Charles Doyle. Her tone was calm as she spoke. Oh, two million dollars. That's not a small price. Tell me the specifics of the mission first, and then I'll consider taking this two million dollar job. You know me, I'm quite picky about mission targets. Sitting by the window, Charles held a square glass with whiskey in his hand. He slowly shifted his gaze from the outside view and looked at Ginny, who was speaking. T slash N, I omitted a few sentences due to offensive content. I will do so in the future chapters as well unless it affects the readability. But if you want to keep the chapters as it is, let me know. This time, the new bounty task is for John Wick. The employer wants him eliminated as soon as possible. The reward is two million dollars. What do you think? Hearing the name John Wick, Charles Doyle's thoughts drifted into the distance. The guy who wiped out an entire gang over a dog. Is his storyline about to begin? Then he glanced at the photo of the target in Ginny's hand, confirming that it was this guy and not someone with the same name. Charles spun the square glass in his hand, looked at the amber liquid inside, took a sip, and calmly said, the price is too low, I won't take it. Why? Ginny was curious. You entered the business relatively late, so you might not have a complete understanding of many things. John Wick used to be the number one assassin in the assassin world, and he's a bit of a legend in the underworld. As Charles narrated, Ginny gained a direct understanding of the guy newly listed on the mission board. Then she nodded and said, indeed, the price is too low. Then her gaze turned to Charles, then curiously asked, Master Ninja, compared to you? Charles, however, smiled and said, I and he aren't assassins from the same world. Although Charles didn't say it directly, his confident tone and carefree attitude clearly showed that he didn't regard John Wick's abilities highly. Ginny's eyes shimmered as she decided not to dwell on this task. Then she spoke, I'll go see if there are any other tasks suitable for you. Go ahead. Getting Charles's agreement, she turned and left the room, heading towards the direction of the hotel's task hall. Watching Ginny leave, Charles's gaze once again turned to the world outside the window. My name is Fong Yi, and I come from the Blue Star. While playing the Naruto mobile game, when I was trying to pull the new character card Hero of the Will of Fire, Jiraiya, I got so frustrated by the game's tactics that I died of anger on the spot after realizing I had spent 3,000 bucks without even gathering enough character fragments. As a result, I found myself somehow reborn in this world. Although the planet beneath his feet is still called Earth, it's not the same Earth where Charles used to reside. After all, in Times Square, those massive advertisements for Stark Industries stand out prominently, and on entertainment magazines, the latest Playboy cover girl is once again in the embrace of Tony Stark. This is the Marvel Universe, or in Charles's eyes, more like a multiverse dressed in the skin of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Upon awakening to my past life's memories, I discovered myself, dressed in rags, appearing in a dilapidated alley in New York. I speculated that I might be an orphan or a runaway troublemaker. As for the infuriating Naruto mobile game that had driven me to my demise, it had transformed into a cheat, appearing in my consciousness. However, this accursed cheat, just like before, was maddening, continuously loading. Charles Doyle was adopted by a killer couple from the Continental Hotel, who then trained young six-year-old Charles as an assassin. The training from the killer couple was already twisted, especially for an adopted child like me, it was even more vicious. If it wasn't for that endlessly loading cheat in my mind, serving as my motivation to persist, I might have died during the training long ago. During this time, as a young child, my hands were stained with blood early on. If I were a child who knew nothing, maybe during the training, I wouldn't have felt uncomfortable in my heart. I would have become a genuine killer. But coming from a place full of kindness, from the former land of China, this kind of life destroyed my values and reshaped my life. Back then, I had tried to escape, but unfortunately, my young body in the as yet awakened cheat led my only attempt to end in failure and severe punishment. Since then, I hadn't attempted to escape again. Life was like getting raped, if I couldn't change it, I'd choose to enjoy it. 
In this period, under the training of the killer couple, I quickly grew, mastering various killing skills, disguise, combat, tracking and counter-tracking, marksmanship, and even the physical chemistry related to assassination, without missing any aspect. As for the so-called mandatory education, from middle school to high school and university, they were completely out of my reach. After all, I wasn't that guy who loved drinking pocky, and I didn't run into a big shot from the military coming to adopt me. Of course, the necessary basic education wasn't lacking. After all, as a professional assassin, I knew more knowledge than a student preparing for the college entrance examination, just different kinds of knowledge. Under the training of the killer couple, on my 18th birthday, I awakened my own cheat, the damned Naruto mobile game finally finished loading. In the same year, I completed my training as an assassin, and my name, Charles Doyle, came from the last name of my adoptive parents. Although I had sacrificed them, I still inherited their surname, and even became what they had hoped for, an assassin of the Continental Hotel, a relatively famous one. After all, even before awakening the cheat, I had already become a registered professional assassin in high demand. Coupled with this cheat. After more than a decade of learning, Charles had no intention of changing careers. Chapter Release Schedule, 6 Chap Slash Week Want bonus chapters? Check the auxiliary chapter. It's been over three years since the cheat was awakened. Every time he opened the cheat, the game interface of Naruto would pop up, along with a message prompting to recharge and upgrade to VIP 10 and instantly receive Gara of the Sandstorm. However, over these three years, Charles had attempted countless times to recharge using different currencies such as US dollars, British pounds, rubles, and even precious metals like gold and diamonds. Unfortunately, none of these attempts yielded any results. Every time he tried to recharge, it would result in a failure notification. Three years had passed, and he had completely given up on the idea of leveling up. He even exchanged Chinese Yuan to give it a try, but it was still ineffective. Upon opening the Naruto game panel, what appeared before Charles was himself, along with an illusory night view of the Leaf Village. His initial character wasn't the standard Uzumaki Naruto but rather himself, Charles Doyle. Over these three years, he had learned how to use the cheat effectively. He could perform daily check-ins, which rewarded him with copper coins, prestige, explosive tags, soul jades, reincarnation stones, delicious ramen, as well as ninja recruitment scrolls and gold coins, which could only be obtained through recharging. Among these rewards, copper coins and prestige were used for practicing ninja arts and upgrading psychic creatures. Copper coins were especially important, as they were needed for upgrading ninja arts, strengthening equipment, and upgrading secret scrolls. Fortunately, system rewarded copper coins and US dollars could be mutually exchanged at a 1 to 1 ratio. This led to him primarily converting to copper coins over the years and not converting to US dollar, after all, copper coins were genuinely not enough. As for the so-called soul jades and reincarnation stones, they were used to enhance artifacts. However, he had no idea how to obtain artifacts. The ninja recruitment scrolls were scarce over the years, whether due to his bad luck or some other reason. Through daily check-ins, he could acquire only one or two a month. Sometimes, luck favored him, and he could get up to three in a month, while other times, only one. As for the elusive double sign-in bonus from days 1 to 12, it seemed to be beyond his reach. In terms of gold coins, he could acquire only 50 a month through daily check-ins. However, a standard recruitment scroll required 168 gold coins. Limited edition recruitment and privilege recruitment were even further out of reach. Features like team assaults, trial locations, the duel arena, rankings, point matches, abundance areas, and ninja tournaments all appeared grayed out in the game, unavailable to him. It was unclear whether these features required specific conditions to unlock or some other prerequisites. Interestingly, ever since he joined the Continental Hotel Assassins Association, the organization's headquarters had been illuminated. Simultaneously, the Task Assembly Hall was also illuminated. All the assassin contracts he accepted at the Continental Hotel would count in the Task Assembly Hall. However, the Task Assembly Hall required characters to accept the missions, and at most, three tasks could be accepted within a day. In other words, the possibility of wildly grinding tasks through the task assembly hall didn't exist. The missions level was even determined here, classified as S, A, 
B, C, or D, with varying rewards for each level. The rewards differed for each task level. Nonetheless, the introduction of the task assembly hall allowed Charles to receive tasks other than assassinations, protection, escort, transport, and search were all considered missions. Under these circumstances, outside the Continental Hotel, he established a firm named Charles Agency to accept the aforementioned tasks. He selectively accepted tasks that were recognized by the task assembly hall. In addition to this, the system also provided a self-operated training ground. This training ground wasn't a place for battling in-game but a real training ground from the world of Naruto, much like the 8th training ground. Here, Charles could practice ninjutsu, taijutsu, genjutsu, shuriken throwing, and other techniques. The only drawback was the absence of combat, which prevented him from gaining practical experience. Through training in this field over the years, he had significantly improved his strength. Practicing ninjutsu in this training ground had proven to be more than useful. Regarding ninja recruitment, he had acquired a total of 50 ninja recruitment scrolls over the course of three years. Following the practice of his previous life, he waited until he accumulated 10 scrolls before using them collectively. After all, not every ninja recruitment scroll guaranteed the acquisition of a ninja or ninja fragments. Some scrolls rewarded copper coins, prestige, equipment materials, and more. However, over the years, he had managed to acquire only three ninjas. The reason for not acquiring more was that when duplicate recruitment occurred, the duplicate ninja would transform into fragments. B rank or higher ninjas were transformed into 15 fragments, while C rank ninjas transformed into 10 fragments. For C rank ninjas not yet acquired, 10 identical fragments could be synthesized into a recruitment. As for B rank ninjas, it required 40 identical ninja fragments. Similarly, A rank ninjas also required 40 identical ninja fragments. However, S rank ninjas demanded a staggering 100 identical ninja fragments. There seemed to be no consistent pattern. Additionally, ninjas could be promoted in star level, ranging from 1 star to the highest level of 5 stars. Promoting from 1 star to 2 stars required 30 fragments. For 2 stars to reach 3 stars, 60 fragments were needed. 3 stars to 4 stars required 100 fragments. Finally, 4 stars to 5 stars necessitated 200 fragments. While each star promotion improved the character's overall attributes, the difficulty was immense, especially in his case with the presence of this kind of cheat. Obtaining character fragments was truly a daunting task. Although the ninjas he obtained were all C-rank, which were considered trash in the mobile game, they were significant forces in the early stages of the Marvel world. The three ninjas he possessed, one, Uchiha Sasuke, without Sharingan, skills, fire style, great fireball jutsu, lion combo, Chidori 7-2. Iruka Yumino. Skills, teaching, barrier formation, roar of love 5-3. Rock Lee. Skills, infinite dance, leaf hurricane, lotus blossom 5 for the recruited ninjas, he could use all their skills, while also acquiring the standard C-rank ninja chakra quantity. Additionally, he himself could cultivate chakra. The only frustrating part was that even though this Sasuke could already use Chidori, he lacked the Sharingan. This move was truly a game changer. Only when he successfully recruited Sasuke with the Sharingan could he obtain the Sharingan. This way, he could keep up with Chidori's rapid advancement. Although among these three one was Chunin level ninja, with two being Genin level, the strength they exhibited in a Marvel universe that hadn't yet experienced significant events was remarkable. As long as they weren't hit directly by firearms or explosives, their assassination abilities were indeed formidable. After all, common ninjas were low in defense but high in attack power. T slash N, in case you might get confused, MC's name has been changed from Charlotte Doyle to Charles Doyle as the previous name was kinda feminine. These recruited ninjas, when given the opportunity to fight, could truly manifest and become living beings in the Marvel world. The world of anime converging with reality. Apart from initially having one battle slot, opening each additional slot required the use of gold coins. Over the course of three years, all the gold coins obtained from signing in had been invested into opening battle slots, ultimately resulting in just two more slots being unlocked. The three manifested ninjas, including himself, could form a team of four. As long as he had enough battle slots, 
he could even bring all the ninja characters into the Marvel world. Manifested characters possessed their own intelligence, but they were completely loyal to the summoner. If they weren't completely loyal, Charles wouldn't dare to bring them into the real world. After all, some ninjas were capable of various tricky operations. As for summoning techniques, he had currently only unlocked summoning the ninja dogs. As for the later options like the snake, toad, or even tailed beasts. They made him feel envious, but he hadn't even maxed out his training with the ninja dogs. However, that would change soon. With a bit of reputation, he could max out the training for the ninja dogs and unlock the summoning of the next creature, the blue snake. After checking his personal information, Charles took a sip of his whiskey and lay down on the bed, slowly falling asleep. The next day, after having breakfast at the hotel, Charles was sitting leisurely in the lobby. His secretary, Ms. Ginny, had been sent to his office. At this moment, as Charles was sitting in the lobby, he saw a man with a suitcase making his way to the hotel front desk to check in. His steps were steady, but his expression was grave. An aura of danger surrounded him, clearly, he had taken the lives of many the previous night. He seemed like a volcano about to erupt at any moment. Hey! John! Charles extended a hand to greet him. He had met John more than once. Thanks to his psychic dog, they had crossed paths several times while walking their dogs. They had exchanged contact information, and they could be considered acquaintances. Furthermore, when John received his dog from his loved one, he had called him to ask about some tips on raising a dog. They were, to a certain extent, dog-loving friends. Especially now, when John saw Charles greeting him in the hotel lobby, he was momentarily taken aback. He hadn't expected Charles to be a killer from the Continental Hotel. It should be noted that, after his loved one left the world of assassins, he had left that life behind for four years. This meant he had almost lost touch with everyone from the Continental Hotel, and he wasn't quite sure about Charles's exact profession. After a brief pause, he replied slowly, Charles, I'm here to check in at the hotel. Charles walked up to John Wick and stopped about a meter away from him. Then he said slowly, it seems like you've run into trouble. Someone has put a two million dollar bounty on you. Do you need help? All you need is a contract badge. He knew that although this situation had caused some trouble for John Wick, he could easily help out and obtain a contract badge essentially for free, it would be a profitable deal for him. Upon hearing that he now had a $2 million bounty on his head, John Wick didn't pay much attention. After all, he had realized last night, when he had dealt with the assassins who had come for him, that they wouldn't just give up. They would definitely offer a reward for his elimination. So, he calmly responded, not needed for now. If there's a need, I'll contact you. All right then, we'll be in touch. Upon hearing John Wick's refusal, Charles didn't mind. John Wick had plenty of troubles, and things weren't always smooth for him. There would always be times when he needed help. Besides, Charles could also intervene and help out voluntarily when things seemed dangerous, creating a sense of indebtedness. Seeing Charles walk away, John Wick continued toward the hotel front desk. At this moment, a female assassin who had just finished checking in turned to John Wick and said, Nice to see you again, John. I feel the same way, Perkins. After exchanging greetings, John completed his check-in procedures and then left the hotel lobby. Meanwhile, Charles continued to sit in the hotel lobby, slowly sipping his coffee. The grand show was about to begin tonight. Night fell. In the underground bar of the Continental Hotel, Charles was now sitting in a booth not far from the entrance with Ginny, enjoying some bourbon whiskey. Charles, the bounty on John Wick has gone up to four million dollars, and four gold coins. Are you sure you're not considering it? Ginny whispered the latest information she had in Charles's ear. Charles raised his index finger and shook it, indicating that he wasn't considering the mission. He then explained, I have a better plan. He held a positive view of this guy named John Wick. Although he was merely an ordinary person, his strength was impressive, earning him the nickname Night Devil due to his decisiveness in taking lives. If he could get him to help and join his side, it would be a significant boost to his early endeavors. After all, while his three ninjas had decent strength, he was still short on manpower. He sometimes found himself constrained when trying to accomplish certain tasks. While the two were conversing, 
the bar's entrance swung open, and John Wick entered. Seeing him, Charles greeted him once again. His voice reached John's ears. Hey! John! Upon hearing Charles's voice, John saw the two individuals not far from the entrance and then scanned the bar, spotting Winston in a booth. Subsequently, John walked up to Charles and greeted, Good evening, Charles. Facing the approaching John, Charles said, John, your price has doubled now, four million plus four gold coins. Are you sure you don't need my help? Some of the newcomers nowadays aren't playing by the rules. Hearing Charles's words, John Wick's brows slightly furrowed. As a killer, offering to help someone typically meant that the other party needed his specific skills. He had already left the world of assassins behind, and this time it seemed to be a personal matter rather than professional. He didn't want to get dragged back into this quagmire. However, his bounty had doubled and now included four gold coins. This made John realize that the situation wasn't as simple as he had thought. Other assassins might try to cash in on the reward. But considering his own abilities, he believed he could handle the situation and graciously declined Charles's offer, expressing that he could manage for the time being. After that, John Wick left Charles's side and headed straight toward the booth where Winston was seated. He had some matters to discuss with Winston, and he also needed to find out more about those troublemakers and their current whereabouts. Ginny watched as John Wick walked away and said with a playful tone, So, that's the night devil. It seems he declined our esteemed ninja's offer. And it looks like this legendary assassin got a beating as well. With a slight smile, Charles Doyle responded, He's been out of the assassin world for four years. Getting ambushed and sustaining some injuries is quite normal. At this point, he just wants to keep his distance from us. But you know, his return to the spotlight has caused quite a stir. He might not be able to completely sever ties with the assassin world. This incident might drag him back completely. And nobody can refuse Charles Doyle's goodwill, not even the night devil. As they conversed, John Wick had already finished talking with Winston and obtained the addresses of a few troublemakers. He left the bar shortly after. Seeing John leave, Ginny smiled and asked, he's gone. Do you want to follow him? Charles shook his head and replied calmly, no need. He'll be back at the hotel. The story is just beginning, and there will be plenty of opportunities. After a couple of drinks, Charles suggested, let me walk you back. The nights in New York aren't exactly peaceful. They left the Continental Hotel and returned Ginny to her residence. After seeing her safely inside, Charles turned back towards the hotel. Back in her room, Ginny leaned against the door. Once she was sure Charles had left, she slowly stood up. She had known Charles for some time now, and had been his assistant for about half a year. She used to be a hit woman for a textile factory, but her life almost ended due to a botched mission. It was during that mission that she stumbled upon Charles's doorstep, and he had saved her. Since then, she had turned her back on her violent past. Upon learning that Charles was also an assassin, she chose to become his assistant. She helped him gather information on missions and handle miscellaneous tasks. During these six months, they didn't contact her after she left the textile factory. It was as if they silently accepted her departure. But today, she received news from the factory, the cross had betrayed them. Now she was torn between whether or not to trouble Charles with this matter. T slash N, I am not familiar with her story. So, if there is any issue with the translation, do let me know. On the other hand, back at the Continental Hotel, Charles quietly waited. His room was at the end of the hallway, right next to John Wick's room. Time ticked by slowly. Then he heard the sound of a door opening. Charles knew that John Wick had returned. As he anticipated, not long after, sounds of a scuffle emanated from the adjacent room. Although Charles didn't go over, he could well imagine what was happening. John Wick had likely apprehended Perkins, the female hit woman who had violated the rules of the Continental Hotel. With a bedsheet over her head, John was likely giving her a lesson, hammering down blows. Charles knew that someone would notify the hotel reception, so he didn't bother calling them himself. Contemplating the hotel's strict rules, Charles couldn't help but find them slightly absurd. No killing allowed. While the rule made sense, the situation was quite ironic. Due to the rule, even after someone initiated a fight, you couldn't kill them on the hotel premises. 
After all, when one party violates the rules, you still need to follow them, otherwise, you could be seen as a rule breaker and face the Continental Hotel's consequences. This was why John Wick held back. In a matter of moments, the sounds of the scuffle ceased. John had emerged victorious. At this point, Charles Doyle opened his door room and saw Perkins crawling in the hallway. He shook his head silently. John, after ending the call, emerged from his room. He grabbed Perkins from behind, pressing the barrel of his gun against her head. He then knocked her out with the butt of his gun. Just as he did, Harry, staying in a room adjacent to John's, heard the commotion and opened his door with a gun in hand. The sound of a gun being loaded caught John's attention. He paused, uncertain whether the person behind him was an enemy, someone aiming to claim the bounty on him. Without turning around, a voice from behind him said, Do we know each other? Hearing the familiar voice, John Wick replied, We should, right? John then raised his hands, signaling that he meant no harm. Just as he was about to lift his head to turn around, he noticed that the door in front of him was also ajar, revealing a man standing there. It was Charles Doyle, whom he had encountered twice within the same day. After a brief pause, he turned away, greeted the black hitman behind him, Hey, Harry. Harry glanced at the three individuals, especially focusing on Charles Doyle. His pupils involuntarily contracted. Then he addressed John, Is everything all right? John Wick replied, No issues. Then you've got this covered. Harry turned to leave, heading back to his room. However, John called out to him, Hey, Harry. Want to earn a coin? Keep an eye on this sleeping beauty for me. With an expressionless face, Harry asked, Catch and release. John Wick humorously responded, Exactly, a game of cat and mouse. Hearing John's words, Harry accepted the task. He took out a pair of handcuffs from his room and secured Perkins' hands behind her back before leading her into his own room. Standing in the doorway, Charles Doyle held a bottle of Chivas Regal and an empty glass. He smiled at John Wick, who had momentarily finished his task, and said, John, care for a sip. Your injuries don't look light. As he spoke, Charles used the hand holding the glass to gesture towards John's injured abdomen. John Wick walked over, took the Chivas Regal and the glass, poured himself a drink, and downed it in one go. This is good whiskey. He glanced at the label, Chivas Regal 1987, before returning the bottle and glass to Charles Doyle. Accepting the bottle and glass, Charles Doyle asked, John, you're looking a bit rough. Do you need assistance with your upcoming actions? Charles Doyle, I've retired. This is a personal matter, and I can handle it. John Wick clearly didn't want to be dragged back into the quagmire of the assassin world and declined the help of this persistent friend. Charles Doyle shrugged and expressed his regret, All right then, John. Take care of yourself. If the night devil were to fall now, it would be a loss for the assassin world. Afterwards, Charles Doyle turned and returned to his room, closing the door behind him. As for Harry, the black hitman responsible for guarding Perkins, Charles had no intention of reminding him about the potential danger he might face. Whether he lives or dies, doesn't concern him. Back in his room, Charles Doyle wasn't upset about John Wick's refusal again. If you want someone to owe you a favor, especially someone like John Wick, it can't be accomplished through such straightforward means. He was merely trying to deepen John Wick's impression of him and avoid triggering too much caution from sudden assistance. After all, John Wick was about to face a major crisis, being ambushed at the church by Vigo Tarasov's men, getting knocked out and captured, nearly suffocating with a plastic bag. Charles Doyle wanted to rescue John before Marcus could, as one life-saving act was enough, he couldn't allow Marcus to monopolize two opportunities. After a brief rest, Charles left the Continental Hotel and headed towards the church in Little Russia. He knew that as dawn approached, John Wick would be arriving at the scene. Upon arriving at the location, Charles scoped out the surroundings of the church and identified a suspicious-looking warehouse that likely held John Wick captive. He chose a rooftop with good visibility and ample cover to wait. Daylight came. Gunshots rang out from the church, alerting Charles Doyle who was concealed in the shadows. The sound of gunfire signaled that the nightcrawler had commenced his killing spree. Charles retrieved a pair of binoculars and began observing the deadly performance. Pop, pop, pop. A series of shots, each one lethal. 
the whole process flowed like water, devoid of unnecessary words or actions. This distinctive charm of straightforwardness in John Wick's method appealed to Charles. He had plans to recruit him under his wing for handling regular tasks. Such a killer, in all honesty, didn't seem weaker than the so-called Hawkeye. In the early stages, he could be a valuable asset. As Charles marveled at John Wick's actions, the battle concluded. Two women emerged from the church, followed shortly by smoke rising from the basement. Charles knew that John Wick had incinerated the cash, antiques, artworks, and evidence of collusion with government officials that Vigo Tarasov had stored in the basement. Charles clicked his tongue, lamenting, it's a shame to see all that money go up in smoke. They could have been turned into copper coins for me. What a waste. Soon, he spotted John Wick emerging from the church and quickly positioned himself for a clear line of sight. Damn it, everything's turned to ashes, Vigo cursed as he stormed out of the basement, executing the priest who had opened the door to the underground vault with a gunshot to the head. At this moment, John Wick, who had witnessed this scene from the rooftop, didn't hesitate. Holding a hairy ARSCA-415 assault rifle, he headed straight towards the lower levels. Bang, bang. The sound of an assault rifle echoed, and Vigo turned his head to find one of his henchmen collapsing, shot. He realized that John Wick had arrived. In an instant, he crouched, taking cover by the side of the car. Damn it, counterattack. His henchmen immediately drew their guns and engaged in an exchange of fire with John Wick. Unfortunately, Vigo's men failed to inflict any substantial damage on John Wick. Instead, they fell victim to his lethal accuracy. From the rooftop, Charles Doyle watched the gunfight below with relish, murmuring to himself, these gangsters can't compare to professional assassins, especially legendary killers like John Wick. Their marksmanship is utterly pathetic, as if their child facing an adult. By the way, John used to be one of Vigo's henchmen, right? Tisk, TSK, TSK. In the end, the Vigo's gang will be wiped out by his own men. Truly a guy who was screwed over by his own son. Three down, five down, beautifully done, that's six. In the blink of an eye, John Wick had taken down six foes. Charles was keeping count from above. After swiftly reloading, John killed two more, bringing the tally to eight Russian gang members eliminated. One of Vigo's henchmen climbed into a car and started the engine, preparing to ram John Wick. Charles Doyle, who had witnessed this, had no intention of lending assistance. He was still waiting for his opportunity. Bang! The sound of a collision reverberated, and in the next moment, John Wick was sent flying, losing consciousness. As the gunshot ceased, Vigo and his men approached, binding John Wick and preparing to take him to a warehouse for interrogation. Observing this, Charles felt a tinge of exasperation. While the outcome aligned well with his intentions, he reminded himself that, when facing an enemy, it was best to not prattle on and instead just kill them. Indeed, if Vigo had shot John just now, how could there be any further events? His son wouldn't die, and neither would he. Sure enough, villains die from talking too much. Quietly, Charles followed behind Vigo's group, stealthily sneaking without making a sound. Utilizing his speed, he entered the warehouse along with them. In the warehouse, Vigo Tarasov instructed his henchmen to tie John Wick to a chair. As John slowly regained consciousness, Vigo began, John, let me put it this way. My men will definitely dismember you. At this moment, one of Vigo's men placed a chair across from John. Vigo sat down, launching a lengthy monologue. Hidden in the shadowy corner of the warehouse, Charles's lips curled into a wry smile. Such situations left him somewhat speechless. When Vigo finally concluded his speech and prepared to leave with his henchmen, seeing John Wick on the verge of being suffocated by a plastic bag, Charles intervened first. He swiftly launched two shurikens. Swoosh, swoosh. The shuriken soared through the air with a whooshing sound, instantly killing the two henchmen. The two thugs clutched their throats, unable to make a sound. They collapsed to the ground, twitched briefly, and then blood gushed from their necks. They died in an instant. At this moment, outside the warehouse, Marcus, who was ready to provide backup, seeing the two shurikens taking down the gang members, he knew he didn't need to intervene. Afterward, he merely observed the situation inside through the scope of his sniper rifle, waiting to confirm the final outcome. 
Charles emerged from the shadows, greeting with a, Hey, John. I told you that you needed my help. T slash N, there was a slight mistake in the last chapter. Vigo already left the room when Charles saved John Wick. John Wick was surprised by the sudden appearance of Charles Doyle, who had saved him. Just moments ago, he had thought he might be joining his beloved wife and dog on the other side. He thanked Charles, saying, Thank you. I owe you a favor. As John was about to attempt to untie the restraints on his hands, Charles spoke up, no need for that trouble. He swiftly threw a dart that neatly cut the restraints on John's wrists. Pretty cool. John said, and without lingering, he picked up a shotgun from the ground, saying as he ran, Charles, I'll thank you later at the Continental Hotel. Right now, I've got things to do. With that, he charged out of the storage room. The sunlight illuminated Charles Doyle, who took out a shuriken. He waved it in a particular direction under the sunlight, causing the reflected light to shine onto the rooftop where Marcus was stationed. Marcus realized he had been spotted. As a seasoned assassin with a title of his own, he didn't make any unnecessary moves. He had come to assist John Wick, and now that his old friend had escaped danger on his own, Marcus was satisfied. Putting away his sniper rifle, Marcus prepared to leave the scene of conflict. Meanwhile, outside, John Wick had confronted Vigo and even used the shotgun to take out Vigo's driver in a single shot. Where is he, Vigo? John aimed his shotgun at Vigo after taking out a henchman beside him. After questioning Vigo about his son's whereabouts and arranging a deal to cancel the bounty against him, John agreed not to harm Vigo. While John was dealing with Vigo, Charles Doyle, who had left the warehouse, didn't reveal himself. Utilizing his ninja-like speed and stealth, he silently left the scene without exposing his presence. Charles didn't concern himself with the reconciliation between John and Vigo. He had his own perspective. He believes that everyone has their own principles. At the same time, inside the Continental Hotel, after Perkins killed Harry in the hotel room, she took the gold coin that John had given to Harry and remembered the moment when John unexpectedly rolled off the bed during her failed assassination attempt. She re-entered John Wick's room and found a bullet hole on the head of the bed. Upon closer examination, she realized it was caused by a sniper bullet, not the handgun she had used. Following the trajectory of the bullet, she looked toward the window and spotted a bullet hole. Ruined my job. I'll make you pay. Perkins instantly understood why her assassination attempt had failed. After taking note of everything, she left the Continental Hotel. Meanwhile, in another location, having left Little Russia, Charles Doyle quickly returned to the entrance of the Continental Hotel. He handed a gold coin to the doorman, covering the entrance fee. He then returned to his hotel room to await John's arrival and receive his gratitude. Charles Doyle was quite satisfied with the successful completion of this mission. Having killed just two gang members, he managed to save John's life and secure a promise in return. It was a trade that seemed worthwhile. Thinking about the gold coins he had used so far, Charles couldn't help but feel a bit bewildered. These coins were issued and promoted by the high table, and their purchasing power was simply astonishing. To elaborate, entry to the Continental Hotel, one gold coin. Staying at the Continental Hotel, one gold coin. Entry to the hotel bar, one gold coin. Arranging medical treatment, one gold coin. Disposing of a body, one gold coin. Even a simple favor, like the one John asked of Harry, cost one gold coin. Any service within the Continental Hotel, including hiring an assassin, had a minimum price of one gold coin. To put it simply, one gold coin could only get you an entry into the hotel and a few hours of care. On the other hand, the same gold coin could hire a reasonably capable assassin for an assassination mission. Consider that John Wick, also known as the Boogeyman, had a bounty of just four gold coins on his head. And for four gold coins, assassins in the Continental Hotel were willing to break the rules and commit murder. Without gold coins, with only regular currency, you might not be able to hire a Continental Hotel assassin. These gold coins had an enigmatic purchasing power, with their value fluctuating significantly. However, thanks to the promotion by the high table, these coins became the hard currency of the assassin world. Supporting the value of these gold coins was the Continental Hotel, which seemed to be the equivalent of a mercenary guild in the assassin world. 
It issued bounties, gathered intelligence, and most importantly, becoming a registered member of the Continental Hotel offered protection, including a prohibition on fighting within the hotel's premises. Around 80% of New York's assassins registered as members of the Continental Hotel. The hotel was a hub for assassins. Of course, there were still various other assassin organizations in the outside world, but none of them could match the power of the Continental Hotel. The hotel also had its own enforcers, responsible for punishing assassins who violated its rules. Each Continental Hotel manager has their own armed force. Behind the Continental Hotel stood another organization, the High Table. The High Table was an alliance of major criminal syndicates from around the world, comprising 12 seats in total. Its headquarter is located in the desert near Casablanca. These 12 seats constituted the management of the High Table, each occupied by a different faction such as the Camorra, the Italian Mafia, the Triads, and more. However, wherever there are people, there will be conflicts. Even with the major criminal syndicates forming the High Table, internal power struggles and conflicts persisted. Charles Doyle had a particular goal in mind, to obtain one of the 12 seats in the High Table. After all, before the Marvel Universe event began, this seemed like a worthwhile objective. After all, this business was right up his alley. Ninjas are responsible for assassination, gathering intelligence, and even starting wars, aren't they? Lying on his bed, Charles Doyle absent-mindedly picked up a gold coin and toyed with it in his hand, causing the coin to dance between his fingers. On the other side, after providing John Wick with the information he needed, Vigo Tarasov didn't immediately leave in his car. Instead, he returned to the warehouse where he had previously held John captive. He looked at the two corpses on the ground and walked over to inspect them. He wanted to understand how the night devil, who was clearly bound and outnumbered, managed to escape and turn the tables. After all, his men were armed with firearms, while John was tightly bound. Examining the wounds on the bodies of his henchmen and the two shurikens and the throwing dart left behind on the ground, Vigo Tarasov's face darkened. He roared in anger, Ninja, Charles. Vigo Tarasov was extremely furious at this point. He knew who had disrupted his plans and saved John Wick. He roared in anger, no one can disrupt my plans like this and get away with it. Having said that, Vigo didn't linger any longer. He left the warehouse and drove straight back home. His face was as dark as a storm cloud. Ever since his troublesome son had crossed paths with the night devil, nothing had gone smoothly for him. Important information had been destroyed, his henchmen were being killed off, and he was even forced to compromise and reveal his son's hiding place to save his own skin. While he had taken measures to protect his son at that location, Vigo still lacked confidence. He hoped against hope that his men could keep his son safe and eliminate John who had come for them. Though the odds were slim, Vigo clung to a one in a million chance and waited for the outcome. Time ticked away. Vigo's expression grew increasingly serious. He smoked, leaving a pile of cigarette butts in the ashtray. He was waiting for the news that was tormenting him. The phone rang, and Vigo took a deep breath before answering it. After hearing the news on the other end, he paused for a moment before hanging up the phone. He then picked up the cigarette, taking several long drags. Following that, he dialed several phone numbers, making arrangements. Meanwhile, after avenging himself, John Wick returned to the Continental Hotel. As he walked into the hotel, the front desk attendant, Sharon, called out to him. Mr. Wick. Hearing his name, John stopped and approached the front desk. Sharon handed him a set of car keys and said, Mr. Wick, the Continental Hotel deeply apologizes for the events of last night. This is a gesture of goodwill from the hotel management in response to what happened. After hearing Karen's words, John Wick looked at the car keys, not refusing them but accepting them. He greeted Sharon and then proceeded upstairs. Arriving at Charles's room, John lightly knocked on the door. Hearing the knock, Charles opened the door and greeted him, John, is everything taken care of? Yes, it's done. Then come in. With that, Charles invited John inside to sit down and chat. John entered the room and said, Charles, thank you for your help. You saved my life this time. After speaking, John retrieved a blood oath medallion from his pocket and continued, you mentioned earlier that you wanted one of my blood oath medallions. I'm curious about what you need me to do. 
If it's something that can be done soon, I won't give you a blood oath medallion. I'll just help you accomplish the task. After all, you know I've retired and been out of the assassin world for four years. Charles's expression remained calm as he said slowly, Give me the blood oath medallion. I'll contact you when I need your help. There's nothing else for you to do right now. Upon hearing this, John's face remained impassive, but internally he felt a sense of gravity. Whatever Charles had planned for later might not be an easy task, yet he handed over the blood oath medallion as requested. Receiving the blood oath medallion, Charles smiled. He was in good spirits and was ready to give some reminder to John Wick. He opened his mouth and said, John, did you kill Vigo? John Wick wasn't sure why Charles was asking about this, but he replied, I only had some personal grievances with Vigo's son. I didn't lay a hand on Vigo. He told me about his son's whereabouts and cancelled the bounty. Upon realizing that John had spared Vigo's life, Charles continued, Vigo Tarasov is the leader of the Russian Mafia. He won't take this lying down. Be prepared for his retaliation. I believe Vigo Tarasov will honor the agreement between us. Nonetheless, thank you for the warning. Hearing that John Wick didn't heed his warning, Charles didn't say more. As for whether Marcus would survive, that was up to fate. After bidding farewell to Charles, John Wick checked out of the Continental Hotel. Before leaving, he submitted the blood oath medallion he had handed over to the hotel's registration. Driving the black Dodge provided by the Continental Hotel's management, John Wick was on his way to meet an old friend. After all, it wasn't just Charles who saved his life, but also Marcus, who had warned him at the hotel. Arriving at their usual meeting spot, Marcus joked, John, how many times do I have to save you? John Wick responded, I'm extremely grateful, Marcus. Marcus glanced at the man before him and then said, you don't look too good. I've retired. This is my retired state. Hearing his longtime partner's reply, Marcus was somewhat dissatisfied. He said, retired? You believe that? You just have a new life. You'll find a way to get back on track. With that, Marcus patted John Wick's shoulder and said, it's time to go home. After sighing, Marcus turned and left. Their conversation wasn't particularly pleasant. However, neither Marcus nor John Wick knew that their meeting had been fully recorded by Perkins, who was hidden in a nearby car. Perkins then reported the conversation to Vigo Tarasov. Back in his room, Vigo Tarasov watched the video brought by Perkins. His expression grew even darker. He hadn't anticipated that besides the intervention of the ninja, Charles, even the assassin he had hired, Marcus, had betrayed him. Sometimes, the anger of others meddling in your affairs pales in comparison to the betrayal of your own underlings. If it weren't for Marcus's betrayal, his son wouldn't have died. This realization fueled Vigo's anger even more. Without hesitation, Vigo issued orders to his men to surround Marcus's home. He wanted Marcus to pay the price for his actions. At the same time, he took out his phone and instructed another contact, get rid of that damn Charles. The ninja. I want him dead. After issuing orders to his men, Vigo, accompanied by Perkins and some of his henchmen, drove to Marcus's home. He intended to take care of him there, using methods befitting for the Russian mafia, dealing with the assassin who had betrayed him. Inside the Continental Hotel, Charles entered the Naruto World interface and completed today's sign-in, receiving a reward of 30,000 copper coins. Upgrade to a privileged Tier 2 user and enjoy double sign-in rewards. Looking at the reappearing invitation to recharge, Charles couldn't help but feel a bit helpless. It's not that he didn't want to become a premium user, but he genuinely didn't know how to recharge, so he reluctantly chose to close the pop-up. Having obtained John Wick's blood oath medallion, Charles went to the Continental Hotel's front desk, checked out, and left the hotel. As the sky darkened, Charles didn't head to his office. Yumino Irika was in charge there, so he didn't need to worry for now. If there were any difficult tasks, Irika would contact him. Although Irika was just a mid-level ninja responsible for teaching within the Naruto universe, in the time before the Marvel event started, taking on missions was still quite easy for him. Charles drove his beloved Mercedes 300 SL to 405, Lexington Avenue in Manhattan, New York. He had rented a 200-square-meter apartment in the Chrysler Building for his usual residence. In reality, Charles had once searched for the Stark Tower on Fifth Avenue. 
he wanted to see if those several individuals from the Marvel world were present. However, the result was that there was no apartment called the Stark Tower on Fifth Avenue yet, and thus, those individuals didn't exist either. Frankly, this left him slightly disappointed. Before it got completely dark, Charles arrived at Lexington Avenue. He slowly drove his car into the underground parking garage of the Chrysler building. At this moment, the security personnel responsible for the building's underground parking saw Charles's car from afar. They immediately opened the gate and greeted him with a smile. Mainly because Charles's Mercedes 300 SL was quite distinctive, being a 1954 model with gullwing doors. It was highly recognizable. Moreover, among all the building's residents, only Charles was willing to drive such a valuable vintage car on the road. Yes, the 1954 Mercedes 300 SL was truly an authentic vintage car. Charles had bought this car from a bankrupt wealthy man. At the time, the car had only been driven for a little over 2,000 kilometers, and it had been very well maintained by the owner. It was in perfect condition for road travel. In Charles's eyes, cars were meant to be driven, not left in a garage as exhibits. It wasn't his original intention. He passed through the entrance gate, slowly driving into the underground parking garage, and parked his car in his designated spot. As he got out of the car, he felt a surge of killing intent. Gunshots rang out, and in the blink of an eye, Charles retrieved a shuriken from the Naruto world and deflected the bullets coming his way. Clang! A crisp collision sound echoed as Charles deflected the bullets. In the next instant, he threw a shuriken, which landed directly on the neck of the person firing the gun, instantly killing them. However, when he fell to the ground, his finger remained on the trigger due to the rapid fire, causing the assault rifle to spray bullets toward Charles's nearby car. Bastard! Charles cursed under his breath. He didn't pause his movements, even though he lacked any weapon in his hand. He deflected all the incoming bullets, finally saving his car from any damage. All of this happened within the blink of an eye. Having just saved his car and barely had a moment to catch his breath, another gunman appeared, aiming at Charles and pulling the trigger vigorously. A massive barrage of bullets was unleashed, forming a rain of projectiles. Fortunately, the moment Charles saw the gunman, he swiftly performed hand signs and employed the substitution jutsu in time, evading the barrage of bullets. However, his beloved car behind him was instantly turned into a riddle. The four gunmen, upon witnessing Charles transform into a wooden pole in an instant, were left dumbfounded. They even stopped pulling the triggers, completely astonished. At this moment, Charles appeared to the side through the substitution jutsu. He swiftly turned his body. Whoosh! He arrived in front of one of the gunmen. The shuriken swept across the man's neck, and in an instant, one gunman met his demise, collapsing to the ground. Now, the other three gunmen had just managed to react and immediately redirected their guns. Unfortunately, before the three could even turn around, Charles's figure was like a ghostly phantom. He appeared before them in an instant and used the shuriken to slash their necks. With all five gunmen dead, the underground parking garage fell silent once more. No more gunmen jumped out. Charles walked over to his car, gazing at the dense bullet marks on its body, instantly feeling heartache. This was an antique car that he really liked. He wasn't sure if it could be repaired back to its original state. Turning his focus from the battle-damaged version of his Mercedes 300 SL, Charles was curious who the audacious individual was that dared to attack him. Charles approached the bodies of the gunmen and discovered that they were all Russians. He immediately deduced that this was all the work of that bastard, Vigo. Damn Vigo! In the morning's battle, he hadn't retrieved his shurikens. Instead, he left them at the scene as a symbol, to let Vigo know that he, the ninja Charles, had saved those people. Originally, he wanted to intimidate Vigo, but things didn't go as planned. Instead, it led to Vigo sending his underlings to find him. Knowing who the target was, the rest was easier to handle. Charles took out his phone, dialed a number, and soon the call was answered. Charlie. Chrysler Building Parking Garage, a dinner for five. Yes, right away. After hanging up the call, his phone rang shortly after. Charles glanced at the incoming number and pressed the answer button. Charles, is that you? John, it's me. On the other end of the line, John Wick's tone carried a touch of sadness. 
he spoke with an urgent tone, I should have taken care of Vigo. That bastard sent people to kill my old friend Marcus. He saved me at the Continental Hotel yesterday. Charles, Vigo might come after you too. Be careful. Charles looked at the five corpses on the ground and said, he already did. Ha. Huh. I've already dealt with Vigo's men he sent after me. Hearing that Charles had already taken care of Vigo's men, John Wick said, as long as you're safe. I'm going after Vigo now to settle the score. We'll be in touch later. With that, John Wick hung up the phone. Hearing the busy tone on the other end of the call, Charles chuckled and muttered, stubborn old man. Charles knew that John was going to avenge his old friend. Glancing at his beloved car once again, he muttered, since someone wants to kill you, I won't compete for that, but this debt will be settled with your Russian gang. Charles Doyle, with his mobile phone, dialed Ginny's number and made a call. In less than three seconds, the call was answered. Ginny, help me find the address of Vigo Tarasov's gang in New York and send it to me as soon as possible. Ginny didn't ask for the reason, simply replying, understood. After giving a simple task, Charles Doyle hung up the phone. He knew that the church was just a base for the Russian gang, and the main headquarters of the gang wasn't there. The items in the church were only a part of the Russian gang's operations. His main focus was on the incriminating evidence and bribery materials related to officials. Charles Doyle waited in the underground parking lot. Not too long afterward, a van drove into the parking lot. Charlie got out of the van and approached Charles, taking off his hat and greeting, It's an honor to serve you, Mr. Doyle. I leave this place to you, Charlie. Charles Doyle took out five gold coins from his pocket and placed them in Charlie's hand. Taking the coins, Charlie, along with his team, quickly cleaned up the scene. Meanwhile, a text message from Ginny arrived. Charles looked at the address, it was a rundown factory located in the outskirts of Brooklyn. He glanced at his damaged car taking a deep breath. It was a true vintage car, and he felt heartache over its condition. They ambushed me and managed to wreck my car. Damn. Exhaling a breath of frustration, Charles ultimately left the underground parking lot. Exiting the parking lot, he noticed that the security guards at the entrance was nowhere to be seen. Likely, upon hearing the gunfire, they had decided to make a run for it. He stopped a taxi on the street and provided the address to the driver, then closed his eyes to rest during the journey. Without heration or heavenly transfer technique, although Charles Doyle believed his speed was not slower than that of the city cars, running to the destination might just prompt Phil Coulson from S.H.I.E.L.D. to pay him a visit the next day. On the other side, John Wick had already arrived outside his friend's home. He exited the car, pulled out his handgun, and cautiously entered the building. By this time, Vigo and his men had already left. The room only contained Marcus, who had been shot multiple times and lay in a pool of blood. John Wick's expression turned heavy as he sat down beside his friend's body, silent. After a moment, his phone rang. John Wick answered the call, and Winston's voice came through. John, I know you're looking for information about Vigo from me. But the Continental Hotel has its rules, so I won't tell you. There's a helicopter waiting for someone at a certain helipad, fully fueled. Hearing Winston's words, John Wick immediately understood it was a clue. He hung up the phone directly. Looking at Marcus lying nearby, John Wick was determined to avenge his friend. He stood up, left Marcus's house, got into his car, and headed for the specified helipad. By now, New York City had entered the night, the sky completely dark, and the city sparkled even more brightly due to the neon lights. On the other hand, as soon as Charles Doyle got out of the taxi, he saw the taxi speeding away faster than when it had arrived. It seemed that the taxi driver was aware that this wasn't a safe area. At this point, the arrival of the taxi had alerted the guards near the factory. During these few days, the Russian gang led by Vigo had become extremely cautious. While they heard that the old man had reconciled with the night devil, they were worried about other gangs attacking or seizing their territory in business. After all, Vigo was just a gang leader, not an army. With their numbers, losing too many of their own would naturally weaken their strength. Especially since John Wick had killed a significant number of their brothers, nearly 70 of them. As a result, the guard strength around the factory had clearly weakened. Only two guards remained outside. A beam of light shone towards Charles Doyle. 
Who are you? In front of Charles Doyle appeared a burly man, clearly carrying concealed firearms on his body. He held a flashlight and aimed its beam at Charles Doyle's face, as if wanting to see who he was. Charles Doyle didn't reply. With a swift movement, he appeared in front of the man, clamped his hand over the man's mouth, preventing him from making a sound, and his other hand's shuriken lightly swept across the man's neck, quickly dispatching him. At this point, Charles Doyle murmured, These scumbags from society need to be cleansed. It seems I need to play the role of a cleaner. The next moment, Charles formed hand seals with both hands and cast the transformation jutsu, taking the appearance of the guard. He reached out and removed the walkie-talkie and earpiece from the guard's body, putting them on himself. As for the guard's body, Charles Doyle discreetly hid it in a dark corner. Because of the darkness of the night, the other guard didn't notice anything unusual. In this manner, Charles Doyle returned nonchalantly. Seeing his companion returning, the other guard spoke up, Bob, everything all right? With a smile on his face, Charles Doyle replied, no problem. Just someone who got off at the wrong stop. I sent him away. At this moment, the guard was about to speak, but suddenly, Charles made a move. His shuriken pierced through the guard's neck, while his hand covered the guard's mouth as he said, don't talk. Take a deep breath. Yes, deep breath. After pausing for about three heartbeats and confirming the guard's death, Charles Doyle propped the guard's body against the wall and lightly opened the factory's door before walking in. In this way, Charles Doyle openly infiltrated the Russian gang's lair. Inside the factory, a burly Russian man was holding a bottle of vodka, pouring it into his mouth. His speech was slurred as he mumbled, Aiden, an assassin killed so many of us, and the boss actually made amends. Damn it, we're the Russian gang. Throw money at him, what's there to be afraid of? Offer him four million, if it doesn't work, raise it to eight million. If necessary, make it ten million. He's just a small night devil, can he really change the game? At this point, the person transformed as Aiden spoke up, Wes, you're drunk. Stepping forward, he took the vodka bottle from Wes's hand. Boss must have his reasons for doing this. Let's keep a low profile for a while and not give other gangs the chance to strike at us. Hearing Aiden's words, Wes grew more frustrated. He snatched back the vodka, took a gulp, and suddenly noticed Charles Doyle entering. He grumbled, Bob, instead of properly guarding outside, you came in here to slack off. Didn't Aiden tell you to be vigilant during this time? Charles Doyle didn't pay attention to Wes's yelling but quickly assessed the entire factory. The factory wasn't small, with three levels, two above ground and one below. There were several cars parked on the first floor along with some tables and sofas. There were twelve individuals on the first floor, armed with guns, scattered around the place. Four of them were guarding the entrance to the basement level. Seeing four guards at the entrance to the basement level, Charles secretly guessed whether the first floor was where the vault was located. At this point, when Bob ignored him and didn't leave, but instead was looking around, Wes became instantly furious. He walked up to Charles and shouted, Bob, are you deaf? Did you not hear me tell you to get out and guard? As Wes tried to push Bob away, Charles, who had already gathered information about the factory, struck back. A shuriken was swiftly sent towards the Russian brute trying to push him, instantly piercing through his heart. Wes looked incredulously at the shuriken in his heart, pointing at Charles Doyle and stammering, You. You. Struggling to form a coherent sentence, Wes ultimately collapsed on the ground, dead. Aiden, who had been keeping an eye on Wes, was stunned. He immediately shouted, Bob has betrayed us, kill him. He drew his gun and was about to shoot. The other members also reacted upon Aiden's shout. At this moment, Charles Doyle, who had already gathered all the necessary information, slid eight shuriken from his hand. Like flowers scattering from a beauty's hand, the shuriken were flung in all directions. The shuriken instantly struck the ground under a few of the gangsters' feet. Initially, they sneered as they thought the shuriken hadn't hit them but instead the ground. However, the paper attached to the shuriken burst into flames. Boom. 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 The sounds of consecutive explosions rang out, instantly killing all the guards except those at the entrance to the basement level. Hearing the explosion downstairs, the gangsters on the second floor immediately realized what was happening. 
They shouted, we're under attack. They picked up their firearms and rushed downstairs to reinforce. Of the four guards at the entrance to the basement level, three were instantly killed by the exploding tags, and the remaining one was seriously injured. After alerting the members on the second floor through the intercom and telling them to be on high alert, he fainted. The smoke from the explosion still hung in the air, as the first two gang members who rushed down were cautious, holding their guns and searching for the enemy. Seeing a figure emerge from the smoke, one of the gang members shouted, There. Instantly, they both pulled the triggers, and bullets flew, forming a rain of gunfire directed at the figure emerging from the smoke. Bullets passed through the figure in the smoke, but there was no scream or sensation of hitting flesh. It turned out that Charles Doyle had used Shadow Clone Jutsu to create an illusion, diverting their attention. In the next moment, several kunai were hurled toward the direction from which the gunshots came. Ah! Two screams sounded, and the two gang members who had just fired their guns fell dead on the spot. Hearing the cessation of gunfire and the screams, several gang members who had just grabbed their weapons and were rushing downstairs to provide backup had their expressions change. The initial haste with which they were charging downstairs transformed into caution as they slowed their steps, preparing to blindly shoot at the corner. At this moment, Charles Doyle sprinted forward and arrived at the stairwell on the second floor entrance. He crouched down, then with a burst of speed, cracked the cement floor beneath him. Like a bolt of lightning, he shot straight towards the second floor. The gang members who were preparing to provide support along the way suddenly found shuriken cutting across their throats, ending their lives. Racing through the hail of bullets, Charles Doyle continued his rampage, claiming one life after another like the Grim Reaper. The gang members on the second floor were now in disarray. They were no longer forming an effective counterattack. Three of them even took the opportunity to smash the windows, yelling loudly as they jumped down. Apart from the three who jumped out of the window, all the gang members on the second floor had been killed by Charles Doyle's shuriken. And he emerged from the chaos unscathed. Arriving at the shattered window, Charles Doyle watched as three limping gang members tried to escape. He conjured three kunai in his hand and threw them towards the fleeing gang members. Swoosh! 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 The three kunai instantly lodged in the necks of the escaping gang members. In the next second, the three who hadn't even reached the road fell to the ground. Blood spurted from their necks, staining the ground beneath them with crimson color. Seeing all three of them dead, Charles Doyle nodded in satisfaction. Good, not a single one got away. Shaking off the bloodstains on his shuriken, Charles Doyle descended from the second floor. He arrived at the entrance to the basement level that had previously been guarded by four members. As he entered, he noticed that one person wasn't entirely dead. He approached and gave the man a finishing blow, sending him to embrace death. Only then did he start to examine this entrance closely. He found that the entrance to the basement level was blocked by a massive vault door. It wasn't a regular wooden door or a residential security door. It was a sturdy steel door, at least 10 centimeters thick. He had wondered why reinforcements hadn't come from the basement level when they had come from the second floor. It turned out this door was meant to isolate the inside from the outside. Even the people outside needed permission to open it. Meanwhile, the six guards on the basement level were on edge. One of the gang members, holding an assault rifle, spoke up, Tana, there's no more movement outside. Could it be that the enemy has been dealt with? Tana, the man addressed, didn't answer him directly. Instead, he pressed a button on his belt and spoke into his earpiece, Sam, what's the situation outside? Has the crisis been resolved? Outside the vault door, Charles Doyle's ears twitched as he heard the voice coming through the earpiece of a body on the ground. He walked over, picked up the walkie-talkie and earpiece, and addressed the people inside, Sam is already dead. It's your turn soon. In the next moment, he crushed the walkie-talkie in his hand, and the remnants slipped from his fingers. Behind the vault door, at this point, everyone exchanged glances. The words transmitted through the walkie-talkie weren't just heard by Charles, all the guards heard them too. He can't get in. This vault door was customized by Vigo himself, based on bank vault doors. Without high explosives, it can't be opened at all. Hearing Tana's analysis, the other five people's nerves slightly relaxed. Tana spoke again, Maud, you quickly call Vigo and tell him to send reinforcements. 
let him know his base is under attack. The man called Maud immediately snapped back to attention and rushed to the side. He picked up the phone on the table and started dialing. On the other side, at this moment, Vigo was on his way to the airport when his phone started ringing. Seeing the caller ID, he realized it was a call from someone at the gang's headquarters. He immediately answered the call. Vigo, someone has breached our headquarters. Right now, only Tana and I are guarding the basement level. All the other brothers inside the factory have been killed. We need reinforcements. Hearing the words coming through the phone, Vigo's face stiffened, and he gritted his teeth, saying, Damn night demon. I'll immediately send more people to the headquarters for support. You six hold your ground. John probably didn't bring any weapons to break open the vault door. At this moment, the sky outside was filled with lightning and thunder, a storm was imminent. Clearly, Vigo didn't know who was behind the attack on their headquarters. But thinking back to the call he had made to John Wick earlier, although that call had allowed him to vent his frustration, it had also severely provoked the other party. While the person on the other end of the call hadn't revealed who had attacked them, Vigo believed that it was most likely John Wick's doing. Meanwhile, the convoy made a turn, and the airport was not far away. With the phone in his hand, Vigo was about to send support. But before he could dial the phone, he saw through the rearview mirror that a tail was following the convoy. It was John Wick, driving a black Dodge, catching up. Seeing this scene, Vigo's face grew even darker, cursing, you bastard. At this point, John Wick was driving the black Dodge given by the Continental Hotel. He raced like the wind, pressing the accelerator as if his life depended on it. Finally, he caught up with Vigo and the others just as they were about to reach the helicopter. Performing a slick drift and power slide, John Wick's dodge raised a cloud of dust, and then with an acceleration, he finally caught sight of Vigo Tarasov's convoy. John Wick let out a long exhale, he had finally caught up. Meanwhile, Vigo Tarasov quickly dialed the number of his brother, Abram Tarasov. Sitting in the passenger seat, the gang's advisor, Avi, glanced at the car behind them and then urged the driver, damn it, drive faster. The helicopter is just ahead, speed up, hurry. By this time, the call to Abram Tarasov had gone through. Vigo instructed, Abram, gather your men and head to our gang's outpost in Brooklyn immediately. There's an attack going on there, take more reinforcements. Boss, is it the night demon? Obviously, Abram was also aware of the situation. Due to their nephew's actions, his brother had clashed with John Wick. Vigo Tarasov glanced back at the driver in the pursuing Dodge and answered, It's not him, the night demon is on my side. Hearing his big brother Vigo say this, Abram breathed a sigh of relief internally and replied, You can rest assured, I'll make sure to reduce whoever came here causing trouble into pieces. After setting things straight, Vigo hung up the phone, then glanced at John Wick, who was closely following in the car behind, and finally closed his eyes in the car, taking a deep breath. In the outskirts of a factory in Brooklyn, staring at the thick vault door in front of him, Charles Doyle lightly knocked on it and found that the door was a solid ten inches thick. He then took out explosive tags from his inventory space. Concerned that a single tag might not have enough power, he took out a total of ten. It wasn't that he was reluctant to use more, but he was considering the explosive resistance of this old factory. The last thing he wanted was to blow up the entire building along with the vault door. Primarily, he hadn't been able to recruit Naruto Uzumaki, who had mastered the Raisingan. Otherwise, a Raisingan would have blown open any door. What a hassle this was. As for his Chidori, he didn't want to end up like Sasuke, whose hand got stuck in the door and then got sprayed with bullets. Remember, behind the door wasn't dead bodies, and if his hand got stuck, he'd be a target for gunfire. Not dwelling on these matters anymore, Charles Doyle started to use sealing formation to attach the explosive tags to various corners of the vault door according to a specific sequence. Inside the vault door, a few individuals heard no noise and were guessing whether the other party had given up because they couldn't get past the door. The sealing formation was a skill Charles Doyle had obtained from Irika Yumino. It allowed him to connect multiple explosive tags using a barrier formation, creating a trap. The power of the skill was determined by the number of explosive tags used. 
After attaching all the explosive tags and setting up the ceiling formation, Charles Doyle walked out of the entrance stairwell and positioned himself against the wall to avoid being hit by debris from the explosion. Charles Doyle formed the tiger hand seal with both hands, and shouted, Explode! The ceiling formation instantly activated, and the explosive tags burned and detonated in an instant. Boom! The power of ten explosive tags was exceptionally immense. The entire building trembled, and dust rained down. If the factory building wasn't relatively sturdy, and if the explosion hadn't hit a load-bearing wall, the building might have collapsed instantly. Inside the basement level, there were cries of agony. As the explosive tags detonated, they blasted the vault door inward. Three of the six guards behind the door were standing too close and were crushed by the impact of the door flying in. The other guards were hit by flying debris and stones, leaving them injured. Charles Doyle saw that the path to the basement level was now open, so he didn't hesitate any longer. He entered, holding his kanai. Tana was injured but not severely. As soon as he saw someone approaching, he was about to open fire. However, he hadn't had the chance to pull the trigger. Charles Doyle appeared beside him and swiftly stabbed his back with the kanai, piercing his throat. Tana was killed instantly. Then, with a flicker of movement, Charles Doyle was before another injured guard. He aimed his kanai at the guard's heart and thrust it forward. Poochie. The sound of the blade piercing flesh. In the next second, Charles Doyle withdrew the kanai and moved towards the third guard. From the explosion to now, only two seconds had passed. What had been a six-person guard squad was now reduced to just Modi. He had avoided the vault door earlier by going to make a phone call, and he had also escaped the flying debris. However, what was happening in front of him was too shocking for him to process. Devil! As Modi yelled, he squeezed the trigger of his assault rifle, sending bullets pouring in the direction of Charles Doyle. At this point, Charles Doyle swung his kanai with both hands, creating countless afterimages. Each incoming bullet was deflected by the kanai. Soon, the ammunition in Modi's assault rifle was depleted, and it clicked, jammed. Just as he was about to reach for the handgun at his waist, a kanai came flying towards him. Swoosh! The kanai went straight through Modi's throat, and then his body jerked before falling backward. From this point on, all the Russian gang members in the factory had been mercilessly slaughtered by Charles Doyle. At this moment, Abram Tarasov, who was stationed at the auto repair shop, had just gathered all his men. He looked at the nearly hundred subordinates below, all equipped with firearms, and nodded in satisfaction. He then waved his hand and ordered, Let's go. Instantly, everyone turned around and got into the cars. The engines roared to life as the convoy of about twenty vehicles left the repair shop, forming a formidable procession. They headed towards the outskirts of Brooklyn. Abram Tarasov was accompanied by three burly men in suits. These three individuals were his bodyguards, and they escorted him into a Cadillac SUV. The vehicle started up and followed the convoy. He wanted to see who had the audacity to attack the Russian gang at this time. After clearing out all the guards, Charles Doyle finally stopped to examine the basement. The basement wasn't large, but it was divided by a heavy iron door into two sections. One area was where Charles had just battled, and the other side was densely packed with boxes. Glancing at the iron door, Charles placed his right hand on the keypad lock. In the next moment, lightning flashed across his hand. Instantly, the keypad lock malfunctioned, and the iron door swung open. Stepping into the room, he looked at the boxes before him. Charles randomly selected one to open, and as he did, he felt like the entire room was bathed in a golden glow. Indeed, it was a box of gold. Gold bars were neatly stacked within the box. Charles reached in and took one out, examining it closely. He applied pressure with his fingers, leaving an imprint on the gold bar. After feeling its hardness and observing its color, he confirmed that these were indeed real gold bars, not fake. He then tossed the gold bar back into the box and opened another box nearby. This box contained nothing but jewelry and gemstones, with a particularly eye-catching blue sapphire on top. Charles picked it up and weighed it in his hand, it was more than a hundred carats. After inspecting two boxes in a row, Charles Doyle became curious about the remaining boxes. He counted them and found that there were still twenty unopened boxes. Could they all be filled with gold and jewelry? 
this Russian gang must be incredibly wealthy. Charles opened another box, only to find it filled with shining American knives and bundles of $10 bills neatly tied together. Observing the $10 bills, Charles felt somewhat disappointed. Although the box was large, how much could a bunch of $10 bills amount to? Nonetheless, it was true that the main currency denomination for everyday transactions in the United States was the $10 bill. If someone used a bunch of $100 bills for spending, they would likely draw suspicion and trigger an investigation. Not dwelling on this matter, Charles opened all the boxes and found that they were all filled with US dollars. There were no other items, let alone jewels, luxury watches, or even physical gold. All 20 boxes contained US currency. As for the total amount, he wasn't sure yet. Staring at the 22 boxes before him, while someone else might worry about how to discreetly take away so many boxes, it wasn't a concern for Charles Doyle. After all, his copper coins had the power of bidirectional exchange. Placing his hands on the pile of money, Charles Doyle silently whispered in his mind, recharge. Instantly, all the cash inside the boxes vanished, and on the ninja panel in his mind, the digits under the copper coins category jumped rapidly for about three breaths before coming to a halt. Now, the number in the copper coins column read 4. Million, where 200,000 copper coins were earned from a previous mission. Therefore, his current earnings amounted to 4 million US dollars. 20 boxes, each containing $200,000 in cash, totaling 4 million dollars. Charles Doyle was quite satisfied with the gains from this operation. Not only did he clean up the scum of society, but he also acquired a substantial sum of money. These earnings far surpassed the rewards offered for John Wick, and the best part was that this money didn't have to be shared with the Continental Hotel. Aside from using it for repairing cars, he could also consider upgrading his ninja dog. After all, upgrading summoning beasts consumes a lot of copper coins. As for the other two boxes containing gold and jewelry, he stored them in the storage space provided by his system. With everything done, Charles dispelled his transformation jutsu and walked out of the factory. A red Ferrari 458 was parked on the street. His eyebrows raised slightly as he approached the car, opened the passenger side door, and got in. My reliable secretary, you've arrived just in time. I was just thinking about how to get a ride from this place. Charles Doyle looked at the blonde woman before him and spoke with a smile, closing the car door behind him. As a reward for you, I have a little gift to give. In the next moment, the blue sapphire that he had just stored in his storage space appeared in his hand once more. Seeing the blue sapphire that was larger than a pigeon egg in Charles's hand, Ginny's eyes gleamed like a greedy dragon spotting treasure. The gem sparkled with a dazzling light. Boss, you're so generous. Ginny embraced Charles Doyle, then planted a big kiss on his lips before taking the blue sapphire from his hand. Boss, does this blue sapphire have a name? Charles wiped off the lipstick marks from his face and looked at the beaming blonde woman. He replied, you can give it a name you like. After all, you're its owner now. Ginny was a bit disappointed that her boss didn't even know the original name of the gem. Observing the scene of her placing the gem in a secret place, Charles Doyle swallowed a mouthful of saliva. Hearing the sound of him swallowing, Ginny chuckled. Then she said, Boss, your Mercedes-Benz has been arranged for repairs. When it's fixed, they'll contact you. Now, are you returning to Charles's agency or going back to Chrysler Building? Charles Doyle nodded, quite satisfied with Ginny's efficiency. He then slowly said, take me back to the Chrysler building. Hearing the mention of the Chrysler building, Ginny didn't say more. She started the car, pressed the gas pedal, and the Ferrari instantly sped off into the distance. The moment the car left, the weather outside changed. Raindrops began to fall from the sky, transitioning from a light drizzle to a heavy downpour in an instant. Gazing at the pouring rain outside the car window, Charles Doyle's thoughts drifted far away, thinking Vigo would finally meet his end at the hands of John. T slash N, from this week, I will be posting extra chapters based on the numbers of power stones. So be sure to give your power stones if you like this fanfiction. For more details, check on the auxiliary chapter that will be posted in a while, after Charles Doyle and his group had been gone for half an hour, Abram Tarasov arrived with a group of his men at the outskirts of the Brooklyn factory. Accompanied by one of his bodyguards who held a black umbrella, Abram entered the factory. However, 
both inside and outside the factory, there was an eerie silence. Abram's strategist approached him and spoke, they're all dead, none of our guys made it. Abram's expression twitched, and he said, looks like we arrived a bit too late. Do you know who did this? Any clues left behind? Abram asked two questions in a row. His strategist paused and then responded, Abram, you should come and see for yourself. The bodies of all the deceased had been brought together and arranged neatly on an open space. Abram walked over, surveying the scene, more than forty bodies in total, some mangled beyond recognition, with limbs piled together, creating an eerie and horrifying atmosphere. He tightened his coat, trying to ward off the coldness he was feeling. As he looked at the bodies, he noticed that apart from the three individuals killed by the vault door, the rest had either been blown up or had their throats slit, there were hardly any gunshot wounds. The strategist approached Abram with a piece of cloth in his hands, on which were laid several shurikens and kanai. Abram, we found these on some of the bodies. These should be left by the culprit. Gazing at the shurikens and kanai, Abram's massive frame trembled slightly. He muttered to himself, Ninja. Confused by Abram's words, the strategist asked, What? Seeing his strategist's puzzled expression, Abram continued, The one who carried out this attack is Charles Doyle. It's the second legendary assassin to gain a reputation after the Night Devil, John Wick, from the Continental Assassin Hotel. He's known as a ninja, primarily using shurikens and kunai as his weapons. Relying on these child's play weapons, Charles Doyle wiped out an entire heavily armed African American gang. Upon hearing Abram's explanation, the strategist was clearly taken aback, his mouth gaping in disbelief. It was indeed hard to fathom. Glancing at the forty or so bodies on the ground, the strategist nodded in a daze. Someone had truly accomplished this. After all, the evidence was right in front of them, disbelief was no longer an option. Abram Tarasov spoke at this moment, what's the result from the basement vault? How much did we lose? The strategist hesitated for a moment before speaking, everything is gone, there's nothing left except empty boxes. Damn it, bastards. Abram Tarasov cursed, damn Rusov, damn Vigo. Look at what kind of people you two have provoked. After cursing for a while, he instructed, leave some people to clean up the scene, the rest of us will go back. After finishing his orders, Abram Tarasov returned to his car under the escort of three bodyguards. Meanwhile, the cursed big brother Vigo was currently engaged in a fierce battle with John Wick in the pouring rain. Despite being the leader of a gang, Vigo Tarasov's combat skills were clearly inferior to the professional assassin John Wick. He was at a clear disadvantage in this hand-to-hand -hand fight. Vigo Tarasov suddenly pulled out a short knife from behind and lunged at the unarmed John Wick. The two of them exchanged blows for a few rounds, with neither managing to land a hit. In a moment of opportunity, Vigo quickly gripped the short knife and attempted to stab John Wick in the abdomen. John Wick reacted just in time, catching Vigo's stabbing hand with both of his own. Vigo's hand holding the knife was captured by John Wick, and they were locked in a tense struggle. Vigo quickly used his other hand to attack John's neck and even grabbed his head. Despite the brutal blows, John Wick didn't let go of Vigo's grip but instead used Vigo's own hold to guide the knife into his own abdomen. He then grasped Vigo Tarasov's arm and forcefully snapped it in half. Ah, the pain from the broken bones caused Vigo Tarasov to scream out, and he staggered back. Seeing Vigo approaching again, John swiftly counterattacked, landing a punch that pushed Vigo back. John Wick, who had retreated, glanced at the knife in his abdomen and used both hands to grip the hilt before pulling it out. As Vigo advanced once again, trying to capitalize on his momentum, John Wick blocked a punch with his arm and simultaneously inserted the knife into Vigo's right shoulder and neck. Vigo Tarasov was instantly struck at a critical point. In a final counterattack, he landed a punch on the down John Wick, then instantly lost his strength, collapsing on the ground, clutching the wound on his neck, and gazing silently at John Wick. At this moment, John Wick also sat down on the ground, both hands pressing on his abdominal wound. With the knowledge that his time was limited, Vigo Tarasov spoke in the pouring rain, John, I'll be waiting for you in hell. John Wick, also clutching his wounded abdomen, replied, All right, see you on the other side. With a great effort, John got up and staggered away into the distance amidst the pouring rain. Vigo Tarasov closed his eyes. 
On the other side, Ginny had driven Charles Doyle to the front of the Chrysler building. As she parked the car and saw that Charles was about to get out and leave, Ginny spoke up, Charles, why don't you invite me up for a drink? As she spoke, Ginny playfully flicked her golden hair hanging beside her ear, making her look especially alluring. Charles Doyle glanced at Ginny's inquiring expression and replied as he opened the car door, Ginny, it's getting late, and we have work tomorrow. You should head back quickly. With those words, Charles Doyle had already gotten out of the car. He then turned and said to Ginny, Good night, Ginny. Take care on the way back and sweet dreams. After saying that, Charles Doyle entered the Chrysler building. Still in the sports car, Ginny raised her middle finger toward Charles's retreating figure and muttered, Bastard. She then stepped hard on the accelerator, causing the fiery red Ferrari to spin in place, make a quick U-turn, and speed away. Although Charles Doyle hadn't witnessed what was happening behind him, he could still guess what was going on based on Ginny's frustrated reaction. Regarding the American blonde beauty, Charles Doyle was actually quite satisfied. However, as his assistant, he didn't want to turn her into his lover. Although in American love stories, having a passionate encounter and then going back to normal the next day is considered okay, Charles Doyle has a strong possessive nature. If something does happen between them, he would want to be the only partner in her life. Turning a subordinate into a romantic interest would complicate their working relationship, and he was dissatisfied with that outcome. To avoid getting tangled up in such matters, Charles Doyle chose to decline Ginny's advances. Moreover, American blonde bombshells weren't really his type. Back at home, Charles Doyle retrieved a bottle of Jack Daniels from the liquor cabinet and poured himself a glass, adding a touch of cola. After taking a sip, he nodded in approval. Thinking about today's games, he decided to spend some time in the system interface. Setting down the glass, he entered the system interface and accessed his information, Charles Doyle age, 21 occupation, ninja VIP level, zero attributes, fire, lightning equipment, chunin shuriken, chunin headband, chunin vest, chunin manual, chunin necklace, chunin ring, equipment increases damage and protection, artifact, none scrolls. Ninja art, endurance LV2, reduces damage by 90% upon use for 4 seconds, note, cannot reduce fatal damage, ninjutsu art, fury LV1, increases attack power by 6% for 10 seconds, one own ninjas, Sasuke Uchiha, without Sharingan, Irika Yumino, Rock Lee own skills, fire style, great fireball jutsu, lion barrage, chidori, shuriken jutsu. Ceiling formation, roar of love, infinite dance, leaf whirlwind. As for his own chakra capacity, it wasn't particularly large. The system has been activated for only three years, and over that time, through meditation, he has managed to refine only a modest amount of chakra. In contrast, in the Naruto world, children started refining chakra at the age of four or five, trained for six years at the Ninja Academy, and only become a genin after those six years. The amount of chakra they had was barely enough to perform a few jutsu. Nevertheless, his training progress was fairly good, about the level of an ordinary ninja. It was important to note that the cell density in the Marvel world's humans was two to three times lower than that in the Naruto world. Ordinarily, this would mean that both chakra generation and training speed would be two to three times slower. However, Charles Doyle found that his progress was more akin to that of an average genins in the anime, not as slow as he had expected. This was likely due to the influence of the system he had acquired during his time of transmigration. Furthermore, as the host of the system, Charles realized that every time he successfully summoned a C-rank ninja, it would increase his chakra pool by that of a genin. After testing it out, he found that a genin's chakra capacity was enough for him to perform the chidori, a jutsu of that level, three times. Currently, Charles's total chakra capacity was enough to perform the A-rank jutsu chidori ten times. After reviewing his attributes, Charles accessed the summoning beast interface, where only one type of summoning beast was highlighted, the ninja dog. The interface displayed three ninja dogs, Parker, Yurushi, and Shiba. However, in actual usage, Kakashi's pack of eight ninja dogs could all be summoned. At this moment, Charles's ninja dogs were at level 20, and their strength was not weak. However, he needed to level them up to the maximum of 50 in order to unlock the next summoning beast. 
To increase a ninja dog's level from 20 to 21, it required 300 reputation points and 30,000 copper coins, with each subsequent level up consuming more resources. Glancing at his current copper coin balance of 4 million and reputation value of 20,000, he hoped that the reputation points would be sufficient. Charles began the journey of leveling up his ninja dog. After spending 20,000 reputation points and 2 million copper coins, he finally managed to level up his ninja dog to the maximum level of 50, unlocking the next summoning beast, Aoda. In the next moment, a summoning beast scroll appeared before Charles Doyle. Opening it, the scroll depicted the image of a blue snake, with an empty space for the name of the contracted summoner. Using a shuriken, Charles Doyle pricked his finger and wrote his name in the designated spot. Once he finished, the summoning beast scroll vanished. With this, he could now summon Aoda. However, considering the size of the snake and the space in his room, he decided to skip the summoning for now. As for the strength of this summoning beast, he glanced at his remaining 96 reputation points and shook his head. He would have to gradually level it up in the future. First, he decided to see what the fully leveled Parker was like. He summoned the summoning beast with a burst of smoke. As the smoke cleared, Parker's figure appeared in front of him. Charles, did you summon me for a mission? Parker asked. By the way, thank you for restoring our full strength. Feeling Parker's aura, Charles realized that he probably wouldn't even stand a chance against a dog using only his physical strength without using ninjutsu. No mission, Parker. I just wanted to confirm a few things with you. After your strength has been fully restored, can you continue to improve? Parker looked at Charles and his face took on a human-like expression of contemplation before he spoke, Charles, we ninja dogs are already adults, and our strength is mostly fixed. It's difficult for us to further improve through training. Then Parker looked at Charles with a hopeful expression and continued, Charles, can you help us increase our strength? Charles glanced at the summoning beast interface, where the ninja dog's training position was marked as, max level. He sighed, sorry, Parker, but I can't help with that. However, you can try to improve your strength through training in the summoning world. Parker sniffed and looked at Charles, asking, did you contract with Ryuchi Caves guys? Charles thought to himself, truly a tracking dog, he had only touched the scroll briefly and Parker had already detected its scent. Charles sighed inwardly, I haven't formed a contract with Ryuchi Cave. I've just made a contract with AODA. AODA. Parker looked puzzled, he didn't know who AODA was but he was familiar with Manda, that guy. There's going to be a new addition to the summoning world. Things are about to get lively. But Charles, if you get the chance, I hope you can summon Kakashi. After all, it's been quite some time since we've come here, and I miss him. Looking at Parker, Charles said, there will be a chance, though I don't know which time period Kakashi will be from. Thank you, Charles. If there's nothing else, I'll return to the summoning world. Charles Doyle waved his hand, until next time, Parker. With a burst of smoke, Parker disappeared the next second, returning to the summoning world. Foreseeing Parker had returned to the summoning world, Charles couldn't help but marvel at the greatness of the system. Upon first learning that beings like Parker existed in the summoning world rather than the system space, he had instructed Parker to use reverse summoning to bring him into the summoning world. That is a separate world, a world used by the system to house summoning beasts. His eight ninja dogs lived in that realm. As for the exact size of that world, Charles Doyle didn't know and hadn't explored it yet. He couldn't go beyond the Inazuka mountain, probably because he hadn't unlocked other summoning beasts. However, at the moment, besides him and his summoning beasts, no one else should be able to enter this summoning world. He just wondered if the masters of other dimensions or deities would discover it. Looking at his nearly depleted reputation points on the system interface, Charles Doyle shook his head. Besides the ninja summons, he still had to worry about this reputation value. After finishing the whiskey in his glass, Charles Doyle returned to bed to sleep. The next day, the first thing Charles Doyle did when he woke up was to log into the system interface to check in. Ding, check in successful. Received one ninja recruitment scroll. Would you like to upgrade to VIP 2 to receive double scrolls? Seeing that today's check-in reward was a ninja recruitment scroll, Charles Doyle felt quite pleased. As for the so-called upgrade option, he could only mercilessly tap the decks. It wasn't that he didn't want to, 
but he genuinely didn't know how to upgrade. Sometimes he wanted to ask the system, open your mouth and tell me what I need to successfully upgrade. I'll find a way to get it and make sure you succeed in upgrading. But what frustrated him was that this system didn't have customer service. Not to mention customer service, it didn't even have a system spirit. He had to figure things out on his own. Luckily, he was quite familiar with the Naruto, Shinobi collection game. Looking at the five ninja summoning scrolls he has saved up, Charles thought to himself that in another two months, when he has a total of ten scrolls, he could try summoning new ninjas. It wasn't that he didn't want to do a single summon, but to guarantee summoning a ninja, he had to perform a ten summon. Given his inability to upgrade and having already exhausted all his luck from the time he crossed over, he shouldn't even think about miracles happening with a single summon. After closing the system interface, getting ready, and putting on the bulletproof suit custom-made at the Continental Hotel, Charles Doyle took a taxi to his office located at 71, Forest Hills Avenue in the Queens District. Pushing open the door to the office, just as Irika Yumino was about to greet whoever had entered, he saw that it was Charles Doyle and immediately stood up, saying, Good morning, Lord Charles. Irika, have there been any tasks assigned to the office these past couple of days? Irika picked up the task list from the table and said, searching for a lost cat and investigating whether a husband is having an affair, those are the only two tasks we have. The rest have all been completed. Currently, the tasks have been assigned to Sasuke and Rock Lee, so they should be able to complete them smoothly. Hearing that there were only these two tasks, Charles Doyle felt a bit helpless. These tasks were obviously D-rank missions if you put them in the mission center. But, a mosquito was still meat. Afterward, he said, Irika, hand me the signed task scrolls. Lord Charles, here are the task scrolls. Irika took out two signed task scrolls from the cabinet and handed them to Charles. Charles took the scrolls and then opened the system interface, entering the mission center to submit the two scrolls. After being appraised by the mission center, both tasks were classified as D-rank missions, each with a reward of 200 reputation points and 5,000 copper coins. Seeing these mission rewards, Charles Doyle couldn't help feeling a bit depressed. We'll have to build a reputation for our firm. The rewards for these low-level tasks are just too low. Irika, do you have any good suggestions? Could we arrange for Rock Lee and Sasuke to take orders at the Continental Hotel? The bounties over there are pretty good. With their strength, I think they can handle some ordinary assassination tasks. Irika presented his suggestion, while Charles Doyle shook his head. Irika, for the tasks from the Continental Hotel, except for those I personally accept and complete, the tasks you receive can't be submitted to the mission center. Lord Charles, I can't think of any good suggestions at the moment. The proportion of higher level tasks in the firm is indeed quite low. Usually, we can only get one or two decent tasks per month. They mainly involve assassination tasks, which are pretty much monopolized by the Continental Hotel. Our reputation here is still too small. Only some employers who can't even afford the gold coins come to us to place orders. Irika had one more thing to say, both Lee and Sasuke were quite young, and they both had an Asian appearance. In the eyes of customers, they weren't taken very seriously. If it weren't for carrying Charles's name, they probably wouldn't get any tasks at all. After all, if someone wanted Charles to take action, they could directly place an order at the Continental Hotel. With the backing of the hotel, their credibility was assured. Hearing that the Continental Hotel was squeezing out their space to operate, Charles furrowed his brows slightly, thinking to himself, it seems that getting one of the twelve seats at the high table is becoming more urgent. Only by becoming part of the high table leadership could he incorporate tasks from the Continental Hotel into the firm. By then, the ninjas he recruited could also take on the Continental Hotel's tasks and upload them to the system's mission center. John Wick, Winston, I hope you don't make me wait too long. While Charles was lost in thought, Ginny walked in, with a smile on her face and a sweet tone as she spoke, Boss, did I hear you complain about not having any big contracts? Looking at Ginny as she spoke, Charles wasn't sure if it was an illusion or because of the big contract, but he felt that Ginny looked exceptionally charming today. Clearing his throat, Charles looked at Ginny and asked, Secretary Ginny, did you bring some good news? Ginny wasn't making a humorous joke this time, she spoke seriously, Boss, would you be interested in taking on a mission related to the Assassin Brotherhood? 
Hearing the name, Assassin Brotherhood, Charles's thoughts drifted away for a moment. In his previous life, he seemed to have seen a movie called, Wanted, which told the story of the Assassin Brotherhood. However, he wasn't sure if it was the same one. He responded with uncertainty, is it the Assassin Brotherhood with the bullet bending? Ginny nodded and answered, yes, it's that Assassin Brotherhood. Sure, I'll take it, as long as it's a big contract. Ginny took out her phone and dialed a number, saying, come in. In the next moment, a middle-aged man with curly hair pushed open the door and entered Charles's office. Cross had been waiting outside for a while. He had come to Ginny out of necessity. Since Ginny had left the Assassin Brotherhood about a year ago, they had a good relationship. If it weren't for Sloane targeting his son, he wouldn't have bothered Ginny. When his phone rang and he heard the words, come in, Cross felt relieved. It seemed that they were ready to discuss this matter. Entering Charles's office, Cross looked at the three people in the room, an Asian man with a scar on his face, a handsome young man, and Ginny. He wasn't sure who to talk to about the mission, so he looked at Ginny. Ginny introduced, Boss, this is Cross. He's the one who needs our help. Cross, this is my boss, Charles Doyle. He can help you with your situation. Hearing Ginny's introduction and looking at the middle-aged man before him, Charles's mental image of Cross from movies started to align with the image of the man in front of him. Charles then recalled that the Assassin Brotherhood seemed to have a certain treasure, as well as an enigmatic item. The treasure referred to the ointment used by the Assassin Brotherhood, injuries like bruises, cuts, and fractures would heal within a few hours. For Charles, who currently didn't have medical ninjas or medical ninjutsu, this secret formula was a valuable asset. The other enigmatic item was the loom of fate. After weaving fabric, this loom would leave behind special numbers. Decrypting these binary numbers would reveal names, and then the Assassin Brotherhood would send assassins to kill those individuals. The loom of fate determined the life and morality of certain people. The people whose names appeared were all wrongdoers, destined to be killed, even if they hadn't committed any crimes yet. Fox's childhood experience was a testament to the authenticity of the loom of fate. The Assassin Brotherhood existed for centuries because of this loom. This might sound quite absurd, in a modern society, a group of skilled assassins obeying the commands of a loom to carry out killings. But Charles considered that this wasn't a simple modern society, it was a marvel world where technology, magic, and divine powers coexisted. Perhaps this loom of fate was truly exceptional. Who knows, it could be a treasure related to fate. All these thoughts flashed through his mind in an instant. Charles warmly said, Irica, please take our guest to the meeting room. Seeing Charles so enthusiastic, Ginny also smiled and led Cross into the meeting room. Irica then came over and asked, what would you all like to drink? Coffee, whiskey, or iced water? Charles smiled and said, give me a glass of whiskey. Ginny smiled and said, I'll have a cup of coffee. Cross said, iced water. Please wait a moment, I'll be back soon, Irica said and quickly left to fulfill the requests. Charles then said, Mr. Cross, please tell us about your mission. Cross straightened his posture, took out a photo from his pocket, placed it on the table, and began, I need you to send someone to protect my son. He's been targeted by Sloane of the Assassin Brotherhood. I'm afraid I can't take him away, so I have to trouble you to provide protection. Charles picked up the photo and took a look. Yes, it was that unfortunate kid who had been watched by his father, betrayed by his girlfriend, and ultimately deceived by Sloan and others, leading to him killing his own father. Mr. Cross, I've heard that you recently left this organization. I presume you have some understanding of their strength. An organization that has existed for centuries won't easily give up on targeting someone. Cross hesitated for a moment and asked, what do you mean? Charles's face lit up with a smile, and he said, it's about adding money. Just as Cross was about to speak, a knock on the door interrupted him. Irica walked in with their beverages, placed them on the table, and then left. He needed to stay outside in case more guests arrived for reception. Charles picked up the whiskey on the table, took a sip, and gestured for Cross to continue the topic. Cross picked up the glass of iced water and drank it all in one gulp before speaking slowly, Million. I'll pay three million US dollars, and I hope you can ensure the safety of my son. Charles calmly spoke two words, the duration. Why? Seeing Cross still somewhat perplexed, 
Charles explained, Mr. Cross, although I haven't investigated in detail yet, if I'm not mistaken, you've had conflicts with the Assassin Brotherhood. It's no problem for us to protect your son, but for how long? Is it one week, two weeks, a month, or even longer? Or are we supposed to wait until your situation with the Assassin Brotherhood is completely resolved? Hearing Charles's words, Cross was also taken aback. Indeed, how long should they protect his son? While three million wasn't a small amount, protecting his son from the Assassin Brotherhood would require top-tier strength. Just like a sheep couldn't protect its young from a pack of wolves, how could Cross expect his son to be safe from the Brotherhood? However, trying to hire a top-tier assassin like Charles to protect someone, especially for an extended period, wasn't feasible with just three million dollars. After some contemplation, Cross said, million, for a month. If he couldn't resolve the situation with Sloan within a month, then his own demise wasn't far off. After all, Sloan wouldn't let him go. Regardless of the outcome, there would eventually be a conclusion to this matter. If he won, there wouldn't be much to say. If he lost, Sloan wouldn't even spare a thought for his ordinary son. Hearing Cross raise the price to $5 million for a month of protection, Charles offered a suggestion, Sir, I have a proposal, let's split this mission into two parts. For the first task, you pay $3 million, and our agency will provide comprehensive protection for your son, ensuring his safety. For the second task, you pay for my services to eliminate the Assassin Brotherhood. Upon hearing Charles's words, not only Cross but even Ginny widened her eyes. Ginny had left the Assassin Brotherhood because she no longer believed in Sloan or the Loom of Fate. Hearing the suggestion to eliminate the Assassin Brotherhood caught her off guard. Cross took a moment to compose himself, thought it over, and said, Sir, I don't have that much money. I can't afford the price to have you eliminate the Assassin Brotherhood. After all, the Assassin Brotherhood wasn't just a handful of people, it was an organization that had been passed down for thousands of years, with a substantial number of members. Observing Cross's hesitation due to financial constraints, Charles chuckled, aside from the five million, how much more can you afford? Cross paused and replied, I can come up with an additional one million, but that amount won't cover the fee for your assistance. He was well aware of Charles's price, starting at a million dollars for a standard assassination. If the opponent was formidable, the price could easily go up to four million or even higher. Considering the size of the Assassin Brotherhood, such a massive organization, it wasn't merely killing one person, it was about annihilating the entire organization's active force. And on top of that, it was about eradicating a group of assassins. No assassin would accept such a mission. Even putting the mission on the Continental Hotel wouldn't work unless the high table got involved. Seeing that Cross had one million left, Charles proposed, here's an idea, Mr. Cross. You provide three million for hiring us to protect your son, and an additional three million along with the recipe for the healing bath. This will be for hiring me to eliminate the Assassin Brotherhood. As for the protection time for your son Wesley, we'll use the eradication of the Assassin Brotherhood as the end point. But I must mention that after eradicating the Brotherhood, I'll claim the spoils as well. Upon hearing the term, healing bath, Cross glanced at Ginny, assuming she had informed Charles. After a moment of contemplation, he said, all of this is acceptable. My goal is to destroy them, and I don't care about their inheritance. But if you and I go to eradicate the Assassin Brotherhood, who will protect my son? After all, the Assassins the Brotherhood sends out are not ordinary people. Charles exuded confidence and seriousness as he said, Mr. Cross, this is an agency, and it's not just me. We also have two incredibly skilled ninjas here, and you've already met Irika. He'll be part of the team protecting your son. I will dispatch Irika as the leader, accompanied by Rock Lee and Uchiha Sasuke, to provide comprehensive protection for your son. Their strength is even greater than you might imagine. While Cross didn't know who Rock Lee and Uchiha Sasuke were, he had a deep impression of the scarred man from earlier. Although the man's face didn't reveal any murderous intent and even carried a sense of being a teacher, Cross sensed danger emanating from him. Yes, he was sensing danger, not only from the Asian man but also from Charles himself. Over the years, his safety wasn't solely because of bullet time or his gun kata techniques, it was also due to his inexplicable sense of danger. Despite knowing the other's formidable strength, Cross still looked at Ginny for assurance. He wanted a definitive answer from her. 
Seeing Cross's questioning gaze, Ginny spoke, Cross, you can completely trust their abilities. They'll protect your son without any problems. If you're still worried, I'll join Irika's team as well, and we'll protect Wesley together. Hearing Ginny's words, Cross felt reassured and said, all right, then let's split the task into two commissions. Seeing Cross agree, Charles said, Ginny, bring in two sets of task scrolls for us to sign. Ginny left the meeting room to notify Irika to prepare the task scrolls for signing. Mr. Charles, how do you think it's best to pay for the task rewards? Cross asked, seeking Charles's opinion on the matter. Charles looked at Cross and said, credit card, cash, we accept both. After all, my agency is a legitimate business, and we pay our taxes on time. Then let's go with a credit card. I'll pay the entire sum up front. As for the recipe for the bath, I'll give it to you after the operation. Charles shrugged, indicating it was fine. After all, no employer would pay the entire fee all at once. At that moment, Irika entered the room with two sets of task scrolls. After writing down the task details, rewards, and other relevant information, Cross signed the task scrolls, paid the fees, provided some information about his son, and then left Charles's agency. The protection mission for Wesley would begin tomorrow, and as for the eradication mission, they would need to wait for Cross to give the green light, as he needed to make some preparations first. As Cross left, Ginny's brow furrowed slightly, and she asked Charles, Charles, are you really going to join Cross in eradicating the Assassin Brotherhood? Even though I introduced Cross here, the eradication of the Brotherhood. It's not without risks, and lives could be lost. They're not like the Assassins from the Continental Hotel. Their shots are lethal, and their bullets can't be stopped by your bulletproof vest. Charles chuckled and said, Ginny, you have to trust your boss. I wouldn't have proposed this task if I didn't have confidence in completing it. Don't worry. Seeing Ginny still worried, Charles didn't linger on the topic and said, starting tomorrow, you and Irika will form a four-person team to protect Wesley. You should also stay safe. I have an additional task for you. Keep an eye on news about John Wick. If you hear anything about his house getting blown up, make sure to inform me immediately. John Wick? I heard he killed Vigo last night. Despite that, someone still dared to blow up his house. Charles smiled and said, there will always be some daredevils, just like Vigo's son. Ginny sighed and said, all right, boss, but remember to give me a bonus. No problem. After seeing Ginny off, Charles picked up the two sets of task scrolls from the table, entered the system interface, opened the task assembly, and submitted the protection mission for Wesley. Soon, the task assembly evaluated it as a B-rank mission, offering 2,000 reputation points, 200,000 copper coins, and a common treasure chest upon completion. Satisfied with the prospect of getting a treasure chest, Charles submitted the mission. The other mission could only be submitted after Rock Lee and Sasuke completes their task today. However, Charles had a hunch that the eradication mission would be classified as an A-rank mission. Leaving the meeting room, Charles saw that Ginny and Irika were discussing the protection of Wesley and the potential strength of enemies the Assassin Brotherhood might send, while formulating a preliminary battle plan. Charles saw that they were busy and didn't want to disturb them. He headed to the front desk, opened the drawer where the car keys were stored, and looked at the several car keys inside. Charles said, Irika, I'll take the Porsche from the garage for now. Master, those cars were bought by you, so feel free to drive any of them. Charles waved his hand, then left the agency and went to the backyard garage. He looked at the bulky Porsche SUV in front of him, shook his head, feeling that it wasn't as stylish as his own Mercedes. He wondered how long it would take to repair his car. Without dwelling on it too much, he opened the car door, started the engine, and prepared to head back to Chrysler Building. Since there wasn't much going on for the moment, he planned to return and refine his chakra. After all, nothing could compare to the joy of improving one's strength. In the evening, after Rock Lee and Uchiha Sasuke completed their mission, they unexpectedly returned to Charles's agency together. Upon entering, they found Irika and Ginny waiting for them, looking puzzled. They asked, is there a new mission? Irika spoke up, yes, a new mission, a B-rank mission. Rock Lee clenched his fists and looked up at the ceiling, exclaiming, Youth! Leave this high-level mission to me, Rock Lee. Finishing his words, he struck a classic pose and extended his arm, 
giving a thumbs up to Irika and Ginny. Over the past year, Ginny thought she had become accustomed to Rock Lee's antics, which she considered a form of performance art. But seeing Rock Lee's behavior like this again made her feel awkward. Idiot. Sasuke, who was on the side, spoke in a calm tone, Irika sensei said it's a B-rank mission, so it's definitely a team mission. A genin like you can't handle it alone. Upon hearing that it was a team mission, Rock Lee didn't show any signs of disappointment. On the contrary, his fighting spirit was even higher. Lee, Sasuke, come here. Let me first explain the mission details. This time, it's a protection mission involving a client who might be targeted by assassins, Irika said, motioning for them to gather around. The four of them began discussing the mission, quickly devising a solid plan. The next day, after a night of training, Charles had finished refining his chakra. He opened the system interface and selected the daily check-in. Ding! Check-in successful, earned 200 reputation points. He then clicked on the task assembly section and saw that both Uchiha Sasuke's and Rock Lee's tasks were marked as completed. He clicked to collect the rewards. He received 400 reputation points and 10,000 copper coins as rewards. Afterward, he selected to submit the task scroll he had brought back the previous day. Quickly, after the task was assessed, the mission to eliminate the Assassin Brotherhood was rated as an A-rank mission. The rewards were even more substantial, 5,000 reputation points, 500,000 copper coins, and an exquisite treasure chest. The exquisite treasure chest contained random rewards such as reputation points, gold coins, summon scrolls, and A, B-level ninja fragments. Compared to a regular treasure chest, the rewards inside an exquisite treasure chest were better. As for the mysterious treasure chest rewards from S-rank missions, Charles hadn't yet come across them. Glancing at his account, he had 496 reputation points, 2 million copper coins, 0 gold coins, and 5 ninja recruitment scrolls. The glaring 0 was still as prominent as ever, just like his VIP 0 status. Charles closed the system interface, stood up, and began preparing some equipment, such as attaching an explosive tag to a shuriken. After all, the textile factory was a sizable place with numerous employees. Carrying shuriken with explosive tags could serve as effective makeshift bombs. The explosive tags provided by the system were all high-quality ones, with an explosion radius of 3 meters. With his Uchiha shuriken throwing technique, they became accurately guided bombs. As Charles began preparing his combat tools, on the other side, Irika's team had already set off. At this moment, outside Wesley's house, in a concealed location under a bridge, Sasuke spoke softly through his earpiece, the target has appeared and is currently at the workplace ahead. Follow the target, Sasuke, and don't let him notice you. Lee, keep a constant watch on the surroundings of the target to prevent any unexpected incidents. Got it, X2, wow he nearly got hit by a car. This guy is really clumsy. In a room, Irika was currently overseeing the team's actions. He turned to Ginny and asked, when should we approach him and tell him that we're here to protect him on behalf of his father? Let's wait until he gets off work, and then the two of us can approach him. Irika complained, this guy is so clueless and careless. I'm worried that he might not die from an assassination but from some accident like a car crash. It might be better if we provide close protection or even take him back to the agency directly. Ginny smiled, Captain Irika, let's stick to the plan. The group soon followed the target, Wesley, to the building where he worked. They were currently observing his every move from a building outside the main office. Time passed quickly, and evening arrived. After finishing work, Wesley left the company building and went to an ATM machine to withdraw some money. Unfortunately, his bank card had less than $20 in it. Just as Wesley was about to complain, two figures suddenly appeared on his left and right. Startled, Wesley immediately raised his hands and even avoided looking at the people beside him. He quickly said, Hey, guys, I'm broke. I don't have any money on me, not even $20. Please don't hurt me. Seeing Wesley's fearful reaction, Irika remained silent. Ginny, on the other hand, spoke up, Wesley, we mean no harm. Hearing the voice of a woman, Wesley finally dared to turn his head slightly and saw a blonde beauty. Feeling slightly reassured, he asked, Do I know you? 
Ginny stared at Wesley and said seriously, we were hired by your father to protect you. Upon hearing the word, father, Wesley visibly froze for a moment. Then his eyebrows furrowed, and he slowly said, my father abandoned me the week I was born. Your father is a world-class assassin. After you were born, he didn't want you to lead a life like his, one centered around killing and being killed. However, a group of people has targeted you. They plan to use you to threaten your father. That's why your father hired us to ensure your safety. What? Wesley's face was full of disbelief. Impossible, are you sure you're not mistaking me for someone else? Ginny took out a photo from her pocket, showed it to Wesley, and then compared it to his face. She said, no mistake. Besides, I know your father. You two actually have quite a resemblance. T slash N, if you are liking this so far, please leave some feedbacks with your comments, reviews or power stones. Otherwise, it feels like I am posting these chapters but nobody is really reading it. Thanks in advance for your support. At this moment, voices from the earpieces of both Irika and Ginny simultaneously transmitted Sasuke's words, behind you, at 3 o'clock, there's a woman who has been staring at our target. Is she an enemy? Irika immediately flashed in front of Wesley, and a kunai slipped out of his sleeve, held firmly in his hand as he assumed a combat stance. Ginny also turned around instantly, looking in the direction of 3 o'clock, locking eyes with Fox. She's an enemy. Just as the words were about to leave her lips, Ginny drew her gun from behind and started firing. Bang! Fox saw Ginny and recognized her in an instant. She recognized her as the former colleague who had left the textile factory a year ago. The two exchanged fire, bullets colliding in mid-air, but neither managed to harm the other. The sudden occurrence of this scene filled Wesley with terror. His anxiety disorder flared up once again, causing him to immediately clutch his head and crouch on the ground. His eyes were filled with fear, and the sounds of gunshots echoed in his ears, stimulating his brain. In this moment, the gunshot seemed so loud, like thunder. On the other side, as soon as Sasuke and Lee heard Ginny's words, she's an enemy, they reacted instantly and charged towards Fox's direction. However, Sasuke's speed was evidently slower than Lee's. Infinite Dance of the Dragon Suddenly, Rock Lee burst out from a corner, his figure speeding towards Fox. His velocity was so great that it created afterimages. Fox was in the midst of a gunfight with Ginny and didn't have time to turn and counterattack Lee. In the next instant, Fox felt an immense force at her waist. Bang! Lee's punch sent Fox flying, forming a graceful parabolic arc in the air before crashing into a street lamp on the side of the road. Numerous ribs were likely broken, and she immediately lost consciousness. Ginny was stunned by this turn of events. She never expected Lee, a seemingly ordinary kid, to possess such terrifying strength. Despite his lack of muscular build, he managed to send a person flying with a single punch. Since joining Charles Doyle's team a year ago, this was her first mission. Previously, she had worked as Charles Doyle's secretary, responsible for gathering information and screening bounty missions. While she knew Lee was strong, she didn't anticipate him to be this formidable. His strength was somewhat exaggerated. Was he a ninja? Or was he Kung Fu master? After confirming that Fox was taken care of, Ginny holstered her gun and firmly grabbed Wesley, who was muttering, I'm just an accountant, I'm just an accountant. Speaking with utmost seriousness, she told Wesley, Wesley, these are the people who came to kill you. They're an organization, not just one person. The danger isn't over. We should call the police. The police should protect me, Wesley said, trembling. As a result of the gunfire, pedestrians on the street had scattered in all directions, but there were still some kind-hearted citizens who dialed 911 during their escape. Lee approached Fox's body. Originally, he intended to tie Fox up to gather more information from her, but upon closer inspection, he saw blood flowing from her nose and mouth. He checked for breath but found none, Fox was already dead. Seeing Lee's inaction, Sasuke walked over and asked, Lee, why haven't you tied her up yet? At this moment, Rock Lee turned around, appearing somewhat disheartened, and said, she's dead. I didn't expect her to be so weak. I thought with it being a B-ranked mission, the enemies coming after us would be powerful. Rock Lee had been recruited by Charles Doyle just this year as a ninja. He hadn't been in this world for very long. 
When he arrived, Charles told him that this world wasn't simple and that many of them here wasn't weak. He took this lesson seriously. That's why, Rock Lee, who had graduated from the Ninja Academy a year ago, though he hadn't used his full strength, managed to incapacitate Fox with his physical techniques alone. Sasuke approached Fox to check her injuries and found that all the ribs on one side of her body were broken, probably puncturing her heart and causing her death. He then said disdainfully, the assassins here are truly weak. Irika heard their conversation through the earpiece and immediately adopted a serious tone. Sasuke, Lee, don't underestimate them. While their physical abilities might be lacking, the power of firearms is not to be underestimated. If they manage to shoot you in the head, you're done for. Rock Lee's expression turned serious, indicating that he had absorbed Irika's teachings. However, Sasuke seemed somewhat dismissive. Bullets. They need to hit him first. Although due to special circumstances he couldn't currently activate his Sharingan, he could still see bullets fired at him. Irika stepped in to support Wesley and, ignoring Ginny's conversation with the fallen enemy, spoke up, Ginny, you go drive. It's not safe to talk here. The police will be here soon. Let's move to a different location. Seeing Irika's insistence, Ginny didn't argue further. She immediately ran to where they had parked earlier and brought their prepared black Mercedes V-Class to the group. Wesley, who was being supported, was skeptical of this group. He planned to break free and escape once he got the chance. But he quickly realized that the scarred Asian man's grip was incredibly strong. No matter how he struggled, he couldn't break free from his grasp. Sasuke and Rock Lee had crossed the road and joined them, positioning themselves to protect Wesley in the middle. Soon, Ginny drove up in a black Mercedes V-Class and stopped in front of them. The seven-seater MVP could easily accommodate them all. As the car doors closed, the engine roared to life, and the vehicle swiftly left the scene. After the group had left in the car, a black sedan arrived at the site where Fox's body lay. An African-American man got out of the car, examined the scene, and then placed Fox's body in the trunk of the car. After finishing with the driver's side, he moved to the passenger's seat and addressed the man sitting in the back seat, Sloan, Fox is dead. The speaker was the gunsmith himself. Sloan looked outside, glancing at the nearby street lamp, and said, Cross betrayed us, and now he has even brought in assistance to protect his son. Clearly, our earlier investigation caught his attention. I just didn't expect him to bring in reinforcements so quickly. And Ginny. I agreed to her retirement, and yet she dared to help Cross. This is betrayal, outright betrayal. Ginny and Cross have both betrayed the Assassin Brotherhood. Return to the textile factory. We need to find out who Cross brought in and gather manpower to deal with these two traitors. Inside the Charles Agency, the lights were on, and Wesley sat on the sofa, surveying the surroundings. Rock Lee and Uchiha Sasuke stood on either side, guarding to prevent him from escaping. Since getting off the car, Wesley, they were tasked to protect had never been well behaved, always attempting to flee from the place. At this moment, Ginny had a conversation with Irika for a while before approaching Wesley and initiating a conversation with him. Meanwhile, Irika dialed Charles's phone number. Master Charles, we've made contact with the mission target, Wesley, today. During the encounter, we came across an assassination attempt by the Assassin Brotherhood, but we managed to eliminate them. We've temporarily brought the mission target, Wesley, back to the agency. Charles Doyle, who was still awake, listened to Irika's report over the phone. He found it quite surprising to learn that the Assassin Brotherhood had dispatched assassins for Wesley. In the original storyline, the Assassin Brotherhood sent Fox to take Wesley away and train him into a top assassin, then have him attempt to assassinate Cross. There was no attempt on Wesley's life directly, he was taken away for training. He speculated that the assassins sent by the Assassin Brotherhood intended to take Wesley away, which resulted in a conflict with his team. After all, the two sides had different objectives. Who were the attackers? Do you know? Charles wanted to confirm whether it was Fox. Based on the information provided by Secretary Ginny, the attacker was Fox from the Assassin Brotherhood. However, he was punched to death by Lee, so we couldn't interrogate her further. Having received this information, Charles calmly responded, All right, I understand. Make sure to keep Wesley safe during this time. We'll temporarily close down the agency. 
We don't have any available manpower to take on new missions right now. We can resume business as usual once my current mission is complete. Master Charles, please rest assured that Team Irica will perfectly execute this protection mission. After giving a brief instruction, Charles hung up the phone. He wasn't concerned about Fox's death, though Fox was described as alluring and capable in the wanted poster, she is just a mortal. Being punched to death by Lee was a rather ordinary outcome. Besides, considering that in the original plot, Fox died anyway, the timing of her death didn't matter much. It was better dying now than dying after her faith was shattered. At least this version of Fox firmly believed that his assassinations were for justice, for the future. Charles retrieved Cross' phone number and dialed it. After a moment, the call was answered. Cross, the Assassin Brotherhood have made a move against Wesley. Fox died at our hands today. After a slight pause, Charles continued, how much longer do you need? Keep in mind that with one of their own dead, they might escalate their attacks. I'm not someone who likes to wait. Hearing that the Assassin Brotherhood had sent Fox to attack his son, Cross was tense. However, upon learning that Fox was killed and his son was safe, he sighed with relief. Taking a deep breath, Cross replied in a serious tone, let's meet tomorrow. I'll brief you on the battle plan and show you the layout of the textile factory. If everything is in order, we'll move as soon as possible. Satisfied with Cross' intention to act promptly, Charles agreed. He shared his address with Cross before ending the call. On the other side, inside the textile factory, Sloan, Gunsmith, Butcher and others gathered around a table, with the body of Fox lying before them. Sloan's expression was heavy, and he began, Today, our friend Fox has been killed. After Mr. X, Fox has left us as well. The instigator behind all this is the traitor, Cross. He betrayed his faith, his destiny, and even colluded with dirty assassins to attack us. Even Ginny, who had retired, was deceived by Cross and stood with him. Sloan paused for a moment, setting the atmosphere, and continued, all of this is because Cross' name appeared on the loom of fate. Cross went mad, wanting to destroy us. How should we deal with those whose names appear on the loom of fate? Sloan's gaze swept across the people present. Destroy them. Several people spoke simultaneously. Although their voices weren't perfectly synchronized, their answer was unanimous. Upon hearing their response, Sloan nodded in approval. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tktigud while the Assassin Brotherhood had numerous members, only a few were genuinely formidable, including the deceased X and Fox. The rest were those present. Gunsmith, tell everyone about the group protecting Wesley. Gunsmith then presented a stack of A4 papers with printed information. This information had been purchased from a black market dealer on their way back. On the papers you have, let's focus on one person, Charles Doyle. Charles Doyle is a registered member of the Continental Hotel. He was ranked as the second to receive the legendary title after Night Devil in the Assassin world. His codename is Ninja. In addition to being a killer for the Continental Hotel, he has his own firm which mainly handles tasks such as retrieving lost items, reconnaissance, assassinations, escorts, and security. The firm's employees include Ginny, a former Brotherhood member. Yumino Irika, an Asian ninja. Uchiha Sasuke, Asian ninja. Rock Lee, Asian ninja. As Gunsmith presented the information, the members' photos and descriptions were shown. When the others saw photos of Uchiha Sasuke and Rock Lee, they exclaimed in surprise. Sloan continued, don't underestimate them just because they're young. In fact, they might be more dangerous than anyone else. The injuries on Fox's body were caused by Rock Lee. Upon hearing that Rock Lee was responsible for Fox's death, everyone reframed their perception of the two young individuals. Fox's injuries were visible to all, could a single punch really cause such extensive damage? Butcher hesitated for a moment and then asked, are they ninja from the hand? It was a reasonable question. The Assassin Brotherhood had been around for over a thousand years, and during that time, they had clashed with the Hand, an organization based on an island nation in East Asia. For some reason, their leader at the time, along with the leader of the Assassin Brotherhood, called for a truce, and the two factions hadn't crossed paths since then. Gunsmith was uncertain, but Sloan clarified, they are not ninja from the Hand. 
Upon hearing Sloane's statement that the other party wasn't connected to the hand, everyone seemed to relax a bit. However, the mention of Rock Lee, who had caused the death of Fox, cast a shadow over everyone's hearts. The power he possessed was too terrifying, a touch meant death, a graze meant injury. This was especially true for Butcher, who was skilled with knives. The harm he will suffer was immense. Sloane, should we bring Cross Sun with us? the gunsmith asked. Sloane pondered for a moment before replying, Cross Sun is the only person we can think of who could solve Cross' problem. They share the same blood. The gunsmith disagreed and countered, but Cross has already arranged for Charles' law firm's people to protect his son. Do we still have a chance? Furthermore, Wesley likely already knows about his own background. Hearing the gunsmith's words, the others nodded in agreement. Sloane looked at them and slowly continued, None of us are a match for Cross, but only Wesley is an existence Cross won't eliminate. We need to bring him, nurture him, and only then can we defeat Cross. As long as Cross hasn't met with Wesley, hasn't presented concrete evidence, I have a way to make him believe us. Sloane's confidence as he spoke was unwavering. Hearing Sloane's words, there were no more objections, only a question, should we all go and bring Wesley back? Sloane shook his head, no, we need to be prepared for cross-attack. If he can afford to hire people to protect his son, we can pay to have those protecting him eliminated. And we have more money than cross. Soon, Sloane and the others discussed their next plan and issued a series of reward notices to the Continental Hotel. The reward was for killing all employees of Charles' law firm, including Charles himself, totaling five people. The bounty for each was $2 million, and anyone could accept the contract. Once the targets were eliminated, the reward could be collected from the Continental Hotel. For this, Sloan had paid $10 million. Perhaps for an ordinary person, this amount was astronomical, but for the Assassin Brotherhood, which had a history spanning a thousand years, it was a trivial expense that didn't even qualify as moderate. The next day, early in the morning, Cross arrived at Charles' law firm with a large canvas bag filled with items. Seeing Cross enter with the bag, Charles spoke, Brother, is that filled with grenades and firearms? Once in the living room, Cross placed the canvas bag on the table and opened it, revealing a stack of blueprints. He then explained, Charles, the headquarters of the Assassin Brotherhood is a textile factory at 17th Street, Brooklyn, New York. These are the blueprints for the factory. Take a look first. We'll discuss our plan of attack later. Taking the offered blueprints, Charles carefully examined them, focusing on memorizing the layout, the rooms, storage spaces, ventilation ducts, anywhere someone could hide. His aim was to prevent the enemy from using hidden places for sudden attacks. As for the attack routes and specific locations to destroy that Cross had marked, Charles also took note of them. Instead of using rat bombs, which he found too cruel, not because he was a member of an animal protection society, but because his exploding talismans were just as effective as the rat bombs. He realized that his exploding talismans were no worse than rat bombs. After Charles had roughly gone through the blueprints, Cross continued explaining his plan, demonstrating a device he'd made that resembled a wristwatch, an explosive device that could be attached to rats without hindering their movement. While Cross explained his plan, Charles's phone suddenly rang. The caller ID displayed Ginny's name. Charles answered the call and signaled Cross to wait. Ginny, what's the matter? Charles was curious about the early morning call. Charles, I have some bad news to tell you. What happened? Just tell me straight, Ginny. Ginny's tone was serious, and she said deliberately, Charles, we're all on Continental Hotel's hit list. All of us. Charles caught onto a key word. Yes, all of us. This morning, Continental Hotel updated its hit list. Everyone from Charles' law firm is on it, you, me, Irika Yumino, Sasuke Uchiha, and Rock Lee. Each kill is worth $2 million, totaling $10 million. What's crucial is that this mission is open to anyone. Anyone can take it. I think Continental Hotel's assassins have already started moving. Charles, we're in trouble. After hearing Ginny's report, Charles realized that the situation had become much more complicated and troublesome. He never thought that he, too, would one day become a target for Continental Hotel's hit list. Was this the fate of a legendary assassin? Wasn't the previous $2 million reward target John Wick, a retired legendary assassin? 
He hadn't expected that an assassin organization like Continental Hotel would actually resort to putting out assassination missions of their own assassins. Have they no shame? Charles's tone remained calm and composed as he said, Ginny, don't worry. We're aware of the strength of Continental Hotel's assassins. They're not our match, it's just a bit troublesome. Protect yourselves and Wesley during this period. I and Cross will eradicate the Assassin Brotherhood as soon as possible. I'll find a way to get Sloane to cancel the bounty. Charles knew that if the bounty wasn't cancelled, the mission would remain active, attracting countless individuals seeking money or fame to come knocking for assassination. Although Charles wasn't afraid, he disliked the constant annoyance of these pesky flies. Upon hearing Charles's confident tone, Ginny didn't say much more before hanging up. The main purpose of the call was to inform Charles that he was also on the hit list, warning him from being attacked unexpectedly without preparation. After seeing Charles hang up the phone, Cross's expression turned serious as he asked, Did Sloan issue a reward against you? Charles looked at Cross's inquiring gaze and replied, Cross, Sloan posted a $10 million reward in Continental Hotel, primarily to eliminate the people I sent to protect your son. I suspect they want to take advantage of the hitman's arrival to snatch your son amidst the chaos. Though my subordinates aren't afraid of those hitmen, Cross, this is still troublesome. So, for the safety of your son, I suggest we act quickly. Cross knew that Charles had his best interests at heart, but he still spoke, I need some more time. I haven't finished making my bombs, and we need a lot of rats. Charles shook his head and stated, Cross, your plan requires too much preparation time. In comparison, I have something better. Let's take action tonight. Cross, go prepare your weapons. Delaying won't be beneficial for you. Cross asked solemnly, Charles, the textile factory has a significant number of personnel. Are you really sure about this? Cross, go get ready. Tonight, you'll see the true power of a legendary assassin. Seeing Charles's determination, Cross didn't insist. He was genuinely concerned about his son's safety. Since Charles was confident, Cross was willing to take the gamble with him. As for the rat bombs, he'd use as many as he could. And as for not bringing them along, that was out of the question, they were his trump card. With the plan set for the night, Cross bid farewell to Charles and left to prepare his guns and bombs. Leaving Charles's residence, Cross headed towards the elevator. He coincidentally encountered a delivery person stepping out of the elevator, holding a box of pizza. Their gazes met briefly, but Cross paid it no mind. He proceeded to the elevator, only to find that it had already descended. He pressed the button and waited. At that moment, inside Charles's apartment, Charles had just seen Cross off and was about to carry out his tasks for the day. Ding dong. The doorbell chimed, interrupting Charles's actions. He glanced towards the living room where he had spoken with Cross, but there didn't seem to be anything left behind. Could there be something Cross forgot to mention? Approaching the door, Charles opened it to find a black delivery person holding a pizza box. Charles's eyebrows slightly furrowed, and before he could speak, the delivery person retrieved a handgun from beneath the pizza box, aiming to shoot. Acting quickly, Charles swiftly kicked out even before the hitman could fire. This kick was not only swift but also empowered by Charles's chakra. Thud. The hitman was sent flying, crashing into the corridor wall. Instantly, the wall cracked upon impact, and the hitman's head slumped to the side, lifeless. The pizza box that the hitman had been holding flew out of his hand upon impact, revealing its contents as it tumbled through the air. Damn it! Charles cursed under his breath. It was a bomb, a rigged liquid explosive device. He moved at his fastest speed, grabbing the falling pizza box just before it hit the ground. With a swift motion, he flung it towards the end of the corridor. Then, he twisted his body and retreated into his room, leaning against the wall as he awaited the explosion. These actions occurred in the blink of an eye, executed at an incredibly swift pace. The next second. Boom. A deafening explosion sounded, causing the room to shake three times. Bits of wall plaster and dust fell, and the building's alarms immediately began to blare. After the explosion subsided, Charles emerged from his room and glanced at the corridor. He saw that the wall at the end of the corridor had collapsed due to the blast. A chilly breeze flowed in through the hole in the wall. Charles muttered softly, it had quite some power. 
Due to the abruptness of the events, Cross had yet to reach the elevator when he heard the explosion. He immediately dashed towards Charles's direction. Seeing Charles unscathed, Cross asked, Charles, are you okay? Charles's face was grim, and his tone carried a hint of anger as he replied, I'm fine. Cross, go back and prepare quickly. Tonight, I'm going to wipe out the damn textile factory and kill Sloane. Seeing Charles's furious expression resembling that of an enraged lion, Cross didn't say much. He quickly departed. This place had already been attacked, but what about his son's side? Cross, who initially thought it might be too early, now felt the urgency. He was itching to charge into the textile factory and annihilate the Assassin Brotherhood. He feared that if they delayed any longer, his son might be in danger. Watching Cross leave, Charles's anger was genuine this time. It wasn't just because of Sloane's bounty, but also because of the hitmen from Continental Hotel. Someone had dared to make a move on him so soon. Did he, a legendary assassin, still have any face left? Especially considering the bomb that had just gone off. If it had exploded in front of him, even with these protective gears, he would have been injured. This time it was a bomb. What would it be next time? TNT. Cluster grenades. Or perhaps someone would march in with a rocket launcher. Assassins could be unscrupulous, and he couldn't rule out such underhanded methods. Sloane, you're as good as dead. Just as Charles was about to return to his room, the phone rang again. Charles, do you need help? Hearing the familiar voice, Charles's expression darkened. The caller wasn't anyone else but John Wick, whom he had saved before. And those were the same words he had said to John several times before. He hadn't expected them to be thrown right back at him. John, it's just a minor matter. I can handle it myself. Charles, what about your subordinates? Can they handle it too? You still have my blood oath medallion, you can use it. Let me protect your subordinates. Hearing John Wick's intentions, Charles was somewhat speechless. John seemed eager to put that blood oath medallion to use. John, tell those hitmen from Continental Hotel to be careful. They might be earning money, but it's their lives they're spending. As for your suggestion, John, I'm sorry, but I trust their capabilities. On the other end of the line, John Wick sounded somewhat resigned. Charles had turned down his offer, but he still said, Charles, if you need help, contact me. As for the message, I'll have Winston pass it along to Continental Hotel. The call ended, and Charles returned to his room, glancing at the dust on the floor. He muttered to himself, this place is no longer safe. I need to find somewhere else to stay. Check-in. Ding. Check-in successful. Reward, 50 gold coins. Do you want to upgrade to VIP 4 to claim double rewards? Charles absent-mindedly tapped the dex and exited the system interface. He picked up his coat, turned around, and left his room. For more chapters, 30 plus p at treeandcom slash getsonight had fallen. Charles Doyle was currently driving a car, complaining to Cross beside him, man, the smell of these rats in the box is really strong. Charles, don't underestimate these rats. They're all deadly weapons. If we had more time, I could have brought even more. Cross patted the box while speaking. Cross seemed quite satisfied with his creation. The Porsche Cayenne sped down the road towards Brooklyn. The cold night air flowed in through the windows, dispelling the lingering smell inside the car. Before long, the car arrived near Textile Factory No in Brooklyn. With a few hundred meters left to the factory, Charles Doyle brought the car to a stop. Seeing the car stop, Cross was puzzled, aren't we going to drive straight in? Let's get out. We still have a distance to cover. We'll sneak over and try not to be noticed, Charles explained. Charles, without crashing the car through the gate, there's no way we can get in. Are you planning to use bombs for directional blasting? Or did you bring an RPG in the car? Observing Charles get out of the car without heading for the trunk, Cross couldn't quite figure out what was happening. Particularly when Charles didn't seem to be carrying many weapons, it further perplexed him. Soon, Cross took out a notebook from his pocket and said, Charles, here's the wax bath formula I promised you. Charles took the notebook but didn't read it. He simply put it in his pocket and said, Cross, don't worry about these things. I have my own way of handling it. 
Bring your rats and catch up with me. Both of them jogged until they reached the vicinity of the textile factory. Charles glanced at the nearly ten-meter-high wall. It wasn't merely a wall, it resembled a fortress wall. Despite the night, guards were still patrolling the wall, and searchlights occasionally illuminated the dark corners. Charles, since you have a plan, I'll leave it to you. Cross pressed against the wall, holding a large pet carrier. Charles, oozing confidence, said, leave it to me. Once I break through the door, you can release your rat army. I'm afraid that if we wait too long, they won't have a chance. In the next moment, Charles Doyle accelerated, his figure quickly appearing at the gate of the textile factory. He nonchalantly affixed an explosive seal and then hid beside the wall. He muttered under his breath, boom. The explosive seal ignited instantly, resulting in a deafening explosion. The explosion's diameter was a full three meters, and the wooden gate of the textile factory shattered into pieces. The explosion instantly jolted awake the numerous assassins within the textile factory. The guards responsible for the night patrol on the wall immediately sounded the alarm. On the other side, seeing the gate suddenly blown apart, Cross was left dumbfounded. He had just seen something, a piece of paper with unfamiliar patterns and characters, attached to the door. In less than a moment, the paper had ignited and exploded on its own. The explosiveness of it was not to be underestimated. Without hesitation, Cross rushed forward while carrying the box. As he approached the gate, he tossed the box out. In the next second, the box crashed onto the ground, shattering into pieces, and the rats inside scattered and fled. Meanwhile, Charles had already charged into the textile factory. He aimed at the guards on the wall and fired explosive seal kanai that he had prepared in advance. Boom, boom, boom. Explosions resounded continuously, and even the ten-meter-high wall was blasted down. The explosive seal kanai, equipped with explosive seals, kept shooting out from Charles's hands, flying in all directions, causing explosions to erupt constantly. At the same time, Cross, now wielding a gun, rushed in as well. However, seeing Charles Doyle's actions, he was both dumbfounded and amazed. He fired his gun while commenting, if the hand had techniques like these back in the day, the assassin brotherhood would have ceased to exist long ago. What is that, some kind of seal? Or a new type of bomb? Gunshots kept ringing out as Cross entered the textile factory after Charles. However, all he saw were corpses. Charles moved swiftly with Kanai in hand, cutting down anyone who stood in his way. His speed was too rapid, rendering the assassins unable to land a single shot on him. Even when they managed to shoot a few bullets his way, he deflected them with his kanai. He continued his killing spree until he reached the second floor, where explosions suddenly resounded again. This time, the explosions weren't caused by Charles's explosive seals. Instead, it was Cross's dozens of explosive rats that detonated. The explosions had such force that the staircases leading to the second and third floors were destroyed by the impact. On the second floor, as Charles arrived, a bullet flew towards him. He used his kanai to split the bullet in half, causing its two parts to fly off in different directions, taking out two assassins who had been aiming their guns at him. Among them was a repairman who was attempting to shoot. When his first shot proved ineffective, he was about to pull the trigger again. In an instant, Charles's figure covered a distance of ten meters, appearing right in front of the repairman. He struck with a punch. Boom! The repairman's head was instantly blown apart by Charles's punch, with red and white fragments scattering in all directions. The sight before him not only frightened the enemy but also shocked Charles himself. He had never used this technique on a person before, and he hadn't anticipated the immense power it possessed. The scene was also incredibly gruesome. Charles secretly resolved never to hit someone in the head again, the image of an exploding head was truly nauseating. Turning away from the carnage, Charles leaped up and landed on the third floor, which was a slaughterhouse. It housed Butcher, and as soon as Charles entered, a flying knife was hurled at him. Charles deflected the knife blade using his kanai. In this pitch-black and eerily quiet room, numerous slaughtered bodies were hanging, creating an unsettling atmosphere. Charles had no intention of toying with the butcher. He formed hand seals and muttered incantations. Fire style, great fireball jutsu. With a large amount of chakra input, a massive fireball, 
10 meters in diameter and reddish-brown in color, instantly materialized and was hurled forward. The enormous fireball engulfed the entire room. Whether they were hanging pigs or butchers hiding within, everything was instantaneously incinerated by the flames, turning into roasted meat. Charles smirked and muttered, who said a grand fireball can't kill people? He turned around and headed toward the next room. T slash N, I don't know some of the characters that are mentioned here. If I make any mistake with their name, please let me know in the comments section. Meanwhile, on the other side, Cross entered the factory and noticed that most of the enemies had already been killed by Charles. He chose a different path, aiming toward Sloane's study. But instead of encountering Sloane, he encountered Pesticide instead. Cross, it seems you really appreciate my research. It looks like you brought quite a few rats this time. Pesticide held a rat in his hand, the explosive attached to it having been disarmed. Sorry, Pesticide. Cross didn't hold back. He lifted his hand and fired a shot, as the bullet whizzed through the air. Pesticide rolled to the side, avoiding the shot. He then tossed out a rat and took cover behind a pillar, cursing, F- Cross. I was the one who taught you that trick, and you used it to try and kill me. You bastard. Cross showed no mercy. He swiftly slung his gun, and the bullet curved in its trajectory, bypassing the pillar where Pesticide was hiding and instantly taking him out. At the same time, gunshots sounded behind Cross. Gunsmith held a handgun and immediately pulled the trigger on Cross. Whether it was due to a premonition or sensing the danger, Cross lunged forward, dodging the bullet. He then turned around and fired his own shot. Gunsmith didn't hold back either. While evading, he shot back at Cross. The bullets from both sides occasionally met and collided in midair. On the other side, Charles Doyle entered a spacious study. The room was vast, with bookshelves lining the walls, filled with countless books. Suddenly, Sloan and three assassins appeared behind separate bookshelves in four different directions. They all raised their guns and fired without hesitation. Bang! Four bullets were simultaneously fired from four different directions towards Charles. In an unbelievable move, Charles performed a mid-air somersault, evading all four bullets at once from seemingly impossible angles. Before the enemies could react, Charles threw four shurikens, instantly killing the three assassins, excluding Sloan, on the spot. Although Sloan survived, his palm was pierced by a shuriken, causing him to drop his firearm. Seeing that the danger was averted, Charles, who had landed on the ground, spoke to confirm, Sloan. Sloan covered his bleeding hand, pretending to remain calm as he said, Charles, how much did Cross pay you? We'll offer double, no, triple the price. Please help me. Charles looked at Sloan with a hint of mockery and said, Sloan, you can't afford that price. Besides, once you're dead, the property of the textile factory will belong to me. Charles wasn't joking. Sloan truly had nothing else comparable to the healing bath or the sacred weaving machines. Upon hearing that Cross had used the entire textile factory as a bargaining chip to give to Charles, Sloan immediately broke into a sweat. Then, realizing something, he continued, Charles, if you let me go, I'll cancel the bounty on your agency. How about that? And I'll give you ownership of this textile factory as well. How does that sound? Seeing that Charles remained unmoved, Sloan continued, Charles, if you don't release me, the bounty will continue to hang at the Continental Hotel. Countless assassins will swarm you like locusts. You won't be able to trust anyone. Hearing Sloan's threat, Charles kicked him to the ground and stepped on him, saying, Sloan, you'd better cancel the bounty on my agency. That way, I might make your death a little less painful. Sloan, pinned under Charles's foot, wasn't afraid. Instead, he quickly regained his composure and looked at Charles, saying, Charles, if you're unwilling to spare me, then this bounty will remain on the five members of your agency until you're all dead and the bounty is claimed. Perhaps you're not afraid of assassination, but what about others? They'll live under the constant threat of assassination. Can they really endure it? Charles, still pressing down on Sloan, stomped hard on him, crushing him to death. I, Charles Doyle, can't stand threats the most in my life. You think you can rely on those insignificant assassins to force me to spare you? Sloan, you underestimate me. With another forceful kick, Charles kicked Sloan's corpse to the doorway. At this moment, 
Cross, who had just dealt with the gunsmith, walked in while holding his arm wounded. He looked at the lifeless Sloane and then glanced at Charles, who remained unscathed. Cross' pupils contracted slightly as he thought, this guy is too terrifying. Charles, is the bounty issue resolved? Charles shacked without much elaboration, clearly indicating that the matter wasn't resolved. Instead, he said, are there any survivors in the textile factory? Cross didn't expect an answer since Charles hadn't replied, so he continued, they've all been killed. Looking at Sloane's lifeless body on the ground, Charles asked, show me the so-called fate weaving machine you guys mentioned. Hearing Charles's request, Cross looked at him deeply but didn't refuse. Instead, he led Charles to a factory. The factory was spacious but empty, with only one operational weaving machine inside. Staring at the weaving machine in front of him, Cross spoke with mixed emotions, Charles, this is the Assassin Brotherhood's fate weaving machine. Charles approached, circled around the machine, and especially looked at the back, as if checking if there was an internet cable connected to it, as some internet users had humorously speculated. As it turned out, the fate weaving machine was not connected to any network cable. Charles examined the machine carefully, trying to find some distinctive feature, but after observing for a while, he found nothing. He gently touched the weaving machine. The next second, the system that had never successfully recharged before suddenly responded, emitting a message. Ding detected special energy. Recharge is available. Do you want to recharge? Hearing about the recharge, a smile appeared on Charles's face. The fate weaving machine was indeed not a simple object, it could actually recharge the system. Without hesitation, Charles silently confirmed the recharge. The next moment, the weaving machine in front of him seemed to have its energy drained away. It aged instantly. The machine that hadn't sustained any damage for over a thousand years suddenly deteriorated as if consumed by time, turning into ashes and scattering on the ground. Cross, who witnessed this scene, was dumbfounded. He was bewildered by how the immortal weaving machine had decayed into ashes the moment Charles touched it. His eyes shifted, and he murmured, the fate weaving machine is just like the Assassin Brotherhood, it corroded and perished together after betraying its faith. Regarding Cross' words, Charles merely raised an eyebrow, not particularly concerned. He was more focused on the interface of the Naruto system in his mind. Ding recharge successful. On the system interface, the gold coins column rapidly flipped numbers, going from 100 to 500 to 1000. The numbers were constantly changing until they finally settled at 1730. Charles recharged 1680 gold coins, and his VIP level had also changed. It went from 0 to VIP 1. Seeing these changes, Charles didn't linger on the system interface for too long. He directly exited and planned to investigate further later. After all, Cross was still standing beside him. Charles, the Assassin Brotherhood has been wiped out. How do you plan to claim this loot? Cross pointed to the ashes on the ground and the surrounding factory buildings. As Charles gazed at the ashes on the ground that Cross referred to as loot, he thought to himself, I've already claimed my loot, you just don't know it. Cross, the textile factory is yours to manage. Since you came from here, it's only fitting for you to take over. Hearing Charles's intention to hand over the textile factory to him, Cross was taken aback for a moment. He believed this was Charles's loot, especially since they had agreed before that the loot belonged to Charles. Upon hearing Charles's words, Cross expressed his gratitude, thank you then. I'll tidy up the place and check if Sloane had any hidden cash or similar things. I'll call you when I'm done. Seeing Cross' willingness, Charles nodded in satisfaction, sure, handle it yourself. The mission is completed now, go pick up your son. The two of them left the textile factory and returned to where they had parked. Charles tossed the car keys to Cross and said, Wesley is at my agency. You drive on the way back. Cross took the keys without questioning Charles's request and immediately opened the car door, starting the engine. Charles opened the passenger door, got in, and after sniffing the still lingering smell of rats, which reminded him of the sewer, he opened a window and closed his eyes to rest. Seeing Charles closing his eyes as soon as he got in, Cross drove the vehicle smoothly towards Charles's agency on Forest Hills Avenue 71, Queens District. By now, Charles's consciousness had entered the system interface. He glanced at the gold coin interface displaying 1730 and began checking the recharge records. 
He discovered the message, detected special energy. Recharge is available. Recharge successful, 840 gold coins. Initial recharge, gold coins doubled, totaling 1680 gold coins. Seeing this, Charles Doyle finally understood that the fate weaving machine didn't directly recharge him with so many gold coins. Instead, it leveraged the system's first time recharge reward to double the amount. However, while 840 gold coins were a substantial sum, the fact that it only raised his VIP level by one seemed exaggerated. Achieving only a one level upgrade for the VIP with 840 gold coins left him slightly frustrated. Thankfully, even VIP-1 had its corresponding benefits. Charles opened the VIP-1 privilege package and gained 12,000 copper coins, 70 prestige, and one ninja recruitment scroll. Seeing another recruitment scroll, Charles was quite satisfied. This scroll was worth 168 gold coins, almost a tenth of his gold coin total. Including the five scrolls he had previously, Charles now had six ninja recruitment scrolls. Glancing at his remaining gold coins, he generously bought four more ninja recruitment scrolls, making a total of ten. This cost him 672 gold coins, leaving him with 1,058 gold coins. Instead of immediately conducting ninja recruitment, Charles started contemplating. Since the fate weaving machine could convert into energy for recharging, what else could he recharge with? Dragon bones? Ten rings? Heart shaped grass? Frost Casket, Eternal Fire, or Infinity Gems. Although Charles didn't possess these items and wasn't sure if they could be successfully recharged, he wanted to give it a try. With a goal in mind, Charles Doyle felt more confident about the future. Putting these thoughts aside, he opened the mission hall and saw that the mission to exterminate the Assassin Brotherhood had been completed. He immediately chose to claim the reward. Prestige Points, 500,000 copper coins, and an exquisite treasure chest. He opened the treasure chest, and after a flicker of light, a ninja shard popped out. It was clearly labeled Uchiha Sasuke from the anime. This Sasuke had just finished his training under Orochimaru. Seeing the ninja shard appear, Charles was somewhat satisfied. However, it was unfortunate that there was only one shard for Uchiha Sasuke. One should note that a B-rank ninja required 40 identical shards for combining, unless directly recruited. In an instant, Charles felt a sense of fear being dominated by collecting shards. He didn't want to think about the time and cost to gather all 40 shards for this Sasuke. Thus, he exited the system space. After Cross had driven for a while, he arrived near Charles's agency. Charles raised an eyebrow. It seemed an assassin had come to their door and was dealt with. Cross also noticed something was amiss. He quickly pulled up to the front of the agency. As soon as the car came to a stop, Charles got out and walked towards the office. Currently, Charlie was overseeing the cleanup of traces. When he saw who had arrived, he greeted, Good evening, Mr. Charles. Good evening, Charlie. Charles exchanged greetings and then looked inside the office. The lobby was a mess, bullet holes, marks of grenade explosions, and evidence of chaos were everywhere. Charlie's cleanup crew was busy picking up debris, wiping away bloodstains, and preparing to dispose of the bodies. At this moment, Charles's expression grew darker. These assassins were too audacious, directly attacking his agency and even using grenades. Charles, has the Assassin Brotherhood been eradicated? The person speaking was Ginny, who had come down from the second floor. They've been eliminated. Is everything okay on your end? Charles inquired. Charlie, who was busy directing his men in the cleanup process, seemed to hear something incredulous. His pupils contracted momentarily, his body stiffening, before he resumed commanding as if nothing had happened. Everything's fine. Nobody was hurt. Ginny replied, then turned to Cross, who had just walked in behind Charles, and said, Cross, Wesley is upstairs. You can go get him. Thank you, Ginny. Cross expressed his gratitude before turning and heading upstairs. This was his first time meeting face to face with the son he had always lived without seeing. Seeing Cross leave, Charles's tone remained calm as he asked, Ginny, please explain the situation. Upon hearing Charles's request, Ginny immediately began recounting the events, since this morning until now, a total of six waves of assassins have come. 
just paying off Charlie for cleaning up has already cost us 30 gold coins, not to mention the expenses for renovating the agency. However, the strength of the assassins who came to the door was quite weak. While they didn't cause us much harm, it's getting tougher as more come. Some have already used grenades, and who knows if they might resort to using RPGs next. Upon hearing Ginny say that nobody was hurt, Charles's anger didn't diminish in the slightest. Especially upon hearing the mention of RPGs, his anger flared even more. However, he noticed that Irika and the others were missing. Thus, he inquired, Ginny, where are Irika and the others? They're in the reception room, and Irika is giving them a lesson. When Charles heard the word, lesson, his eyebrows raised in curiosity. What happened? Ginny looked a bit embarrassed as she explained, there was a close call when a grenade exploded, nearly injuring Sasuke. Irika is giving them a post-battle analysis. Upon hearing that Sasuke wasn't hurt, Charles didn't say much more. In the anime, Irika taught lower-ranked ninjas in the academy. Even though he couldn't defeat the two of them, Irika was still a chunin in their teacher. At that moment, Charles took out a notebook from his pocket and said, Ginny, this is TH healing bath formula Cross gave me. Test it out to see if it works, and if it does, set up a room as the recovery area. After receiving the healing bath formula from Charles and briefly reviewing it, Ginny replied, No problem, I'll get it set up as soon as possible. Just then, Cross appeared with Wesley. It seemed they had already established a connection, as they recognized each other rather quickly. Charles, the mission to protect Wesley is now over. Thank you for your help, Cross said as he pulled out the key of Charles's Porsche Cayenne and handed it over. Wesley and I are heading back, so I'm returning your car key. Looking at Cross offering the car key, Charles quickly said, Cross, you can have the car. It'll be convenient for you to take your son home. Regarding the Porsche, which now had a distinct sewer rat smell, Charles had no interest in keeping it and handed it over to Cross without hesitation. Hearing Charles's words, Cross didn't refuse and bid his farewell before leaving. After all, a Porsche Cayenne was worth only a few tens of thousands of dollars, and neither of them attached much importance to it. Not long after Cross left, Charlie and his team finished cleaning up the room and also said their goodbyes to Cross and his group. Ginny, go get Irika and the others. We'll tidy up a bit and then head to the Continental Hotel tonight. Because they didn't know if the assassins might strike again in the early morning, Charles planned to take everyone to the Continental Hotel for the night. This would also give them a chance to resolve the bounty issue the next day. It wasn't about being afraid of an attack, it just didn't make sense to stay up all night for this when there is other solution. Soon, Ginny came back with Irika and the others. Good evening, Master Charles, the three of them greeted Charles as they came out. Seeing Sasuke before him, Charles recalled the previous Sasuke fragment and his current collection of ten ninja summoning scrolls. He felt an impulse to draw rewards, but he suppressed it. After exchanging greetings, Charles instructed them, You three get ready. We'll be staying at the Continental Hotel tonight and handling the bounty situation tomorrow. After quickly grabbing a few changes of clothes, the group drove to the Continental Hotel. Along the way, Sasuke glanced at Ginny inside the car with a look of hesitation, but he ultimately didn't say anything. Without encountering any assassins on the road, they arrived safely at the Continental Hotel. As they entered the hotel, several assassins were sitting in the executive corridor. Seeing Charles and his group's arrival, their gazes held curiosity and greed. This combination of a woman, child, and an Asian made them seem like a group of vulnerable individuals. Even though they had heard that previous attempts had failed, they were still confident in themselves. Their eyes held an aggressive intention as they looked at the group, except when their gazes met Charles's. Then their pupils contracted too. Charles's reputation still instilled fear in them. They couldn't kill him, but trading the lives of the others for a bounty seemed like a good idea. Charles didn't pay much attention to the gazes of the others. One reason was his belief in his own strength, and the other was his trust that these people would follow the rules of the Continental Hotel. Approaching the hotel reception desk, Charles Doyle took out five gold coins from his pocket and placed them on the counter, saying, please check us in for five adjacent rooms. At this moment, Ginny leaned gently toward Charles and spoke softly, Charles, won't you consider four rooms? Charles didn't respond to Ginny. Instead, he reiterated to the counter, 
five rooms, seeing that Charles wasn't taking the bait, Ginny also found it uninteresting and remained silent. After receiving the room keys from, she led the way upstairs. Seeing Ginny return to her usual demeanor, Charles smiled silently, choosing not to comment. He picked up his room key and headed upstairs as well. Boring. Sasuke muttered sarcastically, then picked up a room key from the counter and went upstairs. Irika shrugged and said to Lee, let's go, Lee. We should go upstairs and rest too. Taking the room keys for the last two rooms, they went upstairs together. In his hotel room, Charles's first order of business was to take a shower. After all, he had spent time in a car with sewer rats and then engaged in a bout of bloodshed. He was full of blood and dust. After freshening up, Charles changed into his pajamas and was about to enter the system interface when the doorbell rang. Secretary Jean, you really don't forget to think about me all the time, Charles quipped. Opening the door, he found it was not Ginny as he had thought, but Sasuke Uchiha. What's the matter? Come in and tell me. Sasuke wasn't polite either, he walked straight into the room and found a chair to sit on. Charles glanced at the corridor, closed the door when he saw there was no one else, and then asked, Sasuke, is there something you need from me? Looking at the man before him, Sasuke bit his lip and said, Lord Charles, can you resurrect my parents in this world? Hearing Sasuke's words, Charles was taken aback for a moment. As he gazed at the young man, he suddenly realized that this version of Sasuke was just a child, a twelve-year-old child, to be exact. Even considering the time he had spent in this world, he was still just a thirteen-year-old child. And he had experienced the massacre of his clan only a few years ago. Hearing Sasuke's words, Charles was moved. He stepped forward, ruffled Sasuke's hair, and then sighed, Sasuke, I can't make any promises. Maybe I'll be able to bring your people to this world soon, or it might take a long time before I can bring them over. Sasuke was momentarily surprised by Charles's actions but didn't flinch. His eyes were filled with tears of hope. He missed his parents and his clan, except for his older brother, Itachi Uchiha. Hearing Charles's words, he immediately got up, knelt down in a formal Japanese style, and said, Please, Lord Charles. After speaking, Sasuke got up and quickly left Charles's room. For more chapters, 35 plus p at trian.com slash getza watching Sasuke Uchiha run out of the room, Charles Doyle thought to himself, I mentioned clan members, not necessarily his parents. I didn't promise that. It's not that he wasn't clear in his words, he genuinely didn't know. He wasn't sure whether his recruited ninja characters included Fugaku Uchiha and Makoto Uchiha. After all, these characters hadn't appeared in the game before he crossed over. On the other hand, there were several character cards for Shirsue Uchiha and Itachi Uchiha. Putting aside these thoughts, Charles returned to his bed and laid down, once again immersing his consciousness in the system interface. He opened the mission hall and saw that the B-ranked mission to protect Wesley had been completed. He clicked to claim the rewards. Ding, received 2000 reputation, 200,000 copper coins, and a common treasure chest. Opening the treasure chest, he received an additional 2,000 reputation, but this time, there were no ninja fragments. However, Charles was still quite satisfied with the 2,000 reputation. After all, reputation was valuable currency, especially for upgrading. Summoning Beast With these tasks completed, Charles was ready to embark on his eagerly anticipated ninja recruitment. Rubbing his hands together in anticipation, he muttered, Sage of Six Paths, please bless me with a powerful ninja. Ideally, I'd love to start with a B-rank ninja. Ninja recruitment, 10 consecutive draws, go. The whirlpool symbol of Yuzushiogakure appeared before him, emitting a peculiar light. After a burst of radiance, the recruitment results appeared before Charles Doyle. Ding! Received C-rank ninja, ninja trainee Naruto Uzumaki Fragment X2. Ding! Received C-rank ninja, 1010 Fragment X2. Ding! Received C-rank ninja, Sakura Haruno Fragment X2. Ding! Received C-rank ninja, Shizun Fragment X1. Ding! Received B-rank ninja, Hinata Hyuga Fragment X2. Ding! Received C-rank ninja, Tamari Fragment X2. Ding! Received B-rank ninja, Hinata Hyuga Fragment X2. Ding! 
Received Sirank Ninja, Sharingan, Sasuke Achiha. Ding. Received A Rank Ninja, Fugaku Achiha Fragment X4. Ding. Received C Rank Ninja, Hinata Hyuga Fragment X1. Looking at the subtitles that popped up on the screen, Charles celebrated his successful recruitment of the Sharingan, Sasuke Achiha. The image of Sasuke with the Sharingan that appeared was from the Chunin exams in the manga, with his attire and appearance. Unfortunately, the large C Rank Ninja label was next to it. Opening the details of the ninja, Charles first checked the ninja skills. Sharingan, Sasuke Achiha, C-Rank Ninja Skills, Fire Style, Great Fireball, Sharingan, Chidori. Especially in the skills section, Charles took a closer look at the Sharingan. It wasn't just a regular one Tomo Sharingan, it was a two Tomo Sharingan. As for the other two skills, they were the same as the Sasuke he had recruited before, and they were exactly the same. Sigh. Charles let out a sigh. He didn't know how to feel about his luck. Was it possible that his luck had been depleted when he crossed over, or was it that not even the Sage of Six Paths could bless him with a powerful recruit? Charles consoled himself, it definitely isn't my fault. It's probably that the Sage of Six Paths don't work here, he can't bless me in the Marvel world. Next time, I'll try looking for other deities, maybe they'll bless me. Finally, Charles comforted himself, getting a two Tomo Sharingan is probably not a bad deal. At least it's better than getting a ninja like from the ninja school. After claiming the reward, in the next moment, a surge of chakra generated within Charles, providing the same amount of chakra as that of a lower ranked ninja. With three more opportunities to use Chidori, Charles nodded in satisfaction. Afterwards, looking at the other recruitment rewards, Charles sighed, It's like they want me to piece together Hinata Hyuga. They gave me one C rank version and then just exploded with two rounds of B rank ones, totaling four fragments. And there's even an A rank, Fugaku Achiha. This is amazing. It directly exploded and gave me four fragments. That's one tenth done in an instant. Unfortunately, combining the fragments of these B A rank ninjas seemed quite challenging. Charles didn't have high hopes, after all, the appearance of fragments was very random and there were so many ninjas. The difficulty of combining B-rank and above ninjas was just too high. On the other hand, characters like Temari, Ten Ten, and Shizun, these C-rank ninjas, might have the chance to be completed with the next 10 draws, if luck was on his side. Summing up the results of this recruitment, Charles realized that although he hadn't obtained any major gains in terms of ninjas, he did earn a lot of fragments. He had received a total of 18, which was equivalent to 18 single draws. At this point, Charles opened his ninja list, and it displayed four ninjas, Irika Yumino, Rock Lee, Sasuke Achiha, and Sharingan, Sasuke Achiha. Charles didn't want to keep two versions of Sasuke, so he decided to merge the cards. Cards of the same character can be merged. After merging, they retain the memories obtained from the specific version and expand their skills for example, if you merge Ninja Academy Naruto with Genin Exam Naruto, the character's appearance will change to that of Genin Naruto, and both body and appearance will grow. Charles first retrieved the specific version of Sasuke Uchiha, the one without the Sharingan, and in the next moment, the Sasuke resting in the hotel room disappeared instantly. With both cards now available, Charles initiated the fusion process. At this point, a dialog box popped up on the system interface, confirm fusion. After fusion, the star-up requirements for the character would be the sum of the previous character's fragments. For example, 30 fragments of Sasuke Achiha plus 30 fragments of Sharingan, Sasuke Achiha. Considering that he only had three team slots at the moment and that he didn't need both versions of Sasuke simultaneously, Charles Doyle chose fusion without hesitation. A burst of radiance flashed, signifying the successful fusion of the characters. Ding! Due to the same character skills, Fire Style, Great Fireball and Chidori have been strengthened. Clicking on the fused card, the ninja's name hadn't changed, it was still C-Rank Ninja Sasuke Uchiha. However, the skill slots had increased. Besides the higher star-up difficulty, Charles hadn't noticed any other changes. Returning to the team slot, he placed the newly fused Sasuke Uchiha there. Ding! Do you wish to place Sasuke Uchiha back in his original position or within 3 meters of Charles Doyle? Place in the original position. Ding. 
placement successful. The Sasuke Uchiha who had disappeared for just a few seconds reappeared on his room. The Sasuke Uchiha who had previously fallen asleep instantly sat up. He surveyed his surroundings and then, the next moment, as Sasuke opened his eyes again, the two Tomo Sharingan appeared in his eyes. Sensing the activation of the Sharingan, Sasuke murmured, Thank you, Lord Charles. When Sasuke Uchiha was initially brought into this world by Charles, he had been quite panicked. He couldn't activate his two Tomo Sharingan for some reason. It wasn't just the two Tomo, even a single Tomo was unattainable, as if he had returned to the time before his Sharingan awakening. During this time, Charles had explained the reasons, but Sasuke couldn't get over it easily. For Uchiha clan members, losing the Sharingan after awakening, it was a torment that could drive them insane. It wasn't until Charles informed him that once he was brought back from different points in time, his Sharingan would recover through the fusion of memories. But he hadn't anticipated that, after asking Lord Charles for help today, his Sharingan would return. Perhaps Lord Charles's attempt to bring back his parents or clan members hadn't succeeded, but he had managed to bring back his Sharingan. However, the only thing that puzzled Sasuke was that he hadn't felt like he had gained any other memories. He only felt that his body had become stronger, and his chakra more abundant. Unable to understand, Sasuke didn't think about it further and just continued to rest. At this moment, Charles Doyle has no intention of resting. After exiting the system interface, he stood up and went to the bathroom mirror. Sharingan. In the next moment, a pair of two Tomo Sharingan appeared in Charles's eyes. Looking at his reflection in the mirror, Charles murmured, Can I call myself Uchiha now? After experiencing the abilities of the two Tomo Sharingan and posing for a while in front of the mirror, Charles closed the Sharingan. He knew the Sharingan he possessed is just a skill, not the actual Uchiha bloodline. Charles thought, skills are better. This way, I can experience all the Manjiku Sharingan abilities of Kakashi, Itachi, Abito, and even Madara. These various Manjiku Sharingan special abilities could all be gathered within him. Thinking about having so many Manjiku abilities, Charles's lips involuntarily curved into a smile. After all, for a fan of Naruto, having the chance to personally experience so many Manjiku abilities would surely bring a smile to anyone's face. After toying around for a while, Charles Doyle returned to his bed to rest. Luckily, he was in a hotel room, and he was the only one present. Otherwise, it would be hard for anyone to imagine that this man, currently afflicted with Chinibu disease, is the legendary assassin Charles Doyle. Next day, the morning sun shone into Charles's room. The first thing he did upon waking up was to say, System, check in. Ding. Check in successful. You've received 5,000 copper coins. After getting up and freshening up, Charles joined Ginny and the others in the hotel's dining area for breakfast. Charles, how do you plan to deal with the bounty issue? Ginny asked curiously as she ate her breakfast. It wasn't just Ginny, Rock Lee, Sasuke Uchiha, and Irika Yumino also paused their meals, looking at Charles Doyle. Though they weren't afraid of assassination themselves, they were curious to hear Charles's plan. If there was any way they could be of assistance, they were willing to lend a hand. Meeting their expectant gazes, Charles took a sip of milk before saying, Kill. Kill until they shiver in fear, until they dare not take any more missions. Although Charles's tone wasn't fierce at all, a solemn and murderous aura emanated from him. The assassins who were having breakfast instantly stopped their actions, and the entire dining area fell silent. Seeing the hushed dining area, Ginny didn't mind and smiled at Charles. I hope there won't be too many fools knocking on our doors. Otherwise, I'm afraid the assassins from the Continental Hotel won't be enough to take all the other contracts. Irika chimed in, if there are too many contracts, they can come to our office. After all, we're in need of missions. For a qualified ninja, especially someone like Irika who was in charge of the office, more missions were always better. Arriving in this new world, Irika was interested in many novel things, which led to a significant consumption of his funds. Hearing Irika's words, Charles chuckled. Don't worry, our missions will become more and more plentiful in the future. The assassins present in the dining area listened to the conversation between Charles and his group. Some had serious expressions, while others showed disdain. However, everyone present acknowledged Charles Doyle's strength. 
After finishing breakfast, Charles led the group to the mission hall of the Continental Hotel. At this moment, there weren't many people in the mission hall, even to the point of being sparse. Only a few staff members were present, and there were only a handful of assassins. After all, it was quite rare for assassins to show up in the early morning to check bounties. The group found a round table and sat down, looking at the huge electronic screen on the wall that displayed real-time scrolling updates of information. This was the Continental Hotel's freed mission area. As long as one was a registered member of the Continental Hotel, they could take on missions listed there. One only needed to pay one gold coin, and anyone could post a bounty mission in the free area. However, the mission issuer needed to deposit the bounty amount into the designated account of the Continental Hotel. After completing the mission, the commission would be distributed by the Continental Hotel. The advantage was that even if the mission issuer died, the assassins who completed the task wouldn't have to worry about not receiving the reward. The assassins only needed to pay a 10% commission from the bounty. In addition to the free mission area, the Continental Hotel also had a bounty leaderboard that listed the top 10 individuals with the highest bounties. Unfortunately, Charles and his group's bounty had been divided among five people, otherwise, with a 10 million bounty, Charles would have easily secured the first position. As for the expulsion list, not a single person was on it. Until now, no one had managed to stay on the expulsion list for long, as deceased individuals didn't qualify to be listed. Looking at the expulsion list, Charles knew that John Wick's name would soon be on it, becoming the only person to get off the list alive. Observing the sparsely populated mission hall, Ginny couldn't help but ask, Charles, why are we here? To wait, wait for more people to arrive. Hearing Charles's answer, Ginny didn't ask further, and the five of them waited together. Soon, news about Charles Doyle's group appearing in the Continental Hotel's mission hall spread. Assassins who received the news began to gather towards the mission hall. Some came to watch the excitement, while others wanted to see how Charles would handle the situation. There were even some who considered coming to confirm Charles's whereabouts, intending to strike when Charles's group leaves the Continental Hotel. For more chapters, 35 plus p at trian.com slash gets a time passed second by second, and soon many assassins arrived in the hall. Although the assassins present were engaged in conversations, their peripheral vision never left Charles Doyle's table. Seeing that there were about enough people present, Charles stood up and walked towards the large screen displaying the bounty missions. As Charles Doyle stood up, all eyes were drawn to him. As he moved, the gazes of the people followed him. Ascending the steps and approaching the bounty screen, Charles pointed at the reward posted by Sloan using a shuriken and began to speak, the Continental Hotel has gathered 80% of New York's assassins. I wonder how many people are here in the mission hall today. I know that many of you came for this bounty mission. Charles paused for a moment and then continued in a loud voice, Charles Doyle, am here to tell you today, to tell all the assassins in New York, that this is a provocation from Sloan. Last night, the Assassin Brotherhood was eradicated by my hands. At this moment, Charles's gaze swept across the people present. Some assassins who met his gaze immediately took off their hats and placed them over their chests as a sign of respect. Those without hats placed their right hands over their left chests, showing respect to Charles Doyle. This was the treatment that a legendary assassin deserved. However, there were also some people whose gazes wavered under Charles's gaze, avoiding his eyes. They didn't know what the Assassin Brotherhood was, but they harbored fantasies of making a name for themselves and stepping on the bodies of Charles and his companions to claim the bounty. After surveying the crowd, Charles continued, The existence of this bounty is still a provocation against me. I respect the rules of the Continental Hotel and won't ask for the bounty to be removed. But I want to tell you all, to tell everyone interested in this bounty. In one hour, I will leave the Continental Hotel. I'll be waiting for those who want the bounty at the three-way intersection outside the hotel. I, Charles, will show no mercy, and I won't hold back. Anyone who dares to make a move against me will not survive. But this is your only chance. Before 6 p.m., all assassins can act. I'll only target those who make a move. After dusk, anyone who dares to target me and the employees of Charles' agency, whether it's your faction behind you or your family, will face destruction. Charles's voice was powerful and resolute, especially when he said the last three words. His entire body emitted a killing intent that pervaded the mission hall. 
Seeing Charles Doyle speaking before the bounty mission, Ginny looked at him with admiration. This man was too manly, too charismatic. She really liked him. Charles saw that the many assassins present had grasped his intention and understood that they should meet in an hour. He then stepped down and returned to his seat. After Charles Doyle returned to his seat, the mission hall resumed its normal buzz. Many assassins took out their phones and sent messages. Some assassins were afraid that messages might not convey everything, so they directly made phone calls. They wanted to spread Charles Doyle's words. Especially the news that Charles Doyle had wiped out the Assassin Brotherhood was the most critical information being spread. Charles Doyle, back with his companions, glanced at the infatuated Ginny and said, Later, we'll wait together at the three-way intersection outside the Continental Hotel. If anyone makes a move, kill them. He then looked at the three ninjas and spoke to Ginny, I'm not worried about those three, but you. Make sure to put on a bulletproof vest, and bring enough bullets. I don't want anything happening to you. Charles was somewhat helpless about the Assassin Brotherhood members not wearing bulletproof vests. Although they were skilled marksmen, in a real fight, stray bullets weren't considerate. Given Ginny's abilities, there was still some danger. Ginny patted her leather jacket and said, custom made by the Continental Hotel, bulletproof version. Examining Ginny's bulletproof jacket, Charles pondered for a moment and continued, Irica, later you three will form a defensive formation to protect Ginny. For Charles, this demonstration of power had to be a resounding success, with no room for failure. He also couldn't allow any casualties among his team. He aimed to resolve this matter flawlessly. Hearing Charles's instructions, Irika, Rock Lee, and Uchiha Sasuke all agreed and assured Charles that they had it under control. Looking at the bustling crowd of assassins in the hall, Charles took out his phone, dialed Winston's number, and made the call. Winston, I need the Continental Hotel to provide a service. Seal off the area within a 500-meter radius from the three-way intersection outside the hotel for six hours. No one other than assassins should be allowed to pass through. Anyone appearing outside the hotel later would be Charles's enemy. When the time came, he would charge forward and eliminate them. Winston, who was on the top floor of the hotel at the moment, pondered for a moment before speaking, Charles, from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m., these six hours, the Continental Hotel can provide you with a ceiling service. But it will require ten gold coins. Upon hearing the price of ten gold coins, Charles had no objections and agreed to Winston's terms. Just as Charles hung up the phone, a man approached. It was none other than John Wick. Charles, are you sure you don't need my help? Six hours isn't a short period of time. It's even enough for assassins from outside New York State to fly in. Evidently, John had also heard the news and rushed over immediately. He wanted to assist the man before him, not only to reclaim the Blood Oath medallion but also to repay the debt of saving his life. John, believe me, I can handle this on my own. Charles declined John's offer. For Charles, this matter was not only about establishing dominance but also about showcasing his strength and adding chips to his bargaining position for future endeavors. Seeing Charles's determination, John didn't argue further but also didn't leave the Continental Hotel. He wanted to stay here, partly to witness the outcome and partly to be ready for immediate rescue in case Charles encountered trouble. Time ticked away, second by second. Soon, the hour was nearly over. At this moment, Charles, accompanied by Ginny and four others, walked towards the outside of the Continental Hotel. Inside the hotel, many assassins watched as this group left. As Charles stepped out of the hotel gate and looked at the bustling street, he muttered, there really are a lot of foolish people out there. Upon reaching the street across from the hotel, Charles glanced at his watch. There was one minute left. Prepare for battle. As the clock's hand approached twelve o'clock, in the next moment. Sharingan, activate. For more chapters, 40 plus p at trian.com slash gets a Charles dash towards the nearest group of people. He's here. Kill him, shouted an assassin who was armed with a knife. A ninja blade appeared in Charles's hand, and he struck out, cutting down one assassin after another. Meanwhile, several assassins in the distance began firing their guns. Bang! 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 Bullets whizzed through the air, but Charles's Sharingan rapidly rotated in his eyes, allowing him to dodge the incoming bullets with ease. 
With a leap, he avoided the gunfire and swiftly delivered a flying kick to a nearby gunman. Boom! The African-American assassin with the gun was sent flying, crashing into a distant trash bin. He continued to fly for more than 10 meters before finally coming to a stop, lifeless. Charles turned around and charged towards another nearby assassin, beheading him before he could react. A massive head flew into the air, blood spraying everywhere. On the other side, Ginny wasn't idle either. She pulled out her specialized handguns from her backpack, dual-wielding them to initiate a merciless harvest. She aimed and fired at assassins in the distance, each bullet taking a life. Sasuke activated his two Tomo Sharingan, protecting Ginny from all sides. He used shuriken to deflect the bullets that came their way. If it weren't for Charles's instructions not to use ninjutsu, Sasuke would have activated Chidori and gone on a frenzy of decapitation. As for anyone who managed to get close, they couldn't withstand the assault of Rock Lee's fists and feet. Every move he made was a fatal one. Suddenly, a hand grenade was tossed towards Charles. However, before the grenade could get close, a shuriken was thrown, knocking the grenade back to its origin. Boom! The grenade exploded, sending shrapnel flying. The surrounding assassins were caught in the blast. Several assassins wounded by the shrapnel fell to the ground, one of them shouting in fear, Devil, he's a devil. It was Charles's crimson sharingan and his swift killing spree that left these few men utterly terrified. More shuriken flew out, finishing off those who were wounded, instantly quieting the scene. In just a minute, the area outside the Continental Hotel was in shambles. Shops and houses along the street were destroyed, and the ground was littered with dozens of corpses. Blood flowed, staining the black asphalt road with dark red. Inside the Continental Hotel, the numerous assassins stared at this scene in shock, immobilized. Someone who had been munching on an apple didn't even realize when the apple fell from his hand. A tall Russian assassin muttered with a wide open mouth, is this the strength of a legendary assassin? He was amazed by Charles's crimson sharingan and his effortless massacre, leaving him in awe. John Wick, who had been ready to rush in to assist, listened and felt bitter in his heart. Although I've retired, I was once known as the legendary assassin. But I don't have this kind of strength. No wonder he could annihilate the assassin brotherhood. No wonder he didn't need my help. At this moment, the assassins who had initially contemplated stepping out felt lucky that they hadn't crossed the Continental Hotel's threshold. They realized that Charles's strength was formidable, and his few subordinates were not to be trifled with either. Especially after witnessing Ginny's exceptional gunplay, some seasoned assassins secretly speculated whether Charles had eradicated the Assassin Brotherhood in a fit of rage because of her. This signature marksmanship was a skill known only to the Assassin Brotherhood. Soon, outside the Continental Hotel, aside from Charles's group, there was no one left alive. At this point, 500 meters away, assassins were still arriving. But as soon as they stepped within the perimeter, a shuriken suddenly flew out, piercing through their necks. They died inside the sealed area. Some assassins who hadn't yet entered the sealed area glanced at the dead man before them, then at the bloody scene within. Without looking back, they turned and left. At the three-way intersection outside the hotel, an eerie silence prevailed. Charles walked up to Ginny and the others, asking, everything all right? Ginny looked at the spotless man before her and chuckled, Charles, you're too powerful. We barely had to do anything, and all the enemies were wiped out. I haven't even finished a single magazine of bullets. As she spoke, Ginny raised her dual handguns. Seeing Ginny was fine, Charles's worries were put to rest. As for the other three ninjas, they hadn't suffered any injuries either. The intensity of the battle was disappointingly low, it ended before they even had a chance to warm up. Looking at the vacant street, Ginny asked, Charles, are we just going to stand here until evening? After glancing at everyone and then at the direction of the Continental Hotel, Charles walked towards the hotel. As Charles approached, the many assassins standing at the hotel's entrance instinctively took a step back, nearly causing a commotion. They thought Charles was going to storm in. However, they soon remembered the rules of the Continental Hotel and calmed down. At the hotel entrance, Charles didn't go inside. Instead, he said, John, bring out a set of tables, chairs, and stools for me. I'll wait outside to see if there are any stragglers who want to join the party. 
I'll be happy to send them to hell. John didn't respond immediately but looked towards Winston inside the hotel. Upon seeing John's gaze, Winston said, Sharon, bring Mr. Charles Doyle a set of tables and chairs, along with some fruits and pastries. Sharon quickly left the service counter, accompanied by a few other staff members, to arrange the tables and chairs for Charles's group. They also brought fruits and pastries. However, the chaotic mess of bodies outside and the lingering smell of blood made it hard for anyone to have an appetite. After the hotel staff left, the group sat down, but the sight of the disarray outside and the smell of blood in the air dampened their appetite. Charles said, Ginny, you take the left intersection. If anyone crosses the 500-meter blockade line, shoot them down. Ginny picked up her handgun and grinned, leave it to me. No problem. Sasuke, you take the right intersection. Meters isn't an issue, right? Sasuke placed a few shuriken on the table and maintained a cool expression. Don't worry, Lord Charles. I won't let anyone make it to you alive. Charles then sat down, creating a makeshift table in the middle of the three-way intersection. Ginny, Sasuke, and Charles each took charge of one direction. They were ready to eliminate anyone who crossed the 500-meter blockade line. Meanwhile, Rock Lee, who hadn't been assigned a position, found a relatively clean spot and started practicing his physical techniques. Clearly, none of them had any intention of treating this place as a battlefield. These assassins weren't qualified and weren't worthy of being their enemies. For more chapters, 40 plus p at trian.com slash getza the evening arrived quickly. At the beginning, there were still some assassins who were lagging behind in receiving information or were overconfident in their own strength. They ventured into the blockade area to try and earn the bounty. However, as time went on, whether due to word spreading or the accumulation of bodies at the edge of the blockade area, no assassin dared to step inside anymore. Instead, there were quite a few assassins who approached the perimeter, observed the battlefield, and left, as if to verify the accuracy of the information. By the time it was 6 p.m., the designated time, no more assassins appeared. With the conclusion of the event, Charles Doyle's name once again resounded throughout the assassin world. Not only did he become renowned in the New York assassin circles, but his reputation also spread throughout the entire assassin community. This event was marked as the Charles Incident. After this event, the Continental Hotel in New York revoked the membership of nearly a hundred assassins. However, these members weren't removed due to being expelled from the mainland but because they had all perished. The legendary assassin, Charles Doyle, gained the title of the number one assassin in New York. Inside the Continental Hotel, Winston looked at the bounty information for Charles Doyle's group. He wrote something on a piece of paper and handed it to his subordinate. Soon after, Charles and his companions' bounties were no longer displayed in the scrolling task information. However, the bounties were still in effect. Lowering the visibility of the bounties was within Winston's power, but cancelling them required the action of the issuer. No one else, not even Winston, the owner of the New York Continental Hotel, could violate this rule. As evening fell, Charles Doyle was having a conversation with Ginny in a room inside the Continental Hotel. Ginny, we need to arrange for the office's renovation as soon as possible. We can't afford to be closed for too long. Also, check with our neighbors next door to see if they're interested in selling. I'm planning to expand our indoor training facility. As for the current training area, we can convert it into a recovery room. Listening to Charles's plans, Ginny thought for a moment before speaking, Boss, have you considered building the training facility in the suburbs? It would be much more cost effective. Charles, perplexed, asked, Ginny, are we short on money? Boss, we still have $20 million in the company's account, including the $6 million we received just the day before yesterday. If we acquire the property next door, the cost will be much higher. If you go to the suburbs, you could use the same amount of money to buy an estate and a large piece of land. As a capable secretary, Ginny naturally offered reasonable suggestions. After considering for a moment, Charles felt that separating the office and training facility too far wasn't necessary. He replied, for now, let's proceed with purchasing the property next door. As for the suburbs, it's not a consideration at the moment. Ginny, I also have a batch of gold and jewelry from the last time we obtained them from Vigo. I'll hand them over to you, and you can decide what to do with them. 
Upon hearing Charles's instructions, Ginny sighed and said, You're the boss, and your word is final. As for the sale of the gold and jewelry, I'll take care of it as soon as possible. As Ginny turned to leave the room, Charles reminded her, Don't forget about John Wick's matter. Understood, boss. Without turning back, Ginny, in her high heels, swayed out of Charles's room. The next day, the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division, SHIELD, Main Building, 2 Phil Coulson, an agent whose hairline hadn't receded yet, was holding a tablet as he hurriedly made his way to the director's office. Director, this is the latest report of unusual activity. Take a look. Nick Fury took the tablet that Phil Coulson handed over. The screen displayed a video, and he clicked to play it. In the video, an Asian teenager swiftly approached a woman holding a gun. With incredible speed, he delivered a punch that sent her flying, causing her to crash into a lamppost. After watching the video, Nick Fury's voice grew solemn. When did this incident occur? Three days ago. Nick Fury played the video again, focusing on the speed of the man in the footage and how he sent someone flying with a punch. It wasn't just throwing someone, it was sending them flying, and there was a significant difference between the two. Especially in the video, the Asian teenager appeared to be quite young. Coulson, have we obtained any information on the identity of the Asian teenager in the video? Upon hearing Director Fury's question, Phil Coulson immediately replied, Director, the teenager in the video is named Rock Lee. He's 13 years old and lives at 71, Forest Hills Avenue, Queens. The information on his identity was processed through the Continental Hotel. However, we couldn't find any information on him from birth until the age of 13. Listening to Coulson's report, Nick Fury stood up from his chair, rubbed his chin, and pondered for a moment before asking, is he an assassin? Coulson nodded and continued, according to the information we've gathered, Rock Lee's identity information was arranged by Charles Doyle through the Continental Hotel. And Charles Doyle is a registered member of the Continental Hotel, known as a legendary assassin in the assassin world. He has a firm which is one of his businesses and also serves as a platform for external tasks. Upon hearing that Charles Doyle was a legendary assassin, Nick Fury's expression was slightly disdainful. In his eyes, an assassin was nothing more than a rat in the gutter. Seeing the slightly dismissive look on the director's face, Coulson emphasized, we've just received the latest news that Charles Doyle recently eradicated the Assassin Brotherhood two days ago. Upon hearing that the Assassin Brotherhood had been wiped out by Charles Doyle, Nick Fury was somewhat surprised. However, he still didn't attach much importance to it. What caught his interest was the 13-year-old Asian teenager. He saw potential in him. With proper grooming and training, he could become a valuable asset. Coulson, take the video to the intelligence department. Have them analyze the speed and strength of the young man in the footage. Once confirmed, proceed with gathering information and assessing the threat level. Lastly, I'm assigning you a task. If everything all right in terms of his age, attempt to make contact with the target. He's just a child, tagging along with an assassin. What's that about? If possible, consider bringing him to our academy. Let him attend school. A 13-year-old child should be in school, focusing on his education. Nick Fury's words sounded righteous. But whether it was a regular school or a special agent academy, he has already decided. After receiving the assignment, Coulson greeted Director Fury and then left the director's office. Three days had passed since the Charles incident. Charles Doyle stood in the lobby of his agency, gazing at the newly renovated and reopened establishment. He nodded in satisfaction. Within three days, the damaged furnishings had been repaired. The efficiency impressed him. Boss, we've tested the formula for the healing bath, and there are no issues, Ginny reported as she approached Charles. Charles smiled and said, Great. Since the healing bath is good to go, let's start setting up the recovery room. Boss, the owner of the neighboring property isn't in New York at the moment. They'll only be back next week to discuss. It might take some time for the recovery room to be sorted out. However, we can temporarily modify one of the rooms. It can be used for recovery when someone is injured. Charles nodded and replied, Okay, go ahead and arrange it. I'm going to the storage room. The storage room was located on the basement level. It was a vault created by Charles 
containing some cash and other equipment. Upon entering the storage room, Charles waved his hand, and a box of gold and a box of jewelry that he had stashed away in his storage space appeared before him. Glancing at the firearms and ammunition hanging on the storage room wall, Charles shook his head. He hadn't used these things much in the past three years. After closing the storage room, he returned to the main floor. He cast a look at Yumino Irika, who was sitting in the lobby, and walked over to him. Hi Irika, where are Sasuke and Rock Lee? Irika stood up respectfully upon seeing Charles and said, Lord Charles, Rock Lee and Sasuke are sparring in the training room. Charles smiled and said, Irika, as I've told you before, you don't need to be so formal. You're always so respectful. When Rock Lee and Sasuke are done, you can let them know that the healing bath has been tested and can be used for physical recovery. Irika was elated. Lord Charles, that's fantastic news. While technology is advanced here, the recovery process is still too slow. We don't have medical ninjas here, so this healing bath is a great supplement. Just as Charles was about to say something else, Ginny rushed over and immediately spoke up, Boss, there's news about John Wick, the one you asked me to keep an eye on. Exactly as you anticipated, his house was bombed by Santino D'Antonio. Boss, how did you know in advance that John's house would be targeted? Hearing Ginny's words about John Wick's house being bombed, Charles knew that once John completed the blood oath for Santino D'Antonio and then killed him at the Continental Hotel, violating the rules of the Continental Hotel, he would lose his membership and face expulsion. This meant he would have the chance to intervene in the High Table's affairs. Charles smiled and said, I had a hunch. Upon hearing Charles's casual response, Ginny rolled her eyes and asked, Since you already knew about it, what's the plan now? Charles grinned mysteriously. Wait. Wait for the right time. Seeing Charles playing coy, Ginny turned to leave. Charles spoke again, Ginny, I've already stored the jewelry in gold in the vault below. Make sure to sell them off early. Understood, boss. On the other side, John Wick arrived at the Continental Hotel with his newly adopted Staffordshire Bull Terrier. He headed straight for the hotel service desk and approached Sharon, saying, I'd like to see the hotel manager. Sharon looked at John Wick before him and greeted, It's a pleasure to see you again so soon, Mr. Wick. Do you want me to inform Winston? John glanced at his Staffordshire Bull Terrier and then back at Sharon. Yes, please. Thank you. He then turned to his Staffordshire Bull Terrier and commanded, Sit. Seeing the obedient dog sit down, John Wick proceeded to head upstairs in the hotel. After John Wick left, Sharon picked up the phone and dialed a number. Sir, Mr. Wick is here. Hanging up the phone, Sharon looked at the dog and sighed in relief, thinking, I wonder who's the fool that's angered John Wick again. On the hotel's garden terrace, John Wick's first words to Winston were, Where is he? Winston didn't immediately address John Wick. Instead, he stood up and politely saw off his guest who had just here. Once the guest was gone, Winston turned his attention to the man before him and said, Why are you here, John? He bombed my house. Winston's expression remained unchanged as he remarked, You declined his blood oath. He merely bombed your house. Consider yourself lucky. What were you thinking? To give a blood oath to someone like Santino D'Antonio. John Wick replied, It was the only way for me to retire. Winston shook his head with a touch of exasperation and continued, Do you consider this retirement? What do you think will happen? What are you expecting? Do you truly believe this day would never come? Don't forget, a few days ago, you just gave a blood oath medallion to Charles Doyle. Hearing Winston mention the blood oath medallion given to Charles Doyle, John Wick felt a bit frustrated. He turned away and didn't meet Winston's gaze. Seeing John's discomfort, Winston carried on, Why did Santino D'Antonio approach you? I didn't ask. I refused him directly. Winston shook his head helplessly and said, So, when Charles Doyle comes to you with a blood oath, are you also planning to respond in the same way? Guess so. You should know what the consequences would be if you played him. John Wick replied, If Charles comes to me, I'll honor my blood oath promise. He saved my life. Hearing two different answers from John, Winston couldn't help but feel speechless. Refuse a blood oath request from Santino D'Antonio but be willing to assist a few days ago when Charles didn't ask you for anything. 
John Wick really shouldn't be so inconsistent in his actions. Winston extended two fingers and said in a very helpless tone, John, the Continental Hotel has two rules that must be followed. The Continental doesn't allow bloodshed. No blood oaths are to be desecrated. While I could reduce your punishment to exile for now, if tradition is broken, the high table won't spare you easily. John Wick looked at Winston, his voice low, do I have no other choice? Winston's expression turned solemn, and he spoke each word distinctly, desecrate the oath, death. Kill an oath maker, death. Run away, death. After a brief pause, Winston continued, John, these were the conditions you accepted. Only if you do as he says can you redeem yourself. Once you fulfill the blood oath, if you want to track him and burn his house, feel free. But until then. John Wick said two words, the rules. Winston smiled and said, exactly, follow the rules. Without rules, what distinguishes us from animals? For more chapters, 40 plus p at trian.com slash gets at Charles's office at this moment, after giving some instructions to Yumino Irica, Charles Doyle was getting ready to leave. Suddenly, the bell on the door rang, and a middle-aged man in a suit with a faint smile on his face entered the office. Both Charles and Irica shifted their gazes towards the newcomer. Seeing the man's face clearly, Charles's pupils slightly contracted, and he thought to himself, why would an agent from the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement and Logistics Division come looking for me? He remembered the massacre outside the Continental Hotel, which Winston had sealed off and cut off nearby surveillance footage on the same day. Moreover, given his demonstrated capabilities, it shouldn't warrant someone to come in person, especially not this man known as that nice guy, Phil Coulson, from S.H.I.E.L.D. Coulson walked all the way to the front desk of the office. After glancing at Charles and then at Irica, he finally approached Charles Doyle. He spoke slowly, Mr. Charles Doyle, there are some matters that need to be discussed with you. I am Phil Coulson, an agent of the FBI. Here's my identification. As he spoke, Coulson took out an FBI identification card from his pocket and showed it to Charles. Seeing the FBI identification card, Charles couldn't help but feel speechless. It seemed that no matter what department they were from, they always used the FBI to conceal their identities. Charles remained composed, his expression calm. He said, Mr. Agent from the FBI, may I ask what business you have with me? Coulson looked at the lobby and smiled. Mr. Charles Doyle, I don't think it would be appropriate to discuss matters here. Charles shrugged, indicating that he had no objection, and then said, We have a meeting room. Let's go there. Irica, bring me a glass of black jack, Charles said as he looked towards Coulson. And you, agent, would you like something? Coffee, please. Thank you. Following Charles, Coulson entered the conference room and sat down. Irica promptly brought the beverages and closed the room's door behind him as he left. Taking a sip of the whiskey in his glass, Charles looked at Coulson and said, go ahead and tell me what you need. Normally, your department wouldn't have any business with me. Coulson stirred the coffee in his cup with a small spoon and then spoke slowly, Mr. Charles Doyle, I'd like to meet a child here named Rock Lee. May I? Upon hearing Coulson mention Rock Lee's name, Charles knew that S.H.I.E.L.D. wasn't here for him but rather for Lee. However, he didn't know the reason why Lee had drawn the attention of S.H.I.E.L.D. Looking at Coulson, Charles spoke calmly, Mr. Coulson, Rock Lee is just a child. I'm not sure what could make an agent pay a visit for him. I am Rock Lee's guardian. You can communicate with me. I believe federal law wouldn't allow a conversation to happen between a child and an agent without involving their guardian. Hearing Charles allude to federal law, Coulson knew that the man before him wasn't just a simple hitman. Mr. Charles, I'm sure I don't need to say who you are and what your background is. Rock Lee's identity has issues, and based on your circumstances, you can't become his guardian. Rock Lee is just a child. He shouldn't be involved in such a life. He needs a peaceful and healthy environment. Listening to Coulson's words, Charles didn't immediately respond. He picked up the glass of black jack from the table, took a sip, and then stared at him. Seeing Charles remain silent, Coulson continued, Mr. Charles, we've done some research on your background before coming here. You were adopted by someone yourself, and that's how you ended up on your current path. If, and I emphasize if, you hadn't met that couple back then, 
your life might not be what it is today. Now, Rock Lee is like you back then. I hope you can entrust him to us, to the government, to give him a healthy and happy environment to grow up in. Listening to Coulson's words, Charles couldn't help but find it amusing. S.H.I.E.L.D. has certainly done their homework thoroughly, even finding information about his adoption. They seem to want him to empathize and hand Rock Lee over to them for a better life. Charles looked at Coulson with a serious expression and said, Why have you targeted Rock Lee? Is FBI supposed to deal with children's matters? Do you want Rock Lee to become an agent? An operative? Or something like you? After Charles fired off three questions, Coulson lifted his coffee and took a sip. Then he continued, Mr. Charles, we're just here to discuss matters with you for now. But you should understand that if the FBI wants to, your guardian status can be revoked at any time. This includes your agency here and even yourself. We have the authority and capability to shut down your agency and detain you. However, we're here to communicate at the moment, so please understand that I've come with good intentions. So, Mr. Charles Doyle, can you allow me to meet this child named Rock Lee now? Although Coulson was a nice guy, it depended on whom he was dealing with. Given Charles's profession as an assassin, the fact that they didn't immediately arrest him was already a sign of his leniency. Hearing Coulson's words, Charles internally found it ironic. Shield was still up to their usual antics. Charles's expression changed, and he slammed the table, his anger flaring. Coulson, are you threatening me? Threatening a law-abiding citizen who pays their taxes on time. Whether you believe it or not, based on what you just said, I can sue you with the help of a lawyer. The smile on Coulson's face vanished as he looked deeply at Charles and said slowly, Charles Doyle, you should know that I'm not joking. Looking at the man before him, Charles's anger still evident on his face, he said, what can you achieve by meeting him? Rock Lee won't leave with you. Coulson lightly tapped his coffee cup with a spoon and slowly said, Mr. Charles, that's a separate matter. Right now, I want to meet this child named Rock Lee. Is there a problem with that? Do I need to show you a subpoena and a search warrant? Looking at Coulson before him, Charles couldn't help but realize that the image of the kind-hearted man from the movies didn't align with the reality. Movies were movies, and reality was reality. The question is, do you really have the capability to take Rock Lee away? As long as he wanted, he could recall Rock Lee to the system space from anywhere. He just needed to remove Rock Lee's character card from the battle slot. He was curious to see what Coulson, this seasoned agent, could get from Rock Lee. After all, he held the initiative all along. Charles picked up a button from the table in the meeting room and pressed it. In just a few seconds, a knocking sound came from the meeting room's door. The next moment, Yumino Irika walked in. Irika, bring Rock Lee over here. Upon hearing Charles's command, Irika didn't say anything, turned around, and left the meeting room. Seeing Charles act this way, Coulson nodded in satisfaction. A hitman, even if he's a legendary one in New York, what can he do? After a few minutes, the door was knocked again, and Irika entered with Rock Lee. Lord Charles, did you call for me? Rock Lee walked in, with a smile on his face. He thought there was a new mission for him. Charles waved his hand and said, Lee, come sit here. This gentleman has something to discuss with you. Seeing Irika leave, Coulson looked at Rock Lee's attire and curiously asked, Rock Lee, do you admire Bruce Lee? Hearing Coulson's words, Rock Lee was somewhat unsure. Sir, who are you talking about? Coulson gestured with his hands and said, Bruce Lee, Kung Fu Master. Rock Lee still looked puzzled, but with certainty, he said, Sir, I don't know who you're talking about. Hearing Rock Lee's response, Coulson uncertainly asked, Then, this outfit of yours? It really resembles Bruce Lee, just the colors are a bit different. Rock Lee looked at the man before him and explained, Sir, this outfit was a gift from my master. I like it and admire him a lot, but I don't know who you're referring to. Clearly, he's not my master. Hearing the mention of a master, a thought flashed through Coulson's mind. Puzzled, he asked, Master. Charles. Charles was watching Coulson's performance, not saying anything. He hadn't stopped Rock Lee from mentioning his master, after all, who knows, maybe Guy would actually come out one day. Rock Lee shook his head and clarified, no, it's not Lord Charles. He's my own master. 
I wonder, sir, what business you have with me? Is there a task you want to entrust to me? When Rock Lee mentioned a task, he appeared excited and full of youthful vigor. Upon hearing Rock Lee's mention of a task, Coulson glanced at Charles deeply, considering it unethical to involve a child in missions. Coulson's smile, which was friendly and comforting, appeared on his face again, and he said, Rock Lee, would you like to return to school? To live the life of an ordinary child, carefree and focused on studies. Rock Lee said helplessly, Sir, I've already graduated, and it's been over a year since I graduated. I won't be returning to school for further studies. Coulson, who had been full of confidence, was taken aback by Rock Lee's words. He graduated. Seeing the 13-year-old Rock Lee, Coulson wanted to explain about the school he mentioned and the life he described. But before he could speak, Charles stood up and said, Mr. Coulson, you can talk to Rock Lee. When you're done, I'll be waiting outside. After saying that, Charles left the meeting room. He didn't want to listen any further. Coulson's strategy wasn't wrong, but his target was off. Trying to convince a ninja to go back to school was futile. Even if he had a tailored approach, Coulson still couldn't sway Rock Lee. In fact, just a moment ago, Charles had considered letting Rock Lee go with Coulson, infiltrate Shield's interior, and gather information for him, not just about the Tesseract's location, but also about the energy cube derived from the Tesseract. He wanted to see if this thing could be recharged. But Rock Lee was just a child. What difference would it make even if he went? He would still have to enter Shield's Academy for special agents. By the time he graduated and was qualified to handle those things, it would be too late. Charles also let go of this thought. When the time was ripe and his strength was sufficient, he would just snatch the Tesseract from Loki when he descends. Seeing Charles come out, Irika stood up and asked, Lord Charles, is everything settled? Not yet. This person wants to talk to Rock Lee, and they're still chatting. Upon hearing that things weren't settled, Irika continued, Lord Charles, since that man arrived, we've been under surveillance. I sense the presence of danger. It seems more than one gun is aimed at our agency. I'm not sure if these people are here with this investigator or if they are bounty hunters. That's why I didn't apprehend them. Hearing Irika talk about surveillance and gunmen outside, Charles didn't pay much attention and said, they're all here to protect this FBI agent. No need to worry. Hearing Charles's assurance, Irika didn't say anything either, and the two of them started chatting outside. About half an hour later, the door to the meeting room opened. At this moment, Coulson's face no longer held the friendly smile that had given people a good impression. He felt helpless. After talking for so long, he felt like he and Rock Lee were on different wavelengths. He didn't even gain much information, he only learned that the other had a master who was teaching him martial arts. The master wasn't around right now, but he would be in the future. Other than that, he didn't get much information. This kid was cautious, more like someone sent from a special academy rather than an ordinary person. Especially those hidden cameras and recording devices on him, he felt like the other party had discovered them. Because Rock Lee had been staring at certain spots for a long time, as if contemplating whether or not to bring them up. Coulson came to face Charles and said, Rock Lee isn't willing to come with me, and he has his own idea. But I won't give up easily on this. Perhaps one day, I'll come back. In Coulson's mind, Rock Lee's master was Charles. Seeing Coulson hadn't given up, Charles said, I told you before, Lee won't go with you. You should give up on this plan. Goodbye, Mr. Charles. Coulson didn't say much more and left Charles's agency. Once outside, Coulson went to his car. There wasn't only him in the car, Melinda May was also sitting inside. May, the video and audio were transmitted in real time. What do you think about our conversation? May took off her earpiece and said slowly, This legendary hitman, Charles, doesn't care about us. Or rather, he doesn't care about the FBI. And he's very confident. He knows Rock Lee won't go with you. Also, this Charles agency isn't simple. That Asian guy named Irika realized we were surveilling. When you were talking, he walked out of the door and deliberately glanced at the direction our snipers were stationed. Moreover, he didn't show any panic. It's as if he's not concerned about being targeted. Hearing May's words, Coulson thought about Charles's attitude and his reactions when Coulson threatened him. 
Helplessly, he said, let's go back first and report to the director. Let's see how he wants to handle it. At the same time, leave a team to monitor the target. For more chapters, 45 plus p at trian.com slash getsa with Coulson's departure, Charles's agency returned to its usual calm. Charles didn't bother to deal with the surveillance personnel stationed outside. A bunch of pigs, they could stare all they want. Right now, he had other things to do and didn't want to stir up Shield's hornet's nest like this. But if they didn't know their place, Charles wouldn't mind sending them to hell to rest. Although Charles's agency had only been open for three days, they hadn't received any mission requests. Instead, the focus had been on the renovation, which had been ongoing for six days. During this time, Charles persisted in daily check-ins and finally obtained another ninja recruitment scroll. As for the other rewards, 3 times 5,000 copper coins and 2 times 200 reputation points. At this point, Charles had accumulated 7,896 reputation points, 2 million copper coins, 1058 gold coins, and a ninja recruitment scroll. Charles thought to himself, when I reach 10,000 reputation point, I'll upgrade AODA. Speaking of which, I haven't summoned AODA for communication yet. After closing the system page, Charles was about to leave home and head to the agency when a message appeared on his phone. Sender's name unknown, public bounty, John Wick, $7 million. Seeing this message, Charles knew that John had killed Gianna D'Antonio, the head of the Camorra and a high table member. Any assassin registered at the Continental Hotel received this public bounty. Looking at the information on it, many assassins were left speechless. The legendary assassin, Charles Doyle, had also been the subject of a public bounty, but the reward had been a mere $2 million. Outside the Continental Hotel, it had been a scene of carnage with bodies and blood everywhere. This time, it was a much more serious public bounty contract, targeting the former legendary assassin, Night Devil. A public bounty and a public contract for assassination were two entirely different things. The former was just one of the many bounty tasks in the Continental Hotel's mission list, while the latter was directly sent to the hands of every assassin. Some of the newer assassins who didn't understand John's strength chose to abandon the task. After all, both were legendary assassins. Charles Doyle's reputation had been confirmed three days ago, and it was safe to assume that this former legend wouldn't be any weaker. On the other hand, some experienced assassins who had encountered John Wick's skills before became interested in this task. After all, although John was powerful, his abilities were within their scope. He could be wounded if shot and killed with a headshot. What's more, John Wick wasn't capable of slicing bullets in half. Seven million dollars was enough for them to take the risk. Just as Charles was about to leave home, his phone rang again. Boss, John Wick, whom you saved once before, is on the bounty list again, and it's a public contract for assassination. The reward has now reached $7 million. His value has increased really quickly. Boss, your investment in him might go to waste. Charles smiled and said, Ginny, don't worry. My investment won't be in vain, and he won't die. Boss, as long as you're confident. I just wanted to remind you. Also, Carlos sent $4 million to us. He wanted me to tell you that he's managed to locate Sloan's cash, but he can't access the money in his bank accounts, including the other Brotherhood members. None of the funds in their bank accounts can be accessed. Hearing that more money had come in, Charles laughed and said, tell him I received his goodwill. If there are more tasks, remind him to contact Charles's agency. As for the money in the bank accounts, Charles didn't care. After all, money that couldn't be accessed was as good as non-existent. Hanging up the phone, Charles closed the door, got into his car, and drove to the Continental Hotel. Mr. Charles Doyle, it's a pleasure to see you again. Sharon greeted Charles respectfully. Charles smiled in response, Sharon, it's good to see you. Is the manager around? Sharon replied, he's been here the whole time. Do you need me to inform him? Charles chuckled, that would be great. Sharon picked up the phone and dialed, Sir, Mr. Charles Doyle would like to visit you. Okay. After hanging up, Sharon said, the manager is in the hotel dining area. You can find him there. Charles nodded and headed towards the dining area on the basement level. When he reached the dining area, he quickly spotted Winston, who was reading a newspaper. 
He walked over and sat down directly across from him. Winston folded the newspaper and placed it on the table after adjusting his glasses. He then slowly said, Charles, did you come for John's matter? Looking at the person in front of him, the master of the Continental Hotel in New York, Charles Doyle slowly spoke, Santino D'Antonio is unethical. Right after John completed his blood oath, a bounty of $7 million was placed on him. Charles paused for a moment and continued, the most important thing is that John Wick must not die. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud, the blood oath badge I obtained must not go to waste. Seeing the earnest look on Charles's face, Winston thought to himself, the last sentence is what really matters. He then calmly said, issuing a bounty is a right held by every member of the Continental Hotel. Moreover, Santino D'Antonio has already inherited the family's position and become a member of the high table. He has privileges and it's reasonable to issue a bounty for him. Most importantly, Gianna D'Antonio was a member of the high table to begin with. If John kills a high table member, he will inevitably face repercussions from the high table. Anyone who kills a member of the high table will face consequences and even those who aid him. Charles smiled and said, Winston, don't forget about Gianna D'Antonio's identity. She was just a member of the high table, and a recent one at that. Even Santino D'Antonio, who has inherited the leadership of the Camorra, is just a high table member. They're not part of the high table's management, let alone one of the 13 seats. Besides, I don't believe that Santino, who took over the role of the murdered sister, can withstand John Wick's retaliation after angering him. After all, this guy burned John's house, the place where he and his loved one lived. Winston assessed Charles for a moment and curiously asked, you know John quite well. Charles smiled, Winston, bet or no bet, Santino D'Antonio will definitely seek refuge at the Continental Hotel. It'll happen tomorrow night. Looking at the confident Charles Doyle, Winston rose from his seat and said, I'm also full of confidence in John. Enjoy your time at the Continental Hotel, Mr. Charles. Watching Winston leave, Charles knew that he was going to reclaim the blood oath badge from Santino D'Antonio. At this moment, Charles Doyle thought to himself, it's coming, it's coming. The time is ripe. The high table, which has stood for countless years, should also have a change of leadership. For more chapters, 45 plus p at trian.com slash gets a triskelion building, in the office of Nick Fury, Director of the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division, SHIELD, Phil Coulson was reporting on the mission. Director, these are the psychological profiles and character assessments of both Charles Doyle and Rock Lee conducted by psychological experts. This is a report on Rock Lee's strength and speed from the Scientific Academy based on surveillance videos. These are the latest intelligence on Charles Doyle and the video captured by a miniature camera during our last conversation. This is the result of psychological experts, behavior analysts, lie detection experts, and other analysts evaluating the authenticity of Rock Lee's information in the video. Coulson placed the files he held on Nick Fury's desk one by one. At this point, Nick Fury reached out and picked up a document, then began reading it. He instructed, Coulson, share your analysis. Director, based on my interactions and the information obtained from Rock Lee, I don't recommend forcibly taking him away. According to the information provided by him and my analysis, this child named Rock Lee is likely not the kind of ordinary Asian teenager we previously speculated about, with no background. It's highly probable that he's someone cultivated by an organization with rich heritage. As he spoke, Coulson took out several photos from the documents. The pictures included not only Rock Lee but also Irika Yumino and Uchiha Sasuke. Coulson pointed at the forehead protectors on Rock Lee's waist, as well as those on Irika Yumino and Uchiha Sasuke's foreheads, and said, We haven't found specific information about this symbol, but all three individuals were the same emblem. Additionally, all three are of Asian descent. I boldly speculate that these three individuals most likely come from the same place. As for why they're following Charles Doyle and made him their guardian, we don't know. Hearing Coulson's analysis, Nick Fury nodded repeatedly. He then took out the information on Charles Doyle and read it carefully. From being adopted to becoming a registered assassin at the Continental Hotel, and then, at the age of 18, killing his foster parents and venturing alone in the Continental Hotel. Looking at the information, Irika Yumino appeared beside him when Charles Doyle was 19 years old. 
At the age of 20, Uchiha Sasuke and the Assassin Brotherhood's Jinni also appeared beside him. At 21, the young Rock Lee appeared. Except for Jinni, the identity information of the other three was forged for them by Charles Doyle at the Continental Hotel. After closely examining Charles Doyle's information, Nick Fury spoke, two years ago, Charles was a gun-wielding assassin. However, since a guy named Irika Yumino appeared, he quickly made a name for himself in the assassin world. He even became a ninja who uses cold weapons. Humph. Nick Fury snorted and said, the hand, a bunch of underground rats, can't stay put in Japan. They've secretly sneaked over here. No wonder they moved to wipe out the Assassin Brotherhood. This grudge has been going on for quite a while. Evidently, Nick Fury regarded everyone, including Charles Doyle, as members of the Hand. After all, there weren't many people worldwide who claimed to be ninjas and were exceptionally skilled, except for that group. For the backgrounds of Rock Lee and the others, he even considered them to be products cultivated by the Hand. The only thing that remained unknown was which finger of the Hand they were under. Coulson, there's no need to make contact with these people. Members of the Hand aren't worth recruiting. Store all this information and handle it with a security level of 4. Upon hearing the director's opinion, Coulson stepped forward and collected all the documents. He then asked, should we recall the personnel stationed there? Recall them. Our elites shouldn't be wasting their time there. The Continental Hotel, Charles sat with Ginny in the dining area, both of them smiling while eating steak. Meanwhile, Winston sat on the adjacent sofa, reading a newspaper. Ginny speared a small piece of meat with her fork, placed it in her mouth, and chewed slowly while her eyes remained on the man in front of her. After swallowing, Ginny picked up a napkin, gently dabbed her lips, and then spoke, Charles, you seem to be in a good mood. Hearing Ginny's words, Charles thought to himself, today is truly a good day. He got 50 gold coins from signing in earlier, and there's another good show to come later. Of course, his mood is good. Charles smiled and said, today is a good day, and an interesting one at that. Before Ginny could respond, Charles turned to Winston sitting next to him and said, Winston, today is going to be an interesting day. He will change some things that seem unchangeable. What do you say, Winston? Winston shook the newspaper slightly, then calmly said, Mr. Charles, I hope everything goes as you wish. Ginny shot Charles a reproachful look, annoyed that he was speaking in riddles again. Seeing Ginny's reaction, Charles chuckled, Ginny, don't worry, there's a good show coming later. After explaining it to Ginny, Charles started devouring the steak on the table, not saying anything more. Ginny picked up her wine glass, took a sip, and then gazed at the man in front of her who had captured her interest. This man always had many secrets and often spoke in riddles, making it hard to figure him out. Moreover, his strength was like a black hole. Just when you thought you understood everything about him, you'd find out you had only scratched the surface. Thinking about this, Ginny couldn't help but cross her legs. About half an hour later, a voice came from upstairs, Winston. A slightly disheveled figure appeared before everyone. Winston, who was sitting on the sofa, looked up at the person upstairs and said, Mr. Antonio. Winston's tone was slightly mocking, it seems you had a great night. Glancing at Charles next to him, he said to the man approaching, I guess you're here to lay low. Ginny caught Winston's expression and silently communicated with Charles, is this what we're here for, fun? Charles didn't say anything, just nodded silently. Santino D'Antonio walked up to Winston, his hands in his pockets, and said, I want to revoke his membership status at the hotel. Immediately, right now. Winston looked at the anxious Santino calmly and said, from a procedural standpoint, Mr. Wick has not violated any rules. Seeing Winston's resistance, Santino D'Antonio immediately became angry and said, you should know that I'm now a member of the high table. I have the authority to command you. Winston took off his glasses and smiled, no, Mr. Antonio, you don't have the authority to command me. This realm belongs to me alone. Santino D'Antonio's face turned dark, displeased, he retorted, fine. Guard your realm, Winston. While you're still alive. Without hesitation, Winston retorted, and you guard your privileges. Santino D'Antonio, at this point, didn't look at Winston anymore. Instead, he turned and took a seat, called over a waiter, and ordered a steak. 
Meanwhile, Charles and Ginny watched the conversation between the two in silence. After Santino D'Antonio sat down, Ginny whispered, wasn't he the one who issued the bounty? Why does he look so embarrassed now? Just now, he wanted to revoke whose membership? John Wick? Charles's face was tinged with mockery as he spoke, there are always those who think that holding something gives them the right to do as they please. They burn down someone's house on one hand, and make them fulfill a promise on the other, and right after, they put a bounty on their head. So, sometimes blood oaths or promises must be entrusted to someone with morals and boundaries. Otherwise, who knows what unexpected twists might arise. Charles didn't hold back his voice, and his words resonated throughout the hall, making everyone clearly hear him. Many people looked at Santino D'Antonio with disdain in their eyes. Santino D'Antonio's face was embarrassed. Having fled all the way to the Continental Hotel, he was already in a sorry state. Now, after being taunted by Charles, he was even more furious. But he didn't dare to confront Charles. After all, someone like John Wick had left him in such a pathetic state. Now, facing an even more formidable opponent like Charles Doyle, he was afraid he would never leave the Continental Hotel in his lifetime. Coincidentally, at this moment, a waiter arrived carrying steak and wine, ending the awkward atmosphere. Taking advantage of dinner being served, Santino picked up his knife and fork and began cutting his steak, trying to disguise his embarrassment through his actions. On the other side, John Wick arrived outside the Continental Hotel, holding a handgun. Pushing open the hotel doors, John Wick entered with a visible aura of menace. He reached the front desk and said to Sharon, I'm here to see Santino D'Antonio. Sharon stared at John Wick, his aura filled with killing intent. He took a deep breath, swallowed his saliva, and replied, he's waiting for you in the lounge, sir. John Wick didn't linger and headed straight for the dining area on the lower floor. He arrived at the staircase and saw Santino D'Antonio enjoying his dinner and wine below. John's anger surged even higher as he descended the stairs. As the footsteps echoed near the staircase, Santino D'Antonio noticed John Wick approaching. Perhaps he believed that the earlier mocking from the crowd for his confidence in the Continental Hotel being an absolutely secure zone played a role, but Santino D'Antonio adjusted his suit, straightened his posture, and stared as John Wick approached. In the dining area, everyone, including Winston and Charles's group, noticed John Wick's presence, especially the gun in his hand, which stood out conspicuously. Santino D'Antonio looked at John Wick as he approached. He casually picked up his fork, skewered a piece of steak, dipped it in duck oil, and then chewed it slowly. He leaned back in his chair, gazing at John Wick while eating, and then he spoke, duck oil, it's an essential seasoning. Beside him, Winston attempted to halt John Wick, John. Santino D'Antonio provocatively said, John, have you seen the menu here? Feel free to choose. Winston saw the intense aura surrounding John Wick and realized that something was amiss. He quickly spoke, John, let me explain. On the other hand, Charles and Ginny observed the performance of the two in silence. John Wick didn't pay attention to Winston's words. He simply continued to glare at him. Santino D'Antonio continued to taunt, after spending time here, you always want to try something different. Between his words, Santino was subtly indicating to John that as Santino D'Antonio, he had taken residence in the Continental Hotel, and he wouldn't leave easily. He was saying, you can't kill me. Winston's tone changed as he realized what was going on. He said in a low voice, John, leave now. As if Santino D'Antonio felt his provocation wasn't severe enough, he continued to mock, yes, John. Get lost. Just as the word, get lost, left Santino's mouth, John Wick raised his hand and shot a bullet straight through Santino's head. It seemed that all of John Wick's accumulated anger was unleashed in that moment. Disregarding the rules of the Continental Hotel, he directly killed Santino D'Antonio within the hotel. Witnessing this, Charles thought, even in a safe zone, don't be reckless with your words. After all, some people might risk the consequences just to initiate a forced player versus player situation. At this moment, Ginny covered her mouth, looking at Charles in disbelief. Her eyes seemed to say, Charles, your investment is a loss, a real loss. Winston was also shocked. John Wick had killed Santino D'Antonio right in front of everyone's eyes within the Continental Hotel. Looking at Santino D'Antonio, 
who was now completely dead, Winston's voice was solemn as he asked, What have you done? John Wick placed the handgun on a table in the hotel and coldly replied, putting an end to all of this. After speaking, John Wick turned and limped out of the Continental Hotel. As he passed by Charles Doyle, he paused for a moment and then clenched his right hand as if he were holding on to something. Once John Wick left, Ginny asked curiously, Boss, what did you give him? Charles put a finger to his lips, making a shushing gesture, and then said, Ginny, it's time for us to return to the office. The world of assassins is changing again. At this point, Winston looked at Charles Doyle and asked, Mr. Doyle, is this what you meant by change? Charles shrugged and said with regret, isn't it? Winston. Meanwhile, John Wick, having reached the hotel front desk, looked at Sharon standing beside his beloved dog. He asked, how's he doing? Looking at John Wick before him, Sharon replied with a hint of respect, he's well behaved. It's nice to have him by your side. Without looking at Sharon again, John Wick slightly bent down and said to his dog, let's go home. And so, John Wick left the Continental Hotel with his dog. For more chapters, 50 plus p at treeon.com slash getsa returning home in the pouring rain, John Wick gazed at the ruins that used to be his house. Pain was evident on his face. Amid the debris, he found a photo frame with a picture of him and his wife. He tried to wipe off the soot, hoping to reveal the original photo, but his efforts were in vain. Disappointed, John Wick sat amidst the rubble, looking at the ashes under his feet. He spotted the necklace his wife had left behind and immediately reached for it. After sifting through the ashes, he managed to find the relatively intact necklace. Holding it in his hand, he walked to an undamaged couch and sat down, placing the necklace on his chest and reminiscing about his wife. Suddenly, a voice beside him startled John. He turned to face the source of the sound. Emerging from the darkness was Sharon, the concierge of the Continental Hotel. He said, Mr. Wick. Seeing John's gaze, Sharon continued, If you're willing, you can come with me. John didn't speak but nodded, agreeing to go. Sharon drove Winston's Rolls Royce, accompanied by John Wick and his dog, to meet Winston. Sitting in the back seat, John took out a tissue from his pocket. On it was written, Doyle Agency, the same tissue Charles Doyle had handed to him at the Continental Hotel. Seeing the words, John knew that Charles was telling him that his opportunity for a fresh start was with his agency. Putting the tissue back in his pocket, he glanced at the scenery outside and quietly waited. Soon, the car arrived at the entrance of a park. The warm sun was just rising, casting its light on the sky. With his dog by his side, John stepped out of the car as Sharon approached him. Sharon said, it was a pleasure spending time with you, Mr. Wick. After shaking hands with John, Sharon added, farewell. He then pointed in the direction of the park, indicating that the person John was waiting for was there. Walking into the park and crossing a bridge, John spotted Winston sitting in the center of a square and approached him. Seeing John approach, Winston greeted, John. John cut straight to the point, Winston, what punishment will I receive? Winston sat on the steps, his expression serious as he spoke, the bounty on you placed by the high table has doubled through the Kimura. You're now globally hunted. Hearing the name, Kimura, John asked in confusion, the high table. Winston nodded, yes. John continued, and what about the Continental Hotel? Winston lifted his head, looking directly at John with a hint of anger in his tone, you killed on the hotel premises, John. I must excommunicate you, I have no other choice. From now on, all services and assistance from the Continental Hotel will be cut off for you. Winston stood up, coming in front of John, and said, I'm sorry, but you're worth nothing now. John's voice was somewhat hoarse, if I've broken the rules, why am I still alive? Hearing John's question, Winston's expression turned solemn, because I demanded it. He then nodded to a man in a black trench coat standing nearby. In the next moment, the man in the trench coat pulled out his phone and said, now. The park, once bustling with people, suddenly froze, as if someone had pressed the pause button. Everyone stopped moving. John Wick looked around, understanding that Winston was serious. Once he confirmed John's comprehension, Winston nodded again. In the next second, everyone in the park resumed their movements. Winston glanced at his wristwatch, saying to John, you have one hour. 
I can't extend it too long. Perhaps in the future, you'll need this. Winston produced a blood oath marker, the very one John Wick had possessed, the one he had earned by aiding another. However, when he chose retirement, he surrendered it to Winston. Now, Winston returned John Wick's blood oath marker, the same one he once held. Accepting the marker, John Wick said, Winston, tell them, tell everyone. No matter the future, no matter the circumstances, when assassins come for me, I will show no mercy, I will not hold back. Winston looked at John's earnest expression and smiled, of course you will. As John turned to leave, Winston remembered what he and Charles had discussed at the Continental Hotel. He spoke again, if there's anyone willing to help you now, the most likely candidate is Charles Doyle. After all, he still holds your blood oath marker, unused. He probably won't let you die easily until he uses it. Of course, it's just a possibility. John halted his steps and said, Thank you, Winston. With that, John Wick left the park without looking back. Watching John's departure, Winston picked up his phone and dialed a number, open an account, 11111. In one hour, John Wick, excommunicado. On the other side, Charles Doyle Agency, at this moment, Charles was briefing the team, Ginny, prepare the healing bath. We'll need it when John Wick arrives. Surprised at the news of John Wick's visit, Ginny exclaimed, Boss, John violated the rules at the Continental Hotel. How is he even able to come here alive? Clearly, Ginny didn't believe that John, who had broken one of the Continental Hotel's two cardinal rules, could still be alive. Charles smiled and then said, Trust me, Ginny. John won't die. And I won't let him die. Playfully, Ginny remarked, Boss, that's a $7 million price tag. As Ginny finished speaking, everyone's phones received a notification. John Wick had been excommunicated from the Continental Hotel, his membership revoked. His bounty had also doubled to $14 million. An hour after receiving the message, anyone could hunt John Wick worldwide. Seeing the notification, Ginny whispered, it's $14 million now. His bounty is even higher. He's undoubtedly the undisputed top of the hit list. Boss, do you really think he has a chance of survival coming here? Every hitman in the city must be eager to claim their share of the reward. Besides, would he really dare to come? Charles grinned and said, go prepare, Ginny. Trust my judgment. After all, I've never been wrong. Then, addressing Ruka and the others, Charles continued, prepare for combat as soon as John arrives. If any other assassins target the agency, eliminate them on sight. Yes, Lord Charles. X3, for more chapters, 50 plus p at treeandcom slash getza after assigning tasks to the team, Charles gazed at the sky outside, sighing, the weather is about to change. Then, Charles Doyle opened the system interface and completed today's check-in. Ding. Check-in successful, gained 200 reputation points. Would you like to upgrade to VIP4 and receive double rewards? After clicking the X, Charles exited the system interface and began contemplating how to maximize his gains during the upcoming operation to rescue John Wick. On the other side, the previously sunny sky suddenly became overcast, as if a storm was approaching. Just as John Wick left the park, he appeared on a bustling street, supporting his injured body and accompanied by his loyal dog. He noticed many assassins greedily staring at him. Glancing at his watch, John noted that the excommunication would take effect at 6 p.m., giving him an hour left. Thinking about the note in his pocket and Winston's advice, John Wick knew where he should head next. However, exercising caution, he decided to make a detour to the New York Highway Library to retrieve his hidden gold coins and another item that could aid his escape. A Roslom Pass He couldn't solely rely on the Charles Doyle Agency as his last resort. After all, the $14 million bounty was a significant sum. Suddenly, rain started pouring from the sky. John Wick hailed a taxi on the street and said, go to the New York Highway Library. The driver turned around and said, no problem. The car sped up, but before it could go far, traffic congestion caused by the heavy rain brought the vehicle to a halt. Listening to the honking horns of numerous cars ahead, John Wick felt urgency. He knew his safety window was closing rapidly, and once the time was up, anyone could potentially be his enemy. 
Rolling up his sleeves, John checked the time and took out a Continental Hotel-issued gold coin from his pocket. He handed it to the driver and said, change of plans. Hearing his voice, the driver turned around and looked at the gold coin in John Wick's hand before taking it. Go to the Continental Hotel. Can you hand it to the front desk? As John Wick spoke, he glanced at his loyal dog sitting beside him. The driver looked at John and nodded, sure, Mr. Wick. Evidently, this taxi driver was familiar with the renowned Night Devil. John Wick gently petted his dog a few times and instructed, good boy, good boy. Then, he opened the car door, exited the taxi, and started running towards the direction of the library. At this moment, countless eyes on the street were fixated on John Wick. However, knowing they had to wait another hour before they could act, everyone settled down again. After all, they had to abide by the Continental Hotel's rules until that time arrived. Soon, braving the rain, John Wick arrived at the New York Highway Library. Sprinting to the library service desk, John Wick immediately spoke to the staff member, the author of Russian Folktales is Alexander Afanasiev, 1864. As the librarian looked up the book's location, John Wick checked the time again, confirming that there was still time left. The librarian handed John Wick a note with the book's location and said, on the second floor. Thank you. Taking the note, John Wick hurriedly made his way to the second floor. Meanwhile, Challen drove Winston back to the Continental Hotel. Upon entering the hotel, Challen expressed, I really hope Mr. Wick can escape safely. Winston adjusted his collar and replied as he walked, Challen, he deliberately broke the rules and killed someone in the hotel. Walking alongside Winston, Challen asked, Do you think he can escape? Winston turned to look at Challen and said, He's now worth a $14 million bounty. Every assassin in the city wants a piece of it. I believe there's a 50% chance he'll escape, provided he finds Charles Doyle and gets his help. Challen questioned, 50%. In Challen's understanding, the Charles Doyle who had recently demonstrated his dominance outside the Continental Hotel was someone no assassin dared to provoke. If he decided to intervene, John Wick's chances of escaping should be certain. Winston chuckled, a 50% chance. Either Charles kills John to claim the bounty, or he helps John escape. After all, the current John Wick has become worthless. He has to choose between the promise of the blood oath marker and $14 million. It depends on Charles Doyle's own decision. After saying this, Winston continued walking upstairs. Watching Winston leave, Challen stood still in place, puzzled. John Wick quickly arrived at the location of the books on the second floor, holding the note. Taking out the book, he tore off a sticker inside, revealing a photo of his deceased wife, few gold coins, a pass, and other items. He placed the photo on the shelf, then took out the gold coins and put them in his pocket. He also put the pass and other items in his pocket. Finally, John Wick picked up the photo of his deceased wife, gazed at it deeply, and kissed it before sealing it back in the book. At this moment, a voice sounded in his ear, Consider why God created you. Accompanied by footsteps, the voice continued, not to live like a beast, but to pursue virtue and knowledge. A giant over two meters tall appeared, holding a book. He said to John Wick, Dante. He showed the cover of the book to John Wick, indicating that the words inside were from the book, and then placed it on the shelf. John Wick also returned the book he held to the shelf. Looking at John Wick, the giant named Ernest spoke, You seem a bit weak, John. John Wick gazed at the giant and said, Ernest, the time hasn't come yet. Ernest didn't hold back, it's almost time. Who knows when you'll die? John Wick's expression grew serious as he asked, Are you sure you want to do this? Ernest tilted his head, his eyes revealing greed, million. It's a huge sum. And oh, first, you need to have a life to spend. Without hesitation, Ernest pulled out a short sword from his waist and lunged at John Wick. John Wick quickly picked up a book from the shelf and used it to defend himself. The two clashed instantly. For more chapters, 50 plus p at trian.com slash getza, t slash n, I appreciate your support through votes. As promised, here's a bonus chapter for reaching over 75 power stones. To unlock more bonus chapters, please continue voting. Looking at the heavy rain outside the window, Charles sat in the lobby of the office, silently pondering, you had long distanced yourself from the Ross Ram people. 
would you still seek refuge with them for survival? Or will you come straight here? Glancing at the clock hanging on the wall, Charles murmured to himself, John, you don't have much time left. In the library, John Wick had just finished dealing with Ernest using a book. Staring at his fallen enemy, John picked up the book and placed it back on the shelf. Suddenly, he felt a sharp pain in his shoulder. Wiping his hand across it, he realized it was stained with blood. It was from the dagger wound inflicted by Ernest during their struggle just now. Damn it! John Wick cursed under his breath and quickly rushed out of the library, clutching his injured shoulder. He was headed outside, considering the distance to Charles's office. John decided to take advantage of the remaining time to patch up his wound. Otherwise, he doubted he would make it to Charles's location alive. There were still ten minutes left until John Wick's removal from the Continental Hotel would take effect. Meanwhile, in the underground realm of the Bowery District, a criminal kingpin similar to the leader of a beggar's gang, known as B, spoke to his subordinate, Ella, spread the word. The Bowery District will respect the decision to remove him. We won't provide any form of help or service to John Wick. At this moment, John Wick had managed to reach the residence of the black market doctor in Chinatown. He knocked loudly on the door and called out, Doctor, Doctor, it's Wick. The hatch on the door opened, and the doctor peered through, looking at the person outside. He said, Mr. Wick, no, you shouldn't have come here. Time is running out. John Wick urgently pleaded, I know. Doctor, I'm begging you, there's still time. The doctor gazed at John outside the door and still refused, no, I can't do this. Seeing the doctor's refusal, John pulled out a Continental Hotel coin from his pocket, held it in front of the doctor, and said, I have five minutes left. Please, I'm begging you. The doctor took the coin from John's hand through the small window on the door, then opened the door and said, come in quickly. After John Wick entered, the doctor peeked his head outside to check the corridor, ensuring no one was following, and then hurriedly closed the door. Leading John Wick to his workstation, the doctor immediately said, quick, have a seat. John Wick didn't hesitate, he took off his suit jacket, revealing his injured area. The doctor saw the wound on John Wick's shoulder and said, let me take a look. As he spoke, he picked up a hemostatic gauze and began to clean the wound. While cleaning, he said, stab wound, it's deep, it cut an artery. It needs stitching. Without hesitation, he started stitching up the wound. Time flowed by, minute by minute. John sat on the chair, watching the clock in the doctor's room. He then said, Doctor. The doctor continued stitching without stopping and replied, almost done, just halfway to finish stitching. Doctor, there are only five seconds left. John began to count down for the doctor, five, four, three, two, one. When the clock's hands pointed to six, the bell rang. The doctor looked at John with regret and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Wick, I can't continue to help you. John understood, I understand, it's the rules. The doctor muttered, rules. At this point, John's removal from the Continental Hotel had taken full effect. He was no longer allowed to receive any services from any organization or individual loyal to the authority of the high table. John Wick took the scissors from the doctor's hand and faced the mirror, continuing the rest of the stitching himself. Continental Hotel, Information Processing Center At this moment, a message was sent to all registered members of the hotel's assassins. Target, John Wick. Bounty, $14 million. Distribution, Global Assassins. Status, Public. Last known location, New York, Chinatown. Update, Bounty officially in effect. Meanwhile, Winston was playing a word puzzle game at the Continental Hotel. Seeing the message on his phone, he muttered to himself, it's begun. At the hotel's front desk, Sharon noticed numerous assassins in the administrative hall corridor. Simultaneously, they all looked at their phones upon receiving the message. In Charles's office, he also received the bounty message from the Continental Hotel. After glancing at the message, Charles threw the phone onto the table, picked up a bottle of bourbon whiskey, took a sip, and then silently waited for John Wick to arrive. Meanwhile, John, who was still at the doctor's place, had finished stitching up his wound himself. He started searching the doctor's medicine cabinet for painkillers. After rummaging around for a while, he couldn't find what he needed. 
Seeing John still searching, out of respect for Mr. Wick, the doctor spoke up, top shelf, on the right. Yes, take four. It'll help you stay alert and alleviate the pain. John Wick looked at the Chinese doctor in surprise, then immediately took out the medication and started taking it. At this point, the doctor walked to the cabinet, opened a drawer, and took out a handgun, saying, Mr. Wick, they won't believe I stopped treating you on time. John looked at the doctor and said, but you did stop. Holding the gun, the doctor continued, they'll find out. John turned around, adjusted his clothing, and asked, find out what? That I told you where the medicine was. Hearing the doctor's words, John Wick hesitated for a moment, then turned back. At this point, the doctor walked up to John Wick, handed him the gun, and then sat down on a chair, picking up a hemostatic gauze to be prepared for first aid. Taking the gun from the doctor, John walked to the opposite side, facing the doctor, and asked, where should I shoot? The doctor lifted the hem of his shirt, revealing his lower rib area, pointing with one hand, here, just below the floating ribs. Don't hit me. Before the doctor could finish his sentence, John Wick raised his hand and fired a shot, hitting the target accurately. Ah! The doctor cried out in pain and slumped in the chair. As John was about to put down the gun and leave, the doctor shouted, Wait! Perhaps one shot isn't enough. Then, the doctor unbuttoned his collar, exposing his neck and shoulder, and continued, Please don't shoot me there. Before he could finish his sentence, the gunshot rang out again. Ah! Ah! The doctor groaned in pain once more. John approached, picked up his own suit jacket, and turned to leave. At this point, the doctor watched John Wick's retreating figure and said, Good luck, Mr. Wick. John Wick paused, turned back to face the doctor clutching his wound, and said, Thank you, doctor. After speaking, John didn't linger and headed straight outside. For more chapters, 50 plus p at trian.com slash gets of the phone still on the table rang again, and Charles picked it up to see that John Wick's bounty had been increased to $15 million. A substantial amount of money indeed. Where are you going, John Wick? On the other side, John Wick had already made his way from the street to the stables. He eliminated all the incoming assassins there, mounted a horse, and rode out. As he reached the highway, two motorcycle riding assassins chased after him. Beneath an elevated bridge, John Wick urged his horse forward. One of the motorcycle riders caught up and tried to pull him off the horse by reaching out a hand, but his attempts were unsuccessful. Seizing an opportunity, John slapped the rider's helmet, causing the rider to lean forward, revealing a pistol holstered at his lower back. In a swift motion, John Wick bent down on the horse and pulled the pistol from the rider's waist, firing three shots at his neck. Bang! 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 The motorcycle rider died instantly, and the uncontrolled motorcycle collided with a nearby truck. Seeing another motorcycle assassin approaching from behind, John Wick took advantage of his pursuit. He leaned to the side of the horse, concealing his body beside the horse, and extended a hand to fire several shots at the oncoming motorcycle. In an instant, the motorcycle rider lost control and crashed into a parked car ahead. After dealing with both motorcycle assassins, John Wick glanced behind to ensure no one was following him. Satisfied that he wasn't being pursued at the moment, he spurred his horse and rode towards the Charles Agency on Forest Hills Avenue in the Queensboro. Charles Agency, in the lobby, Charles and his five associates were all waiting. Jenny looked at Charles and asked, Boss, are you sure you didn't guess wrong? Can John make it here in time considering the circumstances? Charles wasn't entirely certain, but thinking about John's determination, he replied, as long as he's not dead, he will come. Just as Charles finished speaking, a knocking sound echoed from the entrance of the agency. Irica stood up and went to open the door. Mr. John Wick, please come in. Seeing the door of the agency open, John Wick looked at Irica Yumino and instead of immediately entering, he asked, I'm looking for Charles Doyle. Irica looked at John standing outside the door and said, Lord Charles is in the lobby, waiting for you. Upon hearing that Charles was inside, John Wick followed Irica into the agency. Meanwhile, on the street across from the agency, an assassin watched John enter Charles's agency and then, with a regretful expression, left the area. John Wick followed alongside Irica and crossed the lobby to stand in front of Charles. Charles looked at the disheveled John Wick, 
his white shirt stained with blood and soaked by rainwater, and asked, John, why are you here? Although Charles intended to help John, he couldn't initiate the conversation himself. After all, what was at stake wasn't a business deal, it was a matter of favors. While the outcome might be the same, the owed debt would differ. John Wick knelt down on one knee and with a pleading tone, he said, Lord Charles, I request your protection. Charles knew that assisting John would inevitably offend the high table, but since he was willing to meet him, it meant there was a possibility of help. Charles opened the conversation, John, you've been excommunicated by the Continental Hotel and a public bounty of $15 million is on your head. I won't just offend the high table by meeting you, even more so by providing you protection. However, since I am willing to meet you, it means there's a chance I might help you. Then, John Wick, what do I gain after I rescue you? While speaking, Charles Doyle took out John Wick's blood oath marker from his pocket and held it in his hand. Evidently, Charles's message was clear, John's blood oath marker was already in his possession. If John wanted his help, the price wouldn't be insignificant. John Wick looked around at the individuals in the lobby, Ginny, Irika, Uchiha Sasuke, Rock Lee, and others. He seemed to come to a decision, then turned his gaze back to Charles and said slowly, I am willing to offer my loyalty, just like them, to become your associate. Observing John's determination, Charles knew he was cornered. Charles asked, John, why do you want to live? John hadn't anticipated Charles asking such a question. After a brief pause, he answered, for my beloved. I want to live on, to remember her. Charles gazed deeply at John Wick and continued, you left the world of assassins five years ago for your beloved. And now, because of her, you've returned to this world. John, are you ready for this return? Kneeling before Charles, John Wick pledged, Lord Charles, I am willing. For Helen, I once laid down my weapons and returned to a peaceful life. Today, for Helen, I am willing to take up arms again and keep her alive in my memories. Hearing John Wick's words, Charles recalled a phrase from a past life about how to define a person's death, first death, the death of the flesh. Second death, the death of social ties. Third death, the death of the last traces of memories. Evidently, John Wick wanted to keep Helen alive forever in his memories. John Wick, I accept your loyalty. Hearing Charles's agreement, John's tense heart finally relaxed. But Charles continued, you must know that protecting you means going against the high table. After all, they want you dead. And if you truly want safety, you must be reinstated by the Continental Hotel and have the bounty removed. To achieve all of this, you'll need the elder of the high table, the one controlling one of the thirteen seats. At this point, Charles didn't speak further. He simply gazed at John. John Wick's mind raced, and he tentatively asked, should I go to Casablanca to find the high table's elder to lift my excommunication? Charles raised his index finger and shook it, then smiled, no, not to find the elder, but to become the elder. Become one of the thirteen seats of the high table. John Wick was profoundly shocked. He never anticipated that Charles's goal was the high table itself, not just to become a member but to become a controller of the high table. Looking at the astonished John Wick, Charles smiled and said, Irika, take John Wick to the recovery room. He can't stay like this. After Irika had taken John to the recovery room, Charles issued instructions, Sasuke, go outside and check if there are any reckless individuals following us. If there are relentless assassins coming, show no mercy and eliminate them. Yes, Lord Charles, Sasuke replied. He activated his Sharingan and walked towards the exit. Now, in the room, there were only Rock Lee, Ginny, and Charles Doyle. Ginny looked at the man in front of her, hesitating for a moment before asking, Boss, do you really want to become an elder of the high table? It sounded insane. Even Ginny, who came from the Assassin Brotherhood, found this idea too wild. Not because Charles Doyle lacked the strength but because they had too few people. Including the newly recruited John Wick, they were only six in total. Staring at Ginny's shocked expression, Charles chuckled, nothing stays the same. With our strength, becoming one of the thirteen seats of the high table is achievable. It just so happens that we don't know the location of the high table's headquarters or the specifics of their elders. But now, we have someone who can lead us there. Ginny, still looking astonished, hurriedly responded, Boss, I'm not questioning your abilities. 
It's just that we don't have enough manpower. I don't know the exact structure of the high table's upper echelon, but managing 80% of global assassins and the major city continental hotels requires more personnel than we currently have. But we're just a few people. Ginny didn't finish her sentence, but the implication was clear, their team was understaffed, and they couldn't support the extent of control that came with replacing a seat. Hearing Ginny's words, Charles Doyle smiled, No, Ginny, first, you need to understand that we don't have just these six people. Over the years, I've accumulated connections. If I'm willing, with a single command, many assassins will be willing to serve me. Even this John Wick situation presents an opportunity for us to take over a faction. Charles continued, moreover, I don't need to personally manage these places. I just need a few adjudicators for regular patrols. Hearing the term, adjudicator, Ginny immediately thought of John Wick. Given his skills, he would likely excel as Charles's adjudicator, efficiently handling missions. However, Ginny still shook her head and said, Boss, John Wick alone might not be enough. Are you planning to send Irica and the others as well? In fact, I have some candidates to recommend. Upon hearing that Ginny had candidates in mind, Charles was curious. He asked, Who are they? Cross and Wesley. When these two names were mentioned, Charles was momentarily stunned. Then, he expressed his surprise, has Cross trained his son? Not yet, but it's almost there. Cross mentioned that Wesley's talent is exceptional, even surpassing his own. If, boss, you need manpower, you can talk to them. Cross will probably be willing. Charles knew that Wesley had even greater potential than Cross. But he was curious, didn't he want his son to lead a peaceful and ordinary life? Ginny replied, he did, but it seems like Wesley has his own ideas. Ginny smiled and explained, after going through what he did, Wesley can't return to a normal life anymore. Besides, Cross wants his son to have some self-defense skills. You never know when they might need to save themselves from another unusual situation. Hearing this, Charles guessed that Cross might have encountered something significant afterward, which made him realize the importance of his son's abilities. However, he wasn't entirely sure and suggested, let's talk to them when we have time. If they're willing, becoming adjudicators should be well within their capabilities. Ginny nodded and looked at Charles, a man with ambition that fascinated her. What Ginny didn't know was that Charles's goal in taking over the high table wasn't about power or ruling over global assassins. It was simply to integrate the New York Continental Hotel's mission system into his own gathering place for missions. Only then would his ninja operatives have a constant flow of missions to accept. The current gathering place for missions allowed a maximum of nine missions per day, and there were days when Charles's agency had no missions at all. After all, their reputation and competitiveness were nowhere near that of the Continental Hotel. At this moment, the agency's door swung open, and Sasuke entered. Ignoring Ginny's question about potential attackers outside, Sasuke reported to Charles, Lord Charles, I've taken care of a few surveilling assassins outside. As for the FBI agents Irika Sensei mentioned, they withdrew two days ago and haven't returned. Hearing the mention of the FBI, Ginny was surprised. She didn't understand why the FBI would come knocking on their door. They weren't the type to attract attention unless they did something unreasonable in public. Interactions between their kind usually went unnoticed. Seeing Ginny's confusion, Charles briefly explained the FBI's visit and didn't delve into their true identities, only describing the situation in broad strokes. Hearing that it was the same FBI that had investigated Wesley earlier and that they were now interested in Rock Lee, Ginny didn't press further. As for Sasuke taking care of the surveilling assassins, Charles didn't pay much attention to it. What puzzled him more was the fact that S.H.I.E.L.D., still under its old name, had withdrawn its personnel. This left Charles somewhat baffled. Nick Fury, with his personality, wouldn't let go of something he wants to control. Was it possible that he no longer saw them as valuable? Charles considered the fact that they hadn't been noticed yet. He thought about how Nick Fury, with the cooperation of the Skrulls and the backing of Captain Marvel, might not consider a few assassins a significant concern. However, Nick Fury was unaware that the longer he delayed getting involved with Charles and his group, the more their resources and power grew. It was merely a fortunate misunderstanding that led Nick Fury to abandon his pursuit of Charles and his team. When he would finally realize their true strength, it would be too late. The Charles agency had a peaceful night. Morning came. 
Check in. Ding. Check in successful, rewarded with 200 reputation points. Seeing another 200 reputation points added to his account, Charles nodded in satisfaction. He now had 8,296 reputation points, not far from the 10,000 mark. He left his room and took a bottle of bourbon with him as he headed to the recovery room. Upon arriving at the recovery room, Charles saw John Wick submerged in one of the newly constructed cement bathtubs on the far left. His entire body was wrapped in wax, with only his face exposed. Hearing footsteps, John Wick immediately became alert and woke up. However, due to the wax covering his face, he couldn't speak and could only make hm, hm sounds for a while. Seeing John awake, Charles walked over and asked, John, how are you feeling? Hearing Charles's voice, John stopped struggling with the wax covering his face. I feel much better, just a bit thirsty. With John speaking, the wax on his face started to crack, and some even fell into his mouth. Charles cleared away the wax from John's face and said, Here, have some water. He set aside the bottle of bourbon he brought and poured a small glass of water for John. As the water went down his throat, John felt much better. He thanked Charles, saying, Thanks, this is my favorite bourbon. What is this wax bath for? John asked. Charles placed John's glass aside and explained, This wax bath stimulates white blood cells and accelerates the healing process. Here, even bruises, cuts, and fractures can heal within hours. Hearing about the incredible function, John Wick was astonished. He stammered, This. This is too powerful. With this, there's no need to fear ordinary injuries anymore. Especially the rapid healing of cuts and fractures within a few hours, this effect was truly incredible. Even if an assassin suffered a serious injury, they could recover the next day and continue fighting. John was amazed that Charles possessed such a remarkable resource. Even Winston, who ran the Continental Hotel, or the higher-ups in the high table, didn't have anything comparable. Charles, however, shook his head and said, although this is good, it can only treat some external injuries. If you're shot in a vital area, there's no way to save you. Hearing that some life-threatening injuries couldn't be treated, John Wick didn't feel disappointed. For him, the wax bath slash healing bath was already an incredibly valuable asset. With this resource, John Wick had even more confidence in helping Charles become one of the 13 seats of the high table. Just the wax bath alone could bring Charles substantial profits and more manpower. Charles, this is already perfect. Its capabilities are too powerful. Charles smiled but didn't dwell on the topic. Instead, he said, All right, I'll leave now. When the wax bath melts, you can get out. I'll be waiting for you in the training room. Continental Hotel, a black Mercedes Benz stopped at the hotel's entrance. A tall woman with a shaved head wearing a black coat, black boots, and even black nail polish stepped out of the car. She carried a black briefcase and looked quite imposing. She walked towards the Continental Hotel, exuding a confident and cold aura all the way. Upon reaching the hotel's front desk, she was met with Sharon, who greeted her, Welcome to the Continental Hotel. Is there anything you need? She took out a gold coin representing her adjudicator status and slowly pushed it toward Sharon with two fingers, remaining silent and maintaining her unwavering gaze. Sharon picked up the coin, examined it carefully, and then placed it on the front desk. He picked up the hotel phone and dialed an internal number. When the call was answered, he said, Sir, there's an adjudicator who would like to see you. Very well, sir. Sharon hung up the phone and respectfully said to the adjudicator, the manager is in the lounge. The adjudicator gave Sharon another glance, retrieved the coin representing her status, and proceeded to the lounge without uttering a word. At that moment, Winston arrived in the lounge and saw the female adjudicator standing there. He said, I assume you're here to discuss John Wick. If that's the case, we can get straight to the point. When I asked him to leave, he refused. That's the whole story. The female adjudicator walked up to Winston and stated directly, Mr. Wick violated the rules. Winston nodded and replied, yes. In fact, a life was taken within these walls of the Continental Hotel. Is that so? Winston replied somberly, yes. The body got even colder staying within these walls. The female adjudicator stared at Winston with a calm expression and said, I'd like to see it. 
Winston nodded and led her to the location where Santino D'Antonio's body was stored. They arrived at the crematorium, and on the gurney lay the body of Santino D'Antonio. The female adjudicator gazed at the body and told Winston, Santino D'Antonio, the newly appointed member of the high table, was killed by Mr. Wick when he sought sanctuary at the Continental Hotel. She then leaned down to examine the fatal wound on Santino D'Antonio's forehead and said, it appears to be caused by a ACP caliber automatic pistol round. After confirming the type of firearm used, the adjudicator stood up and turned her gaze to Winston. Meeting her eyes, Winston began to explain, I cannot control Mr. Wick's actions. The adjudicator countered, yet he lives because of your choice, doesn't he? Winston admitted, yes. Seeing Winston's admission, the adjudicator continued, you and Mr. Wick have been old acquaintances for many years, and it's not an exaggeration to say that you are friends, is it? He killed Santino D'Antonio in front of you, and you chose to stand by and let him go. Rather than stopping him or killing him. Winston, hearing the adjudicator's words, immediately sensed trouble and said, I excommunicated him from the Continental Hotel. The adjudicator did not relent and continued, but you still gave him an hour to escape. For more chapters, 55 plus p at trian.com slash gets a Winston's voice no longer held the same confidence it had at the beginning, but he continued, he violated the rules in my hotel. The adjudicator maintained a stern expression and said, that's precisely the problem, it's your hotel. What about your loyalty? Winston stared at the relentless adjudicator and responded, I've served for over 40 years. The adjudicator interrupted with a stern face, under the high table, serving the high table comes before everything else. I know you're loyal, but this matter cannot be ignored. I've made myself clear, I'm here to adjudicate you. You have one week to settle your affairs. Hearing this, Winston was taken aback and asked, what did you say? The adjudicator continued, at the same time, if you need assistance with the transition, you can find me in room 217. Winston looked at the adjudicator and said, I wish you a pleasant stay at the Continental Hotel. Winston's words were not a welcome, they were a reminder to the adjudicator that he was still the owner of the Continental Hotel. The adjudicator gave Winston a deep look, said nothing more, and turned to leave. In the training room, Charles Doyle was refining his chakra. Since awakening the system three years ago, he had been working on improving his physical fitness and refining chakra. Although he had the system, which could provide him with more chakra and character abilities, and could allow him to use these skills smoothly, Charles Doyle had started using chakra quite late. Unlike in the world of Naruto, where children started learning about chakra at the age of five or six. More importantly, Charles could not jump onto the roof with a single leap like the kids in the Naruto world, nor could he move at the same speed. The difference in the number of body cells clearly indicated that Charles Doyle's physical qualities were on only par with an ordinary person in the Marvel world. Chakra was born from the combination of spiritual energy and cellular energy. With fewer cells and lower physical quality, the corresponding chakra would be limited. Charles had worked hard during these three years of training and had caught up with low-grade ninja students at the Ninja Academy. This was already a significant achievement. When he first recruited Ira Kayumino, he became his ninja teacher. Although Charles had some understanding and guesses about ninja techniques, using them in practice was a different story. Climbing trees, walking on water, Charles had trained in these areas. However, mastering ninja techniques was another level of difficulty. Besides the skills he got from the system, like shadow clone jutsu, transformation jutsu, and clone jutsu, other techniques were quite challenging. As for developing techniques like Raisingan or Chidori, Charles couldn't even think about it. It wasn't that he didn't want to, but his abilities wouldn't allow it. Imagine trying to teach a low-grade ninja student who wasn't even a full-time ninja how to develop these techniques. Even if you told him the principles, he wouldn't be able to figure them out himself. It wasn't that Charles was dumb, it was just that he had too little time to learn these things. Charles was sitting on a cushion, refining his chakra when he suddenly heard the door to the training room open. He stopped refining his chakra and gestured for John Wick to sit down, saying, have a seat. John Wick came over and sat down on the cushion opposite Charles Doyle, silently watching him. Are all the injuries on your body fully healed? Charles asked. John touched the area around his neck and shoulder and replied, they've all healed. Your recovery room is truly amazing. 
Charles nodded and then said, to become one of the thirteen seats of the high table, the first thing we need to do is to find the location of the high table headquarters. Do you have any idea about its specific location? After thinking for a moment, John Wick said, I don't know the exact location of the high table headquarters, but I do know that it's roughly located in the desert near Casablanca. There's an elder stationed there permanently. Charles smiled and asked, if you were to go there now, would you be able to meet the elder of that branch? John thought for a moment and replied uncertainly, if I were alone, there's a possibility that I could be brought before the elder. But if we go together, the high table elder may not show up. All right, then you'll go to Casablanca to meet the high table elder. Your job is to find him and protect yourself. Upon hearing Charles Doyle's words, John Wick was curious and asked, it's a desert over there. How will you find me? Charles smiled and didn't explain the use of ninja dogs. Instead, he simply said, I have a way to locate you. As long as you can enter the high table headquarters and meet the elder inside, that's all we need. John Wick nodded, understanding what he needed to do. Charles then handed him a kunai with special patterns engraved on it and said, when you leave, find Irika. He will take you through a special passage to Kingpin, and from there, you'll take a boat to Casablanca. Upon hearing the name Kingpin, John was briefly surprised. Kingpin, the ruler of Hell's Kitchen, a criminal organization that wasn't part of the high table. He hadn't expected Charles to have a connection with them. Taking the kanai with the special patterns engraved on it, John Wick left the training room. On the other side, B, also known as the Trash King, was in his gang's headquarters. Erla approached him and said, there's an adjudicator who wants to see you. The Trash King looked at his subordinates, took a deep breath, and thought to himself, the adjudicator's appearance indicates that something bad is about to happen. With an umbrella in hand, the Trash King made his way to the rooftop where he kept his pigeons and waited for the adjudicator's arrival. Soon, Erla brought the adjudicator up to the rooftop. The Trash King looked at the approaching adjudicator and greeted, Welcome to my mission control center, my operations hub, and the super information flight route. I control the slightest movements in the streets and the ways of the world from here. The adjudicator looked around in surprise and asked, With pigeons? The Trash King also glanced at the pigeons around them and then explained, That's right. To you, they might be winged rats, but to me, they're the internet. The Trash King spoke confidently, No IP addresses, no digital traces, untraceable, uninvadable, and unsearchable. More chapters, 55 plus p at trian.com slash gets of the adjudicator sneered, Will it infect you with a disease? Trash King's confidence disappeared in an instant as he looked at the adjudicator and said, I wouldn't recommend eating it. After sizing each other up, Trash King asked, What brings you here? The haughty adjudicator tilted her head slightly and said, I want to see the place where it didn't happen. Trash King stared at the adjudicator and asked, The place where what didn't happen? The adjudicator spoke in a measured tone, The place where you didn't kill John Wick. Trash King lowered his head, his voice solemn, I always thought I could decide whether to execute a bounty contract or not. I have no grievances with John Wick. Hearing Trash King's explanation, the adjudicator handed her umbrella to her assistant, Ellera, and took out a pistol from her bag. She pointed it at Trash King and said, more precisely, this gold browning 1911 pistol. After showing Trash King the weapon used by John Wick for his killings, the adjudicator put the gun back in her bag and walked up to Trash King. She said, you gave John Wick seven bullets when you knew he was going to fight the high table. The high table is giving you seven days. Upon hearing the adjudicator's words, Trash King asked, seven days for what? The adjudicator remained expressionless and said, to settle your affairs and find a new home for your birds. In seven days, you must step down from your throne. Hearing the adjudicator's words, Trash King couldn't hold back and burst into laughter. Ah, ha ha ha. Then, Trash King's laughter grew louder, and he threw his umbrella on the ground. He continued, My dear, do you know what the Casablanca district is? Do you know what will happen when I wave my hand? Trash King waved his hand as a vivid metaphor and continued, No, no one can replace me and ascend to the throne. Because I am the throne, baby. I am the Casablanca district. Trash King stared angrily at the adjudicator and said, I am the things you disdainfully walk past on the streets at night. The Casablanca district belongs to me and me alone. 
The adjudicator remained cold and emotionless as she said, don't think you are exempt from the rules. No one is above the rules. You have seven days. After delivering this final statement, the adjudicator turned and left the rooftop. She had to move on to her next destination. Meanwhile, John Wick had followed Irika to the Hell's Kitchen's docks. Irika was in conversation with a gang member, and he handed over Charles Doyle's token to the man. After receiving the token, the gang member entered a nearby building. In a room at the top of the Feskek Tower, Bullseye walked in and said, Kingpin, someone brought Charles Doyle's token and wants to use our smuggling route to send a person to Casablanca. Upon hearing the mention of Charles Doyle's token, Kingpin's mind immediately went to the man who had single-handedly slaughtered the top three gangs in Hell's Kitchen using cold weapons and emerged unscathed. Kingpin had taken over the secrets and assets of those gangs afterward, but not being able to recruit Charles Doyle had always been his regret. Recalling his thoughts, Kingpin looked at Bullseye with a hint of regret in his heart. He thought, without Charles Doyle, Bullseye is still a valuable asset. Then, Kingpin asked, do you know who the person we're sending away is? Bullseye hesitated for a moment and then replied, based on the reports from the dock, it should be John Wick. Kingpin murmured, John Wick, another legendary hitman. Since someone brought Charles Doyle's token, make the arrangements. Remember to collect the token and bring it to me as a favor. This is a matter of goodwill. Bullseye hesitated for a moment at Kingpin's instructions and asked, million dollars, and we risk offending the high table. Is it worth it? Kingpin chuckled, I am the king of Hell's Kitchen, and I'm not loyal to the high table. Their rules don't apply to me. As for John Wick's bounty, don't worry about it. It's not easy to obtain, and it would only offend Charles Doyle. It's not necessary. Understood. Bullseye then exited the room. Watching Bullseye leave, Kingpin turned to look out the window, gazing in the direction of the Continental Hotel. He murmured, the Continental Hotel, the high table, Charles Doyle. It seems that the underground world of New York is about to change again. Meanwhile, the gang member who had communicated with Irika said, it's done. Let him go with me. Irika nodded and said, thank you. Then, turning to John Wick, he said, you can follow him. He will take you to your destination. After arriving in Casablanca, John, you can proceed according to your own methods. As for the rest of us, we will enter through regular channels, and we should arrive faster than you. When you meet the elder of the high table, we will also be there. John, take care. Irika patted John Wick on the shoulder and then turned back to the car he came in, heading back to Charles's agency. As John Wick watched Irika depart, he took a deep breath and then followed the gang member who was waiting for him at the docks. At Charles's agency, Charles was reading the latest news in the newspaper when his phone rang. He saw that it was a call from Kingpin. Without hesitation, Charles answered the call. Good afternoon, Charles. Hearing the voice on the other end, Charles smiled and replied, Good afternoon, Kingpin. In the face of the high table, I wonder if Mr. Charles needs assistance from Hell's Kitchen. Kingpin offered, extending his goodwill. Charles, however, quickly declined, this is just a minor issue, Kingpin. The confrontation with the high table will be resolved soon. Despite Charles's refusal, Kingpin didn't seem to mind and continued, if you ever need it, feel free to come to me. I'm willing to support you. Thank you. Charles ended the call. Looking at his phone, Charles Doyle muttered, this old man, is he still holding out hope for me after all this time? Ever since Kingpin witnessed some of his capabilities, he had harbored great goodwill towards him, hoping to recruit him into his ranks. However, he had never succeeded. Nevertheless, their relationship was still cordial. Sometimes, when Bullseye couldn't handle certain enemies, Kingpin would hire him to deal with them. For more chapters, 55 plus p at trian.com slash getza in New York, it had been raining all day, and the heavy rain continued into the night. The adjudicator stepped out of a taxi and arrived at the Hirajima sushi shop. The owner and head chef of the sushi shop, Zero, greeted the incoming customer, saying, Welcome. Is there anything you need? The adjudicator sat down, took out a gold coin that represented her identity, and placed it in front of the owner. Zero, upon seeing the gold coin symbolizing the adjudicator's identity, turned to the woman in front of him and said, I didn't expect the high table to send you so quickly. 
The adjudicator stared at Zero and said, I have a task involving someone who broke the rules and went against the high table. Zero paused in his actions and raised his head. You mean John Wick? Upon hearing Zero's response, the adjudicator continued, John Wick and everyone who aided him. Of course, you must have heard his story. In just the past week, John has killed countless people. Zero interjected, all because of a dog and a car. I know, and I'm interested. Very interested. Zero then picked up a piece of fugu, blowfish, meat and said, fugu, lethally toxic. He placed the fugu meat in front of the adjudicator and added, no need for soy sauce. The adjudicator calmly picked up the fugu meat and put it in her mouth. Seeing the other person eat the fugu meat, Zero said solemnly, I have always served the high table, and from now on, I will serve faithfully unto death. He then bowed with his two disciples behind him. With this assurance from Zero, the adjudicator collected the gold coin on the table and left the Hirajima sushi shop with Zero and his disciples. Charles's agency, at this moment, Charles Doyle was sitting in the lobby, sipping on a glass of scotch whiskey. He had received word that the adjudicator of the high table had arrived in New York and would likely come looking for him soon. To flex his muscles in front of the high table and prove his loyalty, Charles Doyle planned to take down the adjudicator before heading to Casablanca. Timing seemed to work out perfectly. As Charles Doyle contemplated his next move, the entrance to the agency was pushed open. The adjudicator, dressed in black, walked in with three assassins trailing behind, including Zero and his two disciples. Upon seeing the newcomer, Charles Doyle smiled and said, The adjudicator of the high table, you're quite fast. The adjudicator walked over and took a seat on the couch opposite Charles. She looked at the man in front of her and said, Charles Doyle, in your youth, you joined the Continental Hotel and pledged unwavering loyalty to the high table. Yet you helped John Wick and arranged for him to leave New York. What about your loyalty? Charles wore a contemptuous expression on his face as he looked at the woman in front of him. He slowly spoke, I believe I have the strength and the right to decide my own actions. The adjudicator gave Charles Doyle a deep, scrutinizing look, trying to see through his ambitions. Then, in a cold voice, she said, while you may be New York's top assassin and hold the title of a legendary killer, that doesn't mean you stand above the high table. You will atone with blood. Now, extend your helping hand and swear your loyalty. Seeing that the adjudicator was playing this game with him, Charles Doyle's expression changed, and his aura erupted. A palpable murderous intent filled the room, primarily directed at the adjudicator. In the next moment, three figures suddenly appeared by Charles Doyle's side, Yumino Irika, Uchiha Sasuke, and Rock Lee. As soon as they appeared, they surrounded Zero and his two disciples. Under Charles's overwhelming presence, the adjudicator's face turned pale instantly, as if she had seen a sea of corpses and blood, and her body stiffened under the oppressive murderous intent. Even Zero, a seasoned assassin, felt a chilling aura rising from the ground. He thought to himself, is this the power of Charles Doyle, who surpasses even legendary assassins? Just his killing intent alone is terrifying. Watching the adjudicator, who was now unable to speak or move, Charles Doyle sneered, your judgment doesn't work on me. Not only are you powerless, but these three guys you brought along are also useless. Throw these three annoying people out. Hearing Charles's command, Irika and the others grabbed Zero and his disciples and unceremoniously threw them onto the street. Throughout this ordeal, the three of them didn't resist or fight back at all. Zero knew that not fighting back was the only way to survive, retaliating would have meant instant death. Now, looking at the speechless and immobile adjudicator, Charles Doyle retracted his imposing aura and calmly said, you couldn't even move under my killing intent. How can you judge me? As the murderous intent and aura dissipated, the adjudicator's face slowly regained its color. It was as if the congealed blood in her veins had started flowing again. She took a deep breath. The feeling from just moments ago had been terrifying. It was like the Grim Reaper had his hand around her throat, ready to take her life at any moment. After calming down, the adjudicator regained her composure and spoke, I admit, Mr. Charles, that you have sufficient power. But the high table is above all rules. Under the high table, everyone must adhere to its regulations. John Wick has already been excommunicated from the Continental Hotel and a public contract has been issued for his assassination. 
Anyone or any organization under the dominion of the High Table cannot aid John Wick, or they will be in opposition to the High Table. Seeing the adjudicator trying to regain control, Charles Doyle chuckled, excommunication. Just re-register. As for the contract, just cancel it. As long as the Elder speaks, everything is possible. Hearing Charles Doyle mention the Elder, the adjudicator thought he was aiming for a higher position. She stood up and said, Mr. Charles, you should know that nothing will change until new orders are issued. The will of the high table must be executed, and I am just the enforcer of that will. The power of the high table is not limited to this alone. Charles remained silent and only made a dismissive gesture. The adjudicator gave Charles Doyle a deep look before turning and leaving the agency. However, what she didn't know was that Charles Doyle didn't intend to pursue a higher path or have the elder pardon John Wick. Instead, he aimed to become an elder, one of the thirteen seats at the high table. He aimed to become the one in control of the high table. T slash N, instead of Trash King, it should be Bowery King. Due to my unfamiliarity with all the characters in John Wick, I made this mistake. Sorry about that. The adjudicator walked out of Charles's agency. Zero, who had been thrown out, approached the adjudicator with his head down and said, I'm sorry, I wasn't a match for them. Thinking of Charles Doyle's strength, the adjudicator didn't get angry. She remained calm and said, it's not your fault. Charles Doyle is just too powerful. We don't need to deal with him now. It seems we need some reinforcements from headquarters. The adjudicator was well aware that when she brought Zero and his group into Charles's agency, there were likely people watching in the shadows, eager to see how she, representing the high table, would fare against the legendary assassin. However, shortly after entering, Zero and his group were thrown out. While Zero couldn't represent the high table's reputation, it was clear that her authority had taken a hit. At the very least, others would know that she had lost in the initial confrontation. In seven days, she had to perfectly resolve the high table's judgments, especially regarding the Continental Hotel. As for Charles on the other side, she believed he could climb up the upper channels given his capabilities. After all, Charles Doyle's strength was no joke. On the other side, the Bowery King stood in his, internet center, listening to Erla's report. He chuckled and said, she has her moments of defeat as well. Erla's expression remained steady, and she didn't join the Bowery King's laughter. Instead, she said, King, Charles was able to withstand the adjudicator because he has the strength for it. After all, Charles had already proven himself outside the Continental Hotel. Plus, his subordinates are formidable as well. Even his secretary comes from the Assassin's Brotherhood. After a brief pause, Erla continued, but we may not be able to resist the adjudicator's power. Furthermore, since she lost face in front of Charles, she might try to regain it by using us to establish her authority. The Bowery King thought for a moment. He knew that he couldn't stop the High Table's judgment. Once she used him to establish her dominance, it wouldn't be as simple as relocating or relinquishing his position. He might face death, unless the adjudicator strictly followed the rules. Even then, he would lose everything. Losing Bowery District and his subordinates would be no different from losing his life, as he would ultimately fall into the hands of his former enemies. Finally, the Bowery King hesitated, Erla, should we ask for Charles Doyle's help? Erla thought for a moment and said, we can try, but what can we offer in return? What can we offer? The Bowery King pondered for a long time without figuring out what kind of price he could pay to obtain Charles Doyle's assistance. He wasn't even sure why Charles Doyle would protect John Wick in the first place. Erla, tomorrow, try to find out what price we need to pay for Charles Doyle's protection. If Charles Doyle can make the high table stop pursuing John Wick, then maybe he can do the same for us. Even if it means confronting the high table, with Charles Doyle on our side, our chances are better. Erla nodded, indicating her understanding. The Bowery King stood on the rooftop, the cold wind howling around him. He looked at the birdcages around him and thought, I hope we can safely navigate through this crisis. He had never expected that simply giving John Wick a handgun would lead to such a serious problem. At the Continental Hotel, Winston set aside his newspaper and looked at the information his subordinates had provided. He muttered to himself, Charles sent John Wick away and humiliated the adjudicator. This seems like a prelude to a war with the high table. 
Then he thought about Charles Doyle's strength and his formidable subordinates. Winston understood that the high table wasn't a monolithic entity. With Charles's strength, the possibility of negotiations with the adjudicator was not non-existent but rather quite plausible. However, thinking about the situation he was about to face, Winston felt the need to take action. The next day, check-in. Ding. Check-in successful. Received 5,000 bronze coins. Charles Doyle walked out of his room and entered the agency's lobby, where the entire team had already gathered. Ginny handed him a breakfast of bread and milk and said, Boss, here's your breakfast. Charles took the breakfast from Ginny's hand, took a sip of milk, and asked, How's everything going? Ginny smiled and said, Everything's ready. Our flight to Casablanca is at 10 in the morning. I've also spoken with Carlos, he's willing to work for you and become your adjudicator. But he'll pledge his loyalty after we finish this task and return. Right now, he's training his son. He wanted me to convey his apologies for not being able to join this mission. Hearing Ginny's report, Charles smiled and said, That's great. Our team is expanding once again. As for this mission, whether Carlos and his team come or not, the result will be the same. Let him focus on training his son. When we return from Casablanca, our next door neighbor, the landlord, should be back. By then, Ginny, you should expedite the expansion of the agency. Looking at Charles's confident demeanor, Ginny's lips curled into a smile. I'll take care of it as soon as we return. I've also arranged the sale of the gold and jewelry. We'll handle it directly when we're back. Boss, after breakfast, we need to get ready to head to the airport. Charles nodded and glanced at his team. He then turned to Irica and said, Irica, how are the three of you prepared for this mission? It won't be easy. Lord Charles, please rest assured. We've already made all the necessary preparations for the mission, Irica replied respectfully. Leave it to me, and you can trust that the Lotus of Kanoha will bloom once again. Seeing Rock Lee's fiery spirit, Charles smiled and took a few bites of his bread before saying, Let's go. As for Sasuke Uchiha, he remained as cool and silent as ever, not uttering a word. Shortly after Charles Doyle and his team left, the adjudicator in her room at the Continental Hotel received a message. She learned of Charles and his team's flight and their destination, Casablanca. Looking at the report from her subordinate, the adjudicator mumbled to herself, Is he going to meet the elder? Then, she glanced at her wristwatch and said, Six days left. On the other side, Erla stood in front of Charles's agency, which now had a locked gate and a sign saying, Temporarily closed. She knew they were in trouble. Charles Doyle had left, and the entire team had departed. Even the agency was temporarily closed. Their escape route was gone. Erla no longer hesitated and immediately rushed back to Bowery District to report the situation to the king. More chapters, 55 plus p at trian.com slash gets a Casablanca, Morocco Welcome to the Continental Hotel in Morocco. Is there anything I can assist you with? Charles Doyle took out five gold coins from his pocket and placed them on the front desk, saying, we need five rooms. The hotel staff accepted the gold coins and began processing the check-in procedures for Charles and his group. After Charles distributed the room keys to everyone, just as they were about to go upstairs to their rooms, they heard someone calling out. Charles Doyle. Hearing his name being called, Charles turned around and saw a familiar face. He smiled and said, Barada. Barada walked up to Charles Doyle and extended his hand, saying, Hello, it's great to see you. Charles shook Barada's hand and then said to Ginny and the others, You all can go to your rooms first. He then went with Barada to the hotel's lounge area and sat on the couch. Barada looked at Charles and said, It's been over a year since your last visit to Morocco. And I've heard about your actions in New York. Charles smiled and replied, Those are just small matters, nothing significant. Hearing Charles Doyle's response, Barada asked, You're not here to kill me, are you? Charles looked serious and replied, eh no. Although in his mind, he couldn't help but think, after you deal with your underlings, you might be in danger. Hearing Charles's answer, Barada visibly breathed a sigh of relief. Then he remembered something and asked, are you going to meet the elder? Charles nodded without denying it. Barada took out a room key from his pocket and placed it on the table, saying, this is the best room in my hotel. Thank you, 
Charles replied without rejecting his offer. I wish you a pleasant stay. Then Barada got up and left. Charles Doyle picked up the room key from the table and also left the hotel lounge. He went to the hotel room that had been prepared earlier and found that everyone was already inside one room. He walked in. Seeing Charles's arrival, Ginny asked, Boss, what do we do next? We wait. We wait for John Wick to arrive, wait for him to seek out the elder who stands above the high table. Then Charles turned to Irica and asked, Did you bring the bloodstained shirt that John Wick changed out of earlier? Irica quickly replied, Lord Charles, I've brought everything with me. Charles nodded in satisfaction and continued, The high table's headquarters are in the desert near Casablanca. The exact location, apart from themselves, is unknown to others. Even if we meet, they always make sure their target is exhausted and unconscious in the desert before bringing them to the location. Their security measures are very tight. We can't waste time exploring on our own. Let John go find him, and someone will bring him to the Elder. That's when we'll attack the high table. Ginny asked in surprise, Boss, how are you so sure that John Wick will be able to meet the Elder of the high table? Is this another secret you can't talk about? Charles Doyle smiled and said, Smart. Then he took out the room key that Barada had given him, claiming it was the best room in the hotel, and said, Ginny, this is the best room in the hotel that Barada gave us. You're the only lady here, so enjoy the best accommodation for the next few days. If you find it unsatisfactory, you can ask Barada to renovate it properly instead of giving it away. Ginny didn't refuse and took the room key. She threw a flirtatious look at Charles and said softly, I'll be waiting for you in the room, after saying that, she turned and left the room. Seeing this scene again, Sasuke Uchiha rolled his eyes. Then he left the room as well. Rock Lee, seeing Sasuke leaving, shouted, wait for me. He immediately got up and ran out of the room. Now the room was left with only Charles Doyle and Irika Yumino. Irika glanced at Charles and said awkwardly, Lord Charles, this is my room. Feeling the awkward atmosphere, Charles Doyle took out the room key he had obtained at the front desk and said, I'll go to my own room. Watching Charles leave, Irika wanted to laugh but dared not. He just endured it silently. Back in his original room, Charles Doyle sighed, I've been teased again. Ginny is really audacious. Doesn't she know I can transform into a wolf at any time? By the way, what was the room number on that room key? He seemed to have forgotten to check it. No longer thinking about these things, Charles Doyle entered the system interface and selected the training ground. He wanted to practice his ninjutsu. In the evening, John Wick arrived in Casablanca. He was heading towards the Continental Hotel in Morocco when he was once again surrounded by a group of assassins under a triple bridge tunnel. Seeing three assassins brandishing their knives, John Wick decided to strike first. He attacked one of them instantly. John Wick moved left and right, dodging the slashing knives. He took the opportunity to grab one of the assassin's wrists, delivered a punch to his face, and followed up with an elbow strike. Two more assassins rushed in to help but were swiftly kicked down by John Wick. He then performed a turning back throw, tossing the assassin whose wrist he had grabbed earlier. As the assassin who had just been knocked down got back on his feet, he raised his knife and lunged at John Wick. John Wick, quick on his feet, instantly grabbed the assassin's wrist, and the two engaged in a struggle. Enough. Outside the bridge tunnel, a man's voice interrupted the standoff. He walked out from the darkness, lit a cigarette, and approached them. He came to the two men who were in a stalemate and said, I'm afraid this friend is off limits. The assassin looked at the bald man who had spoken and explained, but he's been excommunicated. The bald man stared at the assassin and said, I heard the manager has granted him a pardon. Hearing the word pardon, John Wick looked at the bald man with surprise. The bald man then gestured for John Wick to follow him. John Wick released the assassin and ended the standoff. He also returned the knife he had taken from the assassin. The bald man made a pleased gesture to John Wick and then looked at the three assassins before turning to lead John away. Seeing John and the bald man turning away, the assassin who had just spoken felt reluctant. He quickly pulled out his knife, preparing to throw it at John Wick. However, before he could throw it, the bald man swiftly turned around and shot him. Having killed the assassin who was about to attack, 
the bald man holstered his gun and turned back to John Wick, saying, Welcome to Casablanca, Mr. Wick. Thank you. John said, expressing his gratitude for the assistance earlier. The bald man smiled and then led John away from the scene. Mr. John Wick, it's been a long time since you graced our city, the bald man said with a smile as they walked. John was about to speak when the bald man interrupted, Ms. Alazwar is waiting for you. Soon, the two arrived at the hotel's entrance, pushing open the doors. Inside, they entered a small plaza where a lively gathering was taking place, resembling a banquet. Mr. Wick, welcome to the Continental Hotel in Morocco. I hope this place suits your taste. The bald man escorted John Wick through the crowd towards the hotel's interior. Right this way, Ms. Alazwar doesn't like to wait for anyone. Eventually, the bald man led John into a room and said, Wishing you good luck, Mr. Wick. He emphasized once more, Wishing you good luck. With a smile on his face, the bald man exited the room. Seeing the bald man leaving, the room's lobby was now empty. John Wick walked a few steps further. On a round table, he noticed several photographs. He picked up a small picture frame, and inside was a photo of Sophia Alazwar with her daughter. As John Wick was looking at the photo, two Belgian Malinois dogs suddenly appeared in the room. They stared menacingly at him, baring their teeth as if ready to attack. Just then, the sound of a gun being cocked came from the innermost part of the room, and a woman emerged, holding a pistol as she approached John Wick. She simultaneously said, Do you like dogs, John? John Wick turned to face the approaching figure, not entirely sure, and said, Sophia. He then placed the photo frame back on the table and raised both hands, indicating that he posed no threat. As John Wick watched, Sophia showed no mercy. She aimed her pistol directly at his abdomen and fired. Bang! The bullet hit John Wick, and the force and pain made him immediately fall to the ground. Lying on the ground, John looked at Sophia and immediately said, Sophia, you can't kill your blood marker holder. Sophia aimed her pistol at John Wick while stepping closer, saying, I didn't kill you, I just shot you. Sophia glanced down at John and realized he wasn't injured, the bullet had simply fallen to the ground. This was due to the bulletproof suit that John Wick had custom made at the Continental Hotel. John Wick took a deep breath, shook off the suit, and the bullet fell to the ground. The suit had saved him from injury, but being shot at close range was still painful. John Wick looked at Sophia and said, It's good to see you. Sophia, still pointing her gun at him, gritted her teeth and said, I should have blown your head off immediately. John Wick replied, I know. He then slowly sat up on the ground and reached into his suit pocket. Sophia, watching John Wick's movements, cautioned, Don't do anything. However, what John Wick pulled from his pocket was not a gun but the blood oath marker Sophia had given him. Sophia, still pointing the gun at him, said, You've been excommunicated, John. That blood oath has become meaningless, she said. John Wick now held the blood oath marker in his hand. He slowly got up, opened the blood oath marker, and placed it in front of Sophia, saying, This is your blood. Your marker. When you needed help, I helped you. At this moment, John Wick was repeating the same words he had heard from others to Sophia. Hearing John Wick's words, Sophia sighed and then lowered the gun aimed at him. She looked at him helplessly and said, Sit. In the next moment, the two Belgian Malinois dogs immediately sat down obediently. John Wick glanced at the dogs, still holding the blood oath marker in his hand, not letting it go. Sophia said, I meant for you to sit down, John. Sophia then turned and walked to a nearby sofa, sitting down slowly. Seeing John Wick sitting, Sophia said, Do you realize that I'm in charge of this hotel now? I'm no longer providing services, John. John Wick replied, I'm not asking you to kill anyone. I just need you to take me to him. Sophia asked, To whom? John answered, Your former boss, the overseer of the Continental Hotel in Morocco. Sophia asked with a puzzled look, You want to kill Barada? John Wick hurriedly said, I won't kill him. I just want to talk to him. Sophia looked at him in confusion and asked, What can he offer you? John Wick sighed and seemed to remember something. He said, Guidance. After hearing John's response, Sophia said, Listen, when I agreed to take over this hotel, it came with an agreement. 
the agreement stated that I must abide by the high table's rules. Even if you don't intend to kill him, he'll kill you. He probably will kill me as well because I brought you here. Sophia looked serious and said, if I make one mistake, make one enemy, someone might come after my daughter. I know what you did to try to save her. But I can't take that risk, I'm sorry. John Wick lowered his head and said, do you want to know where she is? Sophia stared at John and said seriously, no, I never want to know. Because I don't trust myself not to go looking for her. A part of me longs to see her, and I have to suppress that part every day. Just to keep her safe. Sophia's voice sounded melancholic at this moment as she continued, because sometimes you have to forget what you love. That's why I gave you that blood marker in the first place. That's why I'm sitting here now, unable to break free. John Wick looked at the blood oath marker in his hand and said, Consequences. Sophia nodded and said, Yes, consequences. Looking at Sophia in front of him, John Wick said, I'm just asking you to give it a try. Whatever the result, you and I, will be even. He then placed the blood oath marker on the table and pushed it towards Sophia. For more chapters, 60 plus p at treeandcom slash getsa Sophia fixed her gaze on John Wick, extending a hand to push the blood oath medallion back and said, No, this is something you owe me afterward. She then stood up and added, We depart in ten minutes. On the other side, on a rooftop terrace of the Morocco Continental Hotel, Charles and his group had gathered there, overlooking the second-level terrace below, visible from their vantage point. This was the best room Barada had provided for them, and the attached terrace was the only one that allowed them to see the second level. Irika approached Charles and said with respect, Lord Charles, John Wick has already arrived at the hotel. Charles, holding a glass of white horse whiskey, took a sip and replied, understood. He then glanced down at the empty terrace below and muttered, why do people always want to kill dogs? Do they not realize that dog lovers can be terrifying? Hearing Charles's words, Ginny walked over and looked down but didn't see anything unusual. She then asked, Boss, who wants to kill a dog? Charles pointed to the empty terrace below and said, Later, someone confident will come here, wanting to do something foolish. Ginny blinked at Charles, his eyes filled with a mix of surprise, disbelief, and even a hint of admiration. Being originally from the Assassin Brotherhood, Ginny had a high tolerance for these kinds of prophetic abilities, and Charles's occasional cryptic remarks only elevated his image in Ginny's mind. On the other side, Sophia had already changed into her combat gear and was holding her weapons as she walked out. Seeing Sophia's attire and weapons, John Wick sat on the couch and said, We don't need to storm in like before. This time, it's just a conversation. Sophia approached her greyhound and knelt down. Then, she looked at John Wick and said, getting involved with you is never just a conversation. She then placed her handgun inside the Greyhound's protective vest. Addressing John Wick, she said, let's go. Sophia led John Wick through the underground district toward the location where Barada was. As they passed through the district, they were stopped and subjected to a body search. Just as they had completed the search, Barada approached them with open arms and said, Sophia, it's always a pleasure to see you. He then walked up to them and added, and of course, your dogs, they are magnificent. Can I pet them? Sophia looked at him and nodded, giving her consent. Of course, this one is named De Kilt. At this point, De Kilt, the greyhound, came over to Barada. Barada knelt down and praised, absolutely fantastic. Then, while stroking the dog's head, Barada said, John Wick, I heard you've set foot on our side of the coast. Barada didn't spend more time with the dog and stood up, saying, Come, there's certainly much for us to discuss. On the way, Barada spoke up, I must admit, I'm quite curious. What brings you to my territory? Tell me, are you here to kill me? John Wick looked at Barada and replied, No. Hearing that John wasn't here to kill him, Barada nodded in satisfaction. Today, he had met two legendary assassins, and neither of them had come for him. He then led them to the second-floor terrace. Meanwhile, Ginny, who had been keeping her eyes on the second-floor terrace, whispered to herself, someone is really here, and there are dogs. She then glanced at Charles, her expression filled with surprise, disbelief, and even a hint of admiration. Upon hearing Ginny say that someone had arrived on the second-floor terrace, Charles said, everyone, come over and take a look. We're about to have a show. 
He then asked, Irika, can you hear any sounds from below? Everyone tilted their heads to listen, but aside from the howling wind, they couldn't hear anything. They shook their heads in response to Charles's question. Charles shrugged, indicating that they would be witnessing a silent drama. Back on the second floor terrace, Barada asked, Mr. Wick, do you know the origin of the word assassin? Without waiting for John Wick to respond, Barada continued, there are various opinions on the term assassin. Some say it comes from the Assassin Brotherhood, followers of Hassan. But others believe the word originates from believer, signifying devout and faithful individuals. He then pointed to a coin displayed nearby and said, See that? It's the first coin ever minted here. Next to it is the first blood marker. Believe me, that coin no longer holds any monetary value. It represents business relationships, the social contracts you agree to. Order and rules. Barada walked up to John Wick and continued, You've disrupted the order, and the high table has decreed your death. Why should I let you leave here alive? Kneeling down in front of Barada, John spoke, I want to make amends for my actions and pay the price. I want to meet the one above the high table. John's mindset wasn't exactly what Barada had expected. He didn't actually want Elder's forgiveness, he wanted to become a guide to find the headquarters of the high table. Upon hearing John's words, Barada raised an eyebrow. This was the second person today who wanted to meet the Elder, and both of them were legendary assassins. Charles had not asked for the Elder's address but had instead checked into the hotel peacefully. Looking at John Wick before him, Barada sensed that the situation might not be as straightforward as he thought. Without responding to John, he turned to Sophia and said, I really like this dog. Tell me, does it shed a lot? Not understanding why Barada was asking this, Sophia replied, occasionally. John Wick glanced at Sophia and said in a solemn tone, After I leave, you can tell the elder that I want to find him. If he wants me dead. Before John could finish his sentence, Barada interjected, Then I will ensure your body is exposed to the sunlight. Understood. You're giving me the option to kill you or spare you for the elder. 